Section 000 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. Read by John Greenman. This collection of the 258 known, publicly printed interviews of Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, was compiled by Gary Scharnhorst and published by the University of Alabama Press. The interviews are in the public domain, and our thanks go to Gary Scharnhorst and the University of Alabama for making them available for this public domain audio recording. They were compiled in the University of Alabama Press book entitled Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews, and are arranged chronologically from Twain's first authenticated interview in 1871 to his last interview in 1910. Here's how Professor Scharnhorst has characterized the interviews. Interviews 1 through 20, The Growth of Mark Twain's Early Reputation, 1871 to 1884. Interviews 21 through 39, The Twins of Genius Tour, 1884 to 1885. Interviews 40 through 59, The Best and Worst of Times, 1886 to 1895. Interviews 60 through 81, Across North America, 1895. Interviews 82 through 120, Across Australia, Asia, and Africa, 1895 through 1896. Interviews 121 through 151, Ambassador at Large and Man of Letters, 1897 to 1901. Interviews 152 through 170, Last Visit to Mississippi, 1902. Interviews 171 through 195, At Large, 1902 to 1906. Interviews 196 through 220, Dean of Humorists, 1906 to 1907. Interviews 221 through 235, Visit to Oxford, 1907. Interviews 236 through 258, The Long Goodbye, 1907 to 1910. Extensive analysis, notes, appendix, and index are included in the printed work. End of section 000. Read by John Greenman. This is section one of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number one, Brevities, from the Chicago Evening Post, 21 December 1871, page four, read by John Greenman. Mark Twain is referring to the fact that the Prince of Wales, soon to be reigning King Edward the Seventh, has recovered from typhoid fever. I'm glad the boy's going to get well. I'm glad, and not ashamed to own it, for he will probably make the worst king Great Britain has ever had. And that's what the people need, exactly. They need a bad king. He'll be a blessing in disguise. He'll tax em, and disgrace em, and oppress em, and trouble em in a thousand ways and they'll go into training for resistance. The best king they can have is a bad king. He'll cultivate their self-respect and self-reliance and their muscle, and they'll finally kick him out of office and set up for themselves. End of Interview One Read by John Greenman Section 2 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number 2. Mark Twain as a Pedestrian. Boston Evening Journal, 14th of November, 1874, page 2. Read by John Greenman. The stupendous feat of walking from Hartford to Boston, a distance of about 100 miles, was, as the public are aware, really undertaken by the adventurous Mr. Samuel L. Clemens, 
better known as Mark Twain, and his pastor, Rev. J. H. Twitchell. It has long been the custom of these two gentlemen to take walks of about ten miles in the vicinity of Hartford for the purpose of enjoying a social chat and exchanging views on nothing in particular and everything in general, the results of which, to use Mark Twain's own words, is that Mr. Twitchell sometimes gains ideas from his companion which he embodies in his sermons, and Mark Twain obtains information from his pastor which he works up into comical and humorous stories, and makes note of every joke which unconsciously falls from the clerical lips. Mark Twain says he and Mr. Twitchell always return to Hartford after one of these jaunts with a jaw ache, but never footsore. To put an end to these country walks, the Twain resolved to undertake the trip to Boston, and have enough jaw to last them through the winter months. Accordingly, they started from Hartford at 9 a.m. on Thursday, intending to keep along the old turnpike road and see the hamlets which the railroads had avoided, and reach Boston on Saturday. At seven o'clock that evening they found themselves at Westford, having traveled twenty-eight miles, where they passed the night. Before retiring they had a consultation, and decided that their undertaking had developed into everything but a pleasure trip, and was actually hard work. And as they started purely for pleasure, and had promised Mr. Howells, editor of the Atlantic, to dine at his house in Cambridge on Monday evening, they concluded to take the cars at the nearest point and defer their pedestrian tour for a year or so. Friday morning they walked seven miles, drove ten miles, and reached New Boston, where they took the Hartford and Erie train, arriving at Young's Hotel at 7 p.m. They subsequently proceeded to Mr. Howell's and partook of his hospitality, and returned to their hotel about midnight. Mark Twain wishes it distinctly understood that he has not made a failure, and would have continued his trip had Mr. Twitchell not have been under engagement to preach in Newton on Sunday morning. Mark says he wants a week to do the job comfortably, and is not anxious to take Weston's laurels away because he considers that professional about as good as he or Mr. Twitchell. End of interview number two, and end of section two. Read by John Greenman. This is section three of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number three. Mark Twain, His Recent Walking Feet. Hartford Times, 14th of November, 1874. Read by John Greenman. As most readers of the Times are aware, Mark Twain, known to a select circle of relatives as Mr. Samuel L. Clemens, recently undertook, in company with his friend and pastor, Rev. J. H. Twitchell, to achieve pedestrian fame. He started with Mr. Twitchell from Hartford at 9 a.m. on Thursday last, intending to reach Boston by way of the old turnpike road yesterday. On Friday they hitched on to a train and reached Boston at seven o'clock in the evening, ahead of the time in which they had proposed to do the journey. Feeling certain that the public would like to know from the adventurous Twain's own lips the details of the journey, a Times reporter called on him at Young's Hotel last evening and enjoyed the following conversation with him. Reporter Mr. Clemens, the readers of our paper would like to learn the particulars of your journey from Hartford. Mark Twain Certainly, sir. We originally intended to leave Hartford on Monday morning and take a week to walk to Boston, just loafing along the road, and walking perhaps fifteen or eighteen miles a day, just for the sake of talking and swapping experiences and inventing fresh ones, and simply enjoying ourselves in that way without caring whether we saw anything or found out anything on the road or not. We were to make this journey 
simply for the sake of talking but then our plan was interrupted by mr twichell having to go to a congregational conference of ministers at bridgeport so we could not start till thursday we thought we would simply do two days walking along comfortably all the time and bring on night just where it chose to come and about noon saturday we would get a train that would take us into boston we got so ambitious however the first day and felt so lively that we walked twenty-eight miles reporter did you experience any fatigue at the end of that day's walk twain well at the end of that day when we stopped for the night i didn't feel fatigued and i had no desire to go to bed but i had a pain through my left knee which interrupted my conversation with lockjaw every now and then the next day at twelve past five we started again intending to do forty miles that day believing we could still make boston in three days but we didn't make the forty miles finding it took me three or four hours to walk seven miles as my knee was still so stiff that it was walking on stilts or if you can imagine such a thing it was though i had wooden legs with pains in them we just got a team and drove to the nearest railway station hitched on and came up here reporter you could doubtless have accomplished the journey on foot sir twain oh our experience undoubtedly demonstrates the possibility of walking by and by when we get an entire week to make this pedestrian excursion we mean to make it reporter when you renew the experiment do you intend to follow any different plan twain no i would just follow the old hartford and boston stage road of old times it takes you through a lot of quiet pleasant villages away from the railroads over a road that now has so little traffic that you don't have to be skipping out into the bushes every moment to let a wagon go by because no wagons go by and then you see you can talk all you want with nobody to listen to what you say you can have it all to yourself and express your opinions pretty freely reporter were the opportunities for refreshment by the way good twain well i suppose pretty fair especially if you are walking all day reporter do you intend to lecture in boston now you are here twain no not at all i simply intend to go back home again i shall lie over sunday to rest and let mr twichell have a chance to preach at newton you may as well say that we expect hereafter to walk up to boston and after we get into the habit of this sort of thing we may extend it perhaps to new orleans or san francisco really though there was no intention on our part to excite anybody's envy or make mr weston feel badly for we were not preparing for a big walk so much as for a delightful walk mark was holding his napkin between his forefinger and thumb all the time standing in the doorway of room nine to which a select party of his friends were impatiently awaiting his return to the table and so our reporter abstained from asking him as he intended and ought to have done as to whether a bottle holder would not be a good feature in his next trip and various other important queries thanking him he accordingly withdrew end of interview three and end of section three read by john greenman this is section four of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview four political views of a humorist new york herald august twenty eighth eighteen seventy six page three elmira new york august twenty sixth eighteen seventy six after a rather dusty ride of five miles uphill from elmira the herald representative met samuel l clemens mark twain 
temporarily residing at Quarry Hill Farm, the property of one of the Langdon family, into which Mark happily married. He took me to his studio, an octagonal structure still further uphill, and commanding a romantic view of Elmira and its surroundings for miles. Mark was attired in a summer dress of snowy white, not dissimilar to that worn by Abraham Lincoln, when the same correspondent interviewed the great lamented at his house in Springfield, Illinois, in the memorable campaign of 1860, when Lincoln was first elected President of the United States. Herald Correspondent Well, Mark, now we are in your cozy and breezy studio. Suppose I interview you in regard to your opinions respecting the present political situation. Mark Twain Politics are rather out of my line, yet not outside of my interest. I am not much of a party man, but I have opinions. I should never have pushed them before the public, but if you want to catechize me, I will answer. But I want easy questions, questions which a plain answer will meet. You shall have them. First, which platform do you prefer? That is easily answered. Platforms are of such secondary importance that I have not thought it necessary to build up a preference. In most essentials the creeds of both parties are good enough for me. But there is something back of the written creeds which is important. For instance, inflation and repudiation may be glossed over in a creed, but there are a good many erring people who want these things and would vote for them. What do you think is more important than platforms? I think the men are. There used to be a party cry, Measures, not men. That was in an honester day. We need to reverse that now. When you get below the political scum, or above it, perhaps one ought to say, you will find that the solid men in both parties are equally good and equally well-meaning. Both will furnish platforms which the country can survive and progress under. But of what use are these excellent platforms if the men elected upon them shamelessly ignore them and make them a dead letter? A sound and good democratic platform was powerless to save New York from the ravages of the Tweed Gang. An excellent Republican platform has no more been able to save the country from the ravages of the present administration's highwaymen than the pasting the four gospels on a bad man's back would be to save him from the tropical end of eternity. Platforms are not the essential things now. Men are. Then how do you judge of your men? Only by common report and their letters of acceptance. Which candidate do you prefer upon these grounds? Hayes. He talks right out upon the important issues. You cannot mistake what he means concerning civil service, second term, and the honest payment of the national debt. If you can understand what Mr. Tilden means, it is only because you have got more brains than I have. But you don't look it. Mr. Tilden is a very able man. Therefore, I hold that he could have made himself understood. Why didn't he? Because one half of his party believe in one thing, and the other half in another, I suppose. And it was necessary to be a little vague. But Mr. Hendricks is not vague. He is in no hurry to have the national debt paid. Is there a Democrat whom you would have preferred to Hayes? Yes, Charles Francis Adams, a pure man, a proved statesman. I would vote for him in a minute. I wouldn't need to know what his platform was. The fact that he stood upon it would be sufficient proof to me that it was a righteous one. I want to see an honest government established once more. I mean to vote for Hayes because I believe from his own manner of talking and from all I can hear of his character and his history that he will appoint none but honest and capable men to office. 
I don't care two cents what party they belong to. I never tried to get a political office for but one man, and I forgot to ask him what his politics were, but he was a clean man and mighty capable. Mr. Tilden is an old politician, dyed in the wool. History has tried hard to teach us that we can't have good government under politicians. Now, to go and stick one at the very head of the government couldn't be wise. You know that yourself. People speak well of both candidates, don't they? I will tell you how it looks to me. I read a lot of newspapers of both creeds every day. The Republicans tell me a great many things which Hayes has done. The Democratic papers explain why Tilden didn't do a great many things. They keep on apologizing and apologizing all the time. I think that the woman or the candidate that has to be apologized for is a suspicious person. So do you. Now, let me urge you as an old friend to vote for Hayes, a man you don't have to apologize for. Well, but what do you think— No, excuse me. You can't get any political elaborations out of me. I simply want to see the right man at the helm. I don't care what his party creed is. I want a man who isn't near-sighted. I want a man who will not go on seeing angels from heaven in such buzzards as Delano, Belknap, Babcock, and the rest of that lot, long after forty million of ordinary people have detected and come to loathe them. I want to see a man in the chief chair who can not only tell a buzzard when he sees it, but will promptly wring its neck. I feel satisfied that Mr. Hayes is such a man. I am not satisfied that Mr. Tilden is. There now, let us take a smoke. My opinions are important only to me. If they were important to others, we would spread them all over the Herald. Here is your pipe. Now we will talk of things less harrowing. End of interview number four and end of section four. Read by John Greenman. This is section five of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number five. A Connecticut Carpet Bag. New York World. December 24th, 1876. Page two. Read by John Greenman. Mr. Mark Twain has been hanging around New York with a great deal of mischief in his eye for several days. He says positively that he came down from Hartford with no other purpose than to buy a bootjack for the holidays, and meekly to eat his atom of the New England dinner. But the officials at the St. James Hotel, where he has retained a bed, affirm that his goings out and comings in have been, if not mysterious enough to excite suspicion, at all events mocked and it is not denied by any one that the sugar-loaf sealskin cap with which he has seen fit to adorn his head is quite large enough to hold a very fair supply of papers and documents in addition to its usual miscellaneous cargo. It is doubtless well remembered that Mr. Mark Twain took what with other men might be called an active part in the Republican canvass last fall, so active that rumor, with her 18,762 tongues, loudly proclaimed his zeal to be begotten of an ambition to be appointed statistician of deaths, or to some other office congenial with his temperament. His movements since the campaign have therefore been watched with some interest, not to say alarm, by all lovers of political veracity. The exact date of his arrival in this city is shrouded in the deepest mystery. Either he registered under an assumed name, affixed his solemn signature to a napkin, and announced his arrival by chucking it at the head of the dignified clerk, or, as is quite likely, avoided the form altogether. 
for certain it is that neither the name nor the well-known initials m t appear upon the hotel records possibly he might have tarried here even longer and escaped unperceived but for the absurd dignity of a waiter who said he'd been vummed damned if he was a going to crawl around on the floor and pull tacks out of the carpet with his teeth not to please no gentleman as he ever waited on this to use a parliamentary form gave him away and after incessant waiting and watching a reporter of the world succeeded in intercepting him and it may be said in frustrating any contemplated nefarious design as mr twain began rapidly to pack his valise on the instant of the reporter's arrival and smiling the sad wan smile of an unearthed coyote fled with all possible speed to the depot at the moment of his discovery mr twain may not have been reading a special dispatch from zack chandler but he was certainly not reading the bible it may not have been a note from kellogg instructing him to indict a hymn for the downtrodden republican negroes of louisiana that he crumbled into a wad behind his back on seeing the reporter and subsequently devoured in mouthfuls his eyes meanwhile fixed religiously on the gas fixtures overhead but this by no means proves that it wasn't indeed there was an air of guilt about mr twain that no extraneous observations about the state of the sabbath school in new zealand availed in the least to dispel mr twain said the reporter what have you to say on the political situation sir replied mr twain bundling a long white garment into his valise it is mixed and said the reporter i didn't mix it and i don't know who did and i can't straighten it and i don't know who can and what do you think sir of having broadway with excuse me mr twain uh, now there are the southern outrages never heard of them never 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 heard of them mr twain no sir i never did by this time mr twain had one side of his bag packed and was sitting on it ain't in my line uh, let's talk about something else mr twain i understand you voted the republican ticket yes sir where's the whisk room ah here it is in you go sir would you journey through life swiftly and in peace yes replied the reporter but mr twain never mind the butts you must make a rule of packing the whisk broom first now for the pipe and the bible and there i'm all packed must go got to catch a train in three minutes good-bye and in a twinkling mr twain was on his way to hartford the reporter turned sadly to leave when the pensive voice of the republican politician was again heard and turning around he beheld mr twain with his body and his head out of the elevator i say now uh, you had better not print the information i've given you why not because it's private and because if you do i'll kill one of the editors you can't spare i will i will merry christmas End of Interview 5, Section 5, read by John Greenman. This is Section 6 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number 6, Mark Twain's Tenets, Boston Globe, March 19, 1877, page 3, column 2 while the well-known humorist mark twain was stopping at the parker house recently a reporter of the globe called on him with no particular object in view after being shown into room one sixty eight several moments elapsed before the author of the innocents abroad became aware of his presence mr twain was seen to be seated in a large easy chair with a boston paper before him smoking a cigar Finally, the porter who accompanied the reporter in question handed Mr. Twain the latter's card, and Mr. Twain immediately whirled his chair around, 
told the pleasant-faced porter to withdraw from the room and asked his caller to be seated you see for yourself said mr twain puffing away at his cigar that i'm pretty near heaven not theologically of course but by the hotel standard your room is rather high up mr twain but it appears very cozy there is an elevator i believe is there not mr t doubtless there is all first-class hotels manage to have elevators the fact is i detest elevators and i'm not ashamed to own it r then you like walking mr t much better i do my own walking and talking and write my own books which is more than everyone can say r you don't believe in plagiarizing then mr t no sir i never plagiarize unless i can do it successfully r do i understand that you never have done it mr t no sir but that was probably because i wasn't successful at it r do you believe everything that you related in innocence abroad mr t absolutely everything r do you think that the public in general do mr t of course why should they not i related everything as i saw it r if i remember rightly you mention in innocence abroad that when you went into a hairdresser's in paris to get shaved he loosened your hide and lifted you out of the chair is that a correct statement mr twain mr t certainly correct to the chair but you must remember that statement don't amount to much in any country but particularly in this country r but you believe in them nevertheless mr t not even if they have the official mark i have been trying to believe in the statements which have been sent from washington from time to time but i can't make up my mind i must tell you right here that my digestion is not so good as formerly r may i ask you what you think of president hayes cabinet mr t it appears to me that he has made excellent selections probably if i knew the men he has chosen immediately i might think right to the contrary r in that case i should think that you would eulogize them all the more mr t i never eulogize except when i don't know a person it seems to me that the safest way is to eulogize a person you don't know r may i ask what are your politics mr twain mr t i am neither a republican nor democrat for any length of time vacillation is my particular forte during the last election when the country thought tilden would surely be elected president i was a strong tildenite but as soon as i discovered that everything was against him i was strong in my support for hayes r mr twain do i infer from what you have just said that you voted for both men mr t why of course no one recognized me i did all my voting in new york i wasn't tolerated in hartford as soon as the people discovered that i was exerting all my strength for hayes they advised me kindly to leave the state i went immediately to new york city and cast my vote for tilden and yet people call this a republic r may i ask what you are now politically mr twain mr t politics have completely died out within me they don't take to me or i to them since i have come in possession of a conscience i begin to see through things r then you have not had a conscience until lately mr t no sir it is only recently that i discovered it it doesn't prove so great a blessing as i supposed it would only a day or two ago i exhausted my second deposit at the bank r i don't quite understand what you mean mr t why simply this everyone who knows that i have a conscience takes me now for a philanthropist r do you refer to bad debts mr t exactly or rather i might say that they are hotel bills which i thought were cancelled years ago 
as i told you a few moments ago since i discovered that i had a conscience i begin to see the right and wrong of things r do you like boston mr twain mr t very well but there seems to be a good many issues floating around here but i suppose this is peculiar to the city i am going to the tabernacle this evening r are you going merely out of curiosity or are you going because your conscience says you must mr t i'm going for mere recreation religion oftentimes soothes the mind and eases the conscience even if it doesn't penetrate deep into the memory but i can't talk any more with you today i have already said too much i'm afraid so uh, good-bye end of interview six and section six read by john greenman this is section seven of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview number seven baltimore gazette circa april twenty seventh eighteen seventy seven last evening a representative of the gazette called to see his old friend mark twain at guy's hotel conversation turned on the war in europe mr clemens had been there is on terms of familiarity with all the crowned heads and seemed to feel pained that he had not been personally advised that the czar would so soon throw off his coat i think nick might have notified me by cable at his own expense so that i might have been in on the ground floor see what a clever turn i could have made in grain i am strongly tempted to get a subtle ship in the turkish army and wreak my vengeance on the bear do you think russia will move first on silistria or kalayat well nicholas is a long-headed man but if he doesn't keep a sharp lookout all his fat will be in the fire but i can't keep the run of the movements by the cable dispatches can't locate the places on crack your jaw off via bully boy you know on to crush my libet. then i look on my european map and i don't find the places a european map is like a blackboard with nothing on it leaving the industrious student of contemporaneous history to fill in the outlines the hard part of it is that they'll go on fighting just as though good maps were to be had for the asking mr clemens i think you are too severe on map makers the evening bugle blast of this city today publishes a most carefully prepared and readable map of the seat of war i have a copy of it here well i'm sorry for you old fellow i didn't know that a strong cigar would affect you that way you've got em on you bad why that's a map of the st louis hotel in ruins from the war in europe to the rumpus in the black hills was an easy turn having high times in the hills mr clemens yes and i tell you my heart bleeds for the poor prospector there may be gold there i suppose there is but there isn't the big money we hear of the men who dig gold out of the black hills have got to work for it and earn it the glitter gets into print the tales of hardships and bitter disappointments don't when a man comes in and tells about rich finds you must stop to consider what sort of a man he is if he had been making a dollar or two a day and hits on ten in the diggings he thinks he's struck a fortune and it isn't a bad thing but a man with a good situation a paying business or a thriving farm had better keep down to his work the average man would do better to dig for clams than to go hunting for gold in the hills but speaking of mining and getting in big licks in the best of days of california mining the best of it wasn't worth more than two hundred dollars a day to any digger now a man would have to hammer away for some time before he could make a fortune even at that and there were not many who struck it that rich the best paying mining is in the pockets and outside of calaveras county california jackass gulch and jackass hill there's no other pocket mining in the world by the way the scene of our new play bret hart's and mine is in calaveras county 
there is no other place that would justify a sin in picking out such a mass of metal of course you think you've struck it in a sin well that remains to be seen you can't tell anything about a play until you see it played we know we've got a good character in a sin whether it is in the right setting is another matter we've put good work on the play it may have to be pushed but expect to make it go you know we are rehearsing it at ford's opera house now and it promises well but the test will come when we put it before an audience we bring it out in washington on the seventh of may and open in baltimore on the fourteenth the reporter had something less than half a mile of questions wherewith to rack mr clement's brain but he did all the talking and the reporter had to give him respectful audience mr clemens saw a way out of the difficulty just say that you asked me the questions and i couldn't answer them end of interview seven and end of section seven read by john greenman this is section eight of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview eight mark twain and his chinaman by garth new york daily graphic may third eighteen seventy seven page four thirty eight read by john greenman i spent part of my days or rather nights with marcus the second at guy's old hotel where the frogs and fried perch were just in season parslow was there every day the actor who is to play ah sin look at him said mark ain't he a lost and wandering chinee by nature see those two front teeth of parslow just separated far enough to give him the true mongrel look yes said parslow when the fellow knocked out that middle tooth some years ago i was mad but now i ain't mad one bit there said mark there is the instinct of art he would lose his whole jaw his dyspepsia or anything to be an artist parslow's a devoted fellow the piece is to rally around the title character ah sin will be the title nobody but clemens and parslow superintending mr hart the associate author being out of range they selected ford's theatre for several reasons partly because it was out of the way and mainly because mr ford is a hard accommodating painstaking manager of great experience whose family has tastes like his own all of them with the dramatic instinct twain works at this piece with a regular slow shrewd journeyman's hand and mind but i think he will never make a partnership piece again he has written two characters in it end of interview eight and section eight read by john greenman this is section nine of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview nine the start for germany new york times april twelfth eighteen seventy eight page eight read by john greenman the first name on the passenger list of the holsatia that called yesterday was hon bayard taylor united states envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary then followed mrs bayard taylor and miss lillian taylor mrs murat halstead miss jenny halstead master robert halstead mr samuel l clemens and family the new minister was smoking another of those large cigars one eye upon the trunks with the other watching the wreaths of smoke that puffed to leeward when a peculiar-looking caravan drove down the pier it might once have been a coach but it had been transformed into a sort of pyramid on wheels as it stopped and a door opened in its side a gentleman and two ladies alighted drawing after them a nurse and a large number of children whom they carefully counted the lifting of a few dozen trunks from the top of the pyramid disclosed the gilsey house coach shining with gilt 
it has brought to the steamer mr and mrs samuel l clemens a lady friend of mrs clemens several children and a nurse mark twain the innocent who was soon to be abroad again wore a small black silk cap which as one of the bystanders said made him look like a brakeman having checked off his family into the saloon he came out upon the deck to shake hands with the new minister where's halstead said the innocent i don't know replied the minister i haven't seen him to-day i left him about one o'clock this morning one o'clock echoed mark twain why you ought to have been in bed by that time i know it replied the minister and i begged reed not to keep it up the last night but he insisted and they were all so jolly i couldn't get away i've had a hard time of it the last two weeks i've had just as hard a time said mark i've been railroading for two weeks and taking mixed drinks i suppose you stick to one thing all the time straight well i don't know said bayard taylor what do you call straight drinks coffee said mark or whiskey if you drink it all the time a heavy increase in the shower here rudely broke up what promised to be an important state communication mr samuel l clemens while in one of the fits of sober earnest that strike him occasionally said that he was going to germany partly for the health of his family and partly to give him the opportunity to write which he finds he cannot do well at home i am going to the most out-of-the-way place in germany i can find said he fifty miles away from any railroad where i can sleep more than half the time we have not rented our house in hartford so if we get tired soon there is nothing to prevent us from coming back at any time but if we like it we may stay for two or three years on being asked whether he had more innocence abroad in mind he replied i am going to do some writing i have been contemplating it for a long time and now i am in for it but it will not be any more innocence abroad that is done up and done for you'd better travel this time as the sage of hartford suggested minister taylor i will said mark or the time or any other herb mark twain was accompanied to the steamer by the historical character dan with whom every reader of the innocents abroad is well acquainted dan is mr daniel sloat a wholesale stationer of william street and the manufacturer of the mark twain scrapbooks dan engaged mark's staterooms several weeks ago anonymously and as he confessed was warned by sam that he must be careful what he said to those newspaper fellows dan insisted upon saying that sam is one of the best fellows in the world and the funniest and the latter statement was so evidently true that it carried the other through without question i know him from top to bottom said dan when we were out on the quaker city expedition he was the hardest working man i ever saw why out in egypt where the fleas were so thick you couldn't breathe without swallowing a thousand that man used to sit up and write write half the night i used to have to get my clothes off in a second and hustle into bed before any of the fleas had a chance to get between the sheets and as i was vainly trying to get to sleep i'd say to clemens sam how the deuce can you stand it to write out there among the fleas oh i'm all right sam would say they've got a railroad track eaten out around both ankles and they keep in that pretty well so i don't bother with them mr taylor went below an hour before the sailing time to avoid the rain that at one o'clock came down in torrents mark twain however having soothed the youngest baby into a quiet state went down to the pier to have a last chat with dan who by the way is the image of his picture in the innocents abroad they were at once surrounded by an army of press representatives one of whom went so far as to ask twain are you going to europe a thing that in the most matter-of-fact newspaper might safely have been taken for granted under the circumstances somebody spoke of the quantities of flowers the passengers had taken into the saloon yes said mark it's all nonsense 
they run it into the ground. I was talking with some of my relations about it the other day, and told them what I thought about it, particularly at funerals. They said they had intended to give me a good send-off when I died, but if I didn't like the flowers, they wouldn't send any. I told them that was all right. I'd rather have ice, anyhow. Our new minister appeared upon deck again. He walked to the stern and looked anxiously up the street. There was nobody in sight but an old lady selling beaded pincushions and a peanut man. It was not either of these that the new minister wished to see. He kept up his anxious look while Mark Twain, still standing upon the wharf, told how all the ocean steamers feed their passengers well, except one line that he named, which he said still gives its passengers the same fare it did thirty years ago, invariably giving them boiled rice and stewed prunes every Thursday for the benefit of their health. End of Interview 9 and End of Section 9 Read by John Greenman This is section 10 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 10. Mark Twain Interviewed. By Richard Whiting. New York World, May 11, 1879, page 1. Read by John Greenman. Paris, April 25th. The sojourn of a certain distinguished American in Paris ought to receive more notice than I have lately given it. I sent you a meager sketch of a speech made by Mark Twain at a club dinner. I now forward, by way of atonement, a full account of his conversation in a tete-a-tete. -tete. I called on him at the Hotel de Normandie, one of the brand-new ones near the lately completed Avenue de l'Opera, where he leads a very retired life. He is seldom seen in society and he declines all formal invitations. I first asked him about the book he is now writing, and he gave me the following answer. It is a gossipy volume of travel, and will be similar to The Innocents Abroad in size, and similarly illustrated. I shall draw some of the pictures for it myself. However, that need not frighten anybody, for I shall draw only a few. I think the book will not be finished in time for the summer season, but will appear in the fall. I call it a gossipy volume, and that is what it is. He talks about anything and everything, and always drops a subject the moment my interest in it begins to slacken. It is as discursive as a conversation. It has no more restraints or limitations than a fireside talk has. I have been drifting around on an idle, easy-going tramp, so to speak, for a year, stopping when I pleased, moving on when I got ready. My book has caught the complexion of the trip. In a word, it is a book written by one loafer for a brother loafer to read. The mention of the book naturally led to the question of international copyright, of which he said, I think we can't tell much about the matter yet. I hope the Convention of Authors, which is to hold its second annual meeting in June in London, will be able to give it a start. No doubt the authors could have achieved international copyright before this if the publishers had kept their fingers out of the pie, but they wouldn't. I suppose that when you come to look this business fairly in the face, the publisher and not the author is the party mainly interested anyhow in the life or death of international copyright, on our side of the water. We have only about twenty-five authors whose books are usually republished in England. The works of six or eight of these are usually translated and published on the continent. Some of these authors write a book a year, some a book in three or four years. Altogether they turn out an average of fifteen books a year, say. With a foreign copyright on these fifteen books, the bunch would be worth $7,000 or $8,000 in the English market, perhaps. If one author wrote the whole fifteen, it would be worth his while to long for international copyright. But he writes only one of them, and his fifteenth of the sum is 
not big enough to matter to set him wild about international copyright. With our publishers the thing is different. There are only a few of these firms. You may count them on your fingers, and they are not restricted to twelve saleable foreign books a year. No, the saleable foreign books, which they can seize and publish every year without paying for the privilege, mount into the hundreds. If English publishers rob American authors of eight thousand dollars a year, under the present system American publishers rob foreign authors of at least one hundred thousand dollars a year, to put it well within bounds. An American publisher who saves his tenth of this sum annually through the present system will naturally work harder to preserve the system than the American author will to break it down, since he would only get two hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars a year out of England under a new system, and only losses that sum annually under the present one. I cannot name six American authors who can say their pockets are perceptibly worse off without international copyright than they would be with it, for our books do not sell enormously in foreign lands. We could not starve an English publisher by compelling him to pay us full copyright. We could not perceptibly enrich him by making him a present of our books. On the other hand, observe what shiploads of books our publishers turn out yearly bearing the names of Macaulay, George Eliot, Dickens, Thackeray, Tennyson, Reed, Black, Victor Hugo, and others. I have not space for the list even of this order of authors without touching those other long lists of authors who deal in school books, the sciences, and the arts where an american author is interested ten cents worth encompassing international copyright the american publisher is interested a hundred dollars worth in blocking his project i speak only of the american author's pecuniary interest in the matter not his moral interest now you see what an uphill game the struggle for international copyright is likely to be our publishers are rich they are a compact body. They have business ability. They know how to use a lobby. Moreover, they are always powerfully backed by a Congress of Innocents at Washington, whom they persuade without the least trouble that an effect of international copyright would be to raise the price of foreign books. There are some congressmen whom they can't convince of this, but they convince his constituents, and that amounts to the same thing. I would like to see international copyright succeed out of simple justice to the foreign authors. It could be of no particular benefit to American authors, for we have no market worth speaking of but England, and she and her publishers give us all the copyright protection we need, partly by law and partly by courtesy. If an American author stands upon English soil when his book is issued in England, his copyright is as good there as it is at home. It is better, in fact, in some minor particulars. Advance sheets usually have the effect of copyright, too. This is by mutual understanding among the publishers. Some of our American publishers respect the advance sheet system also. Two or three of my books enjoy full copyright in England. Mr. Story's books are copyrighted there also Joaquin Miller's, and others whose names do not occur to me at the moment. In Germany Baron Tauschnitz buys my books and pays for them. On the whole I think American authors are pretty fairly treated by the foreigners. They ought to do all they can to get fair treatment in America for foreign authors, and I am perfectly sure they will. While they have nothing that can fairly be called a pecuniary interest in the matter, they have an interest which is still stronger, the moral one, and the pecuniary interest will come. We shall number a population of a hundred millions before a very great while, and among them some authors who will be widely read abroad. It will be much easier to secure international copyright now, as far as America is concerned, than it will be then. Finally came the inevitable question— why have you never written a book about England? 
I have spent a great deal of time in England. Your question is not a new one to me. And I made a world of notes, but it was of no use. I couldn't get any fun out of England. It is too grave a country, and its gravity soaks into the stranger and makes him as serious as everybody else. When I was there I couldn't seem to think of anything but deep problems of government, taxes, free trade, finance, and every night I went to bed drunk with statistics. I could have written a million books, but my publisher would have hired the common hangmen to burn them. One is bound to respect England. She is one of the three great republics of the world. In some respects she is the most real republic of the three, too, and in other respects she isn't. But she is not a good text for hilarious literature. No, there wasn't anything to satirize. What I mean is you couldn't satirize any given thing in England in any but a half-hearted way, because your conscience told you to look nearer home, and you would find that very thing at your own door. A man with a humpbacked uncle mustn't make fun of another man's cross-eyed aunt. The English love for the Lord, for instance. I don't mean the Lord of the prayer book, but the Lord of peerage. I couldn't gird at the English love for titles while our own love for titles was still more open to sarcasm. Take our honorable, for instance. Unless my memory has gone wholly astray, no man in America has any right to stick that word before his name. To do it is a sham, and a very poor sham at that. At the beginning of this century members of the two houses of Congress were referred to simply as Mr. So-and-so, but this sham honorable has since crept in, and now it is unlawfully conferred upon members of state legislatures and even upon the mayors and city councillors of the paltriest back settlements. Follow the thing a little further. In England, Temporary titles are dropped when their time is up. The Lord Mayor of London is addressed as My Lord all through his year of office, but the moment he is out he becomes plain Mr. again. But with us, once Honorable, always Honorable. Once Governor, always Governor. I know men who were members of legislatures or mayors of villages twenty years ago and they are always mentioned in the papers as the Honorable, to this day. I know people who were lieutenant governors years ago, and they are called Governor to this day. Yet the highest title they have ever had any right to, in office or out of it, was plain Mr. You see, yourself, it wouldn't quite answer for me to poke fun at title-loving Englishmen, I should hear somebody squeal behind me and find I had stepped on the tail of some ex-official monkey of our own. I couldn't satirize the English civil service. It was excellent, and ours wasn't. It was open to everybody, rich or poor, conspicuous or obscure, whereas ours was only open to scrubs who would do political dirty work for public enemies like Mr. Conkling. Honorable Mr. Conkling, to use the obsequious, illegal phrase of the day. I couldn't venture to be sarcastic about horrible corruption of English officials, for how could I know but that something of the same kind, in a minor degree, might be discovered among our own officials at any moment? I could not poke fun at the court column, which daily sets forth the walking and driving and dining achievements of kings and queens and dukes, while our own papers have a still longer court column of personals, wherein the movements of half a dozen permanent celebrities, a dozen evanescents, and two dozen next-to-nobodies are duly and daily recorded. I couldn't satirize English justice, for it was exactly like our own and every other country's that is to say, there didn't appear to be any particular rule in the matter of penalties. In New York I have known an Irishman to be sentenced to a month's confinement for nearly killing his wife, and another man to be jailed for a dreary long term for stealing a blanket. Now, here is some English justice. 
these two paragraphs are from yesterday's london standard hamley a strange case of cruelty came before the stipendiary magistrate this morning an elderly woman was charged with assaulting her niece the allegations were that the child had been beaten with undue severity until she was much bruised and she was then washed in turpentine and salt causing great agony the defense was a denial and that the child was incorrigible the bench commenting on the undue severity of the punishment imposed a fine of one shilling and costs northampton at the police court to-day john old was summoned by the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals for gross cruelty to a dog the evidence showed that prisoner had brutally ill-treated the animal he was seen to dash it against the stones and kick it repeatedly in the streets he afterwards severely wounded it by striking it with a shovel he was about to bury it while still alive but was prevented the animal died soon after from the effects of prisoner's ill usage old was sentenced to a month's hard labor without the option of a fine the italics are mine you see if you treat a dog inhumanly you can't get off with a fine you must go to prison for a month at hard labor but if you treat a little girl inhumanly you catch a scathing lecture from the bench and you have to pay a fine of twenty-five entire cents besides and stand the costs on top of that no i whittled my opportunities down to this one can fling criticisms at the ill-matched colors of english ladies dresses he could poke fun at the peddling of sermons and reversions of livings and say sarcastic things about various other trifles but after his book was finished there wouldn't be fun enough in it to keep the reader from dying of melancholy no i looked the ground all over there's nothing funny in england why there's the english humorous papers they are not funny they are pathetic you could have written about the manners and customs yes but only to a certain extent for instance i could have written freely about public manners and customs and given instances i could have said that the innocent and ignorant backwoodsman of the unvisited remoteness of america is the twin brother of innumerable well-dressed londoners in one respect the disposition to glare and stare into a lady's face in the street and to follow her up shoulder to shoulder and crane his head around and still eagerly glare and stare until the poor victim is ready to cry with mortification and fear i could have written as much as i pleased about public manners and customs and been free to applaud or to blame but there an end the real interest would lie in the private and domestic manners and customs and i had no right to print anything about those either praisefully or otherwise i was a guest in many english homes but when a man takes you into his house he tacitly takes you into his confidence and it would be a graceless thing to abuse it mr dickens was not so particular with america no he wasn't but he recognized later that he had not done a thing to be proud of but just the reverse when he came to america the second time he apologized but that is neither here nor there private matters are private matters and it is not right to meddle with them we all have our superstitions and that is one of mine this brought our conversation to a close. End of interview number 10 and end of section 10 read by John Greenman. This is section 11 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 11. Mark Twain Back Again. New York Sun, September 3, 1879. Page 1. Read by John Greenman. The only thing about Mark Twain that seems natural is his drawl. That is, as nasal and as deliberate as ever. 
his hat as he stood on the deck of the incoming cunarder gallia yesterday was of the pattern that english army officers wear in india and his suit of clothes was such as a merchant wears at his store he looks older than when he went to germany and his hair has turned quite gray his wife returned with him and his brother-in-law came on board at quarantine so as mark twain said i shall let him take off my luggage and fight it out with the custom house officers i've had a good time said he during the seventeen months i've been abroad you remember i went out on a dutch steamer the same one that bayard taylor went on he got out at plymouth and i never saw him again while he was at berlin i corresponded with him and we made an appointment to meet in the fall i stayed on the continent most of the time how far have you got in ollendorf he was asked oh i don't speak german replied the humorist it's enough that i've endured the agony of learning to read it i made two or three speeches in german at heidelberg in my peculiar german i stayed at heidelberg four months i could have written my book in german but then you see i want the book read so i wrote it in english english is about the cleverest language i ever handled i like english somebody nudged mark twain and introduced to him a man who said that he had heard of him and read his writings but never had the pleasure etc yes said mr clemens i stayed a long while in heidelberg and in dresden and munich and venice and paris and about four weeks in london wherever i stayed a month i went to work on my book it's finished and will be published in november i don't know what the name of it is but i know what it's about it's about this trip i've taken no it isn't fiction it's about my journey like the innocents abroad all serious all facts and wisdom i say it's finished but it isn't the first half is done but i've got to go through the last half and throw whole rafts of it away after that i may run through the first half and throw away lots of that then it will be ready for the printer i'm going to have it published by the same folks that published all my things here a young man intervened between mr clemens and the reporter and said he'd often read of mr clemens and seen his writings but that this was really the first time etc some of the places i went to mr clemens continued i had been to before but most of them were new i suppose new york's changed i used to go up a block or two above the gilsey house to see the men work on the elevated railroads to see how fast they slung the iron together before i went away dan sloat and i parted one afternoon and the next day dan told me that he wanted to hurry up town so he started for the elevated railroad the one in greenwich street was running then well he got a thinking and he thought it was risky for a man with a family and a good business to trust to one of those roads so he turned on his heel and walked away to get a bus while there was a woman washing windows near the top of a four-story house and down she came so close to dan that her heels took the buttons off his coat and her head greased his shoulder she was killed of course and dan had a narrow escape the moral of that is in my opinion that a man who is looking out for his life might as well trust to his first impulses 
at this point there was introduced to mark twain a robust seafaring man who said he had often heard of mr clemens but had never read a word and then he corrected himself and said he had never had the extreme pleasure etc when i sailed in the batavia said mr clemens to the seafaring man i had a different opinion of the cunard line from that which i now entertain i objected to the prunes i suppose you know that when the cunarders changed from sailing to steam power they maintained some of their old sailing ideas on the new steam propelled ships prunes was one of these old ideas why they had regular days for things duff day was thursday and i guess sunday was a duff day too that was when they served out puddings the same as they do to sailors aboard a sailing ship then there were tuesday beans and saturday beans and prunes twenty-one times a week for dessert they hunted the world for cooks and got the worst there were why you could make up your bill of fare a week ahead yes for the return trip but that's all done now mr clemens asked after friends of his and in speaking about mr murat halstead said that that gentleman went out with him upon a sudden impulse and took no clothes along no said mr clemens i didn't lend him mine because they wouldn't fit him and besides i didn't have any more than i wanted myself did you have a pleasant trip the reporter would have finished the question but a burly custom-house officer grasped the traveller's hand and said i've often heard of mr Twa uh, mr clemens and i've read your writings but i never had the pleasure etc oh yes replied mr clemens to the reporter lord dunraven and several other lords and many new yorkers are on board and we had a good time i never express any opinions about people but lord dunraven is an uncommonly clever fellow nothing stuck up about him he has brushed up against ordinary clay in his lifetime and he is very talented besides mr clemens had twenty-two freight packages and twelve trunks weighing on his mind and he went away to get his brother-in-law to look after them he goes to elmira today to spend the remainder of the season and to finish his new book end of interview number eleven and end of section eleven read by john greenman This is section 12 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview number 12. Mark Twain, Home Again. New York Times, September 3, 1879, page 8. Read by John Greenman. Mr. Samuel L. Clemens, who is much better known to Americans as Mark Twain, the pilgrim who was moved to tears while leaning upon the tomb of Adam, and the nearest surviving kin of the jumping frog of Calaveras, reached this city in the steamship Gallia yesterday, after an absence of a year and a half in Europe. Mr. Twain was accompanied by his wife, twelve trunks, and twenty-two freight packages, and the entire party, after a smooth voyage, arrived in good health and spirits and were met and welcomed down at quarantine by a number of friends. During his absence he had visited London, Paris, Heidelberg, Munich, Venice, and a number of other cities, spending most of his time on the continent, and making prolonged stays in Paris, Heidelberg, and Munich. When Mark Twain went away, it was generally believed that his intention was to familiarize himself with German that he might prepare one or two scientific works that are still lacking in that language he not only did not deny these reports but rather encouraged them and his taking passage in a german steamer added greater probability to them it is now certain however that such was not his object he did have some designs upon the german language but not with the intention of producing a scientific work a very celebrated professor in munich who has since died wrote him a long german letter inquiring about the point of one of the jokes in the innocents abroad 
and mr twain desired to learn enough of the language to explain away the difficulty after more than a year of study he says he can read german well enough but that when it comes to talking english is good enough for him yes said he in response to questions asked by a group of reporters who surrounded him on all sides except that occupied by the saloon table so thickly that he could not fill out his custom-house declaration i have been writing a new book and have it nearly finished all but the last two or three chapters the first half of it i guess is finished but the last half has not been revised yet and when i get at it i will do a good deal of rewriting and a great deal of tearing up i may possibly tear up the first part of it too and rewrite that with all this tearing up in prospect the book seemed in such danger of being entirely destroyed that one of the reporters suggested the production of a few chapters in advance in the newspapers as samples but mr twain said that the manuscript was in the bottom of one of his trunks where it could not possibly be reached he added however that the book was descriptive of his latest trip and the places he visited entirely solemn in character like the innocents abroad and very much after the general plan of that work and that it has not yet been named it is to be published by the same company that brought out his other books and is to be ready in november they want me to stay in new york and revise it he continued but i cannot possibly do that i am going to start tomorrow morning for elmira where we will stay for some time on his outgoing voyage mr twain had for fellow passengers mr bayard taylor the american minister to germany and mr murat halstead who started on five minutes notice and without any clothes except those he wore i did not see mr taylor after we left the ship he said but corresponded frequently with him his death was a great surprise to me no no i did not lend mr halstead any clothes he could not get into mine and besides i hadn't any more than i wanted for myself the age of the author of the innocents abroad roughing it and the gilded age has not increased apparently in the last two years his hair is no whiter than when he last sailed for europe he is very much the same man except that he went away in a silk hat and came back in a cloth hat he was particularly well pleased with the steamer i don't like some of these vessels said he some of them keep a man hungry all the time unless he has a good appetite for boiled rice i know some steamers where they have the same bill of fare they used to have when the company ran sailing packets beans on tuesday and friday stewed prunes on thursday and boiled rice on wednesday all very healthy but very bad but we are fed like princes aboard here and have made a comfortable voyage we have been in some seas that would have made the old quaker city turn somersaults but this ship kept steady through it all we could leave a mirror lying on the washstand and it would not fall off if we stood a goblet loose on the shelf at night it would be there in the morning mr twain declined positively however to say whether a cocktail left standing on the shelf at night would be there all safe in the morning the ship was hardly steady enough for that there was a little ponderous silence that no one interrupted for the returning writer was evidently revolving something in his mind i want a ride on one of the elevated railroads said he i've never been on one of them yet i used to be afraid of them but it's no use death stares us in the face everywhere and we may as well take it in its elevated form i have a friend who wanted to ride on the elevated when the first one was built but when he looked at it he thought of his wife and children and concluded to walk home on the way uptown a woman who was washing a third-story window fell out and just grazed my friend's head she was killed and he had a very narrow escape it's no use there are women washing windows everywhere and 
we may as well fall as be fallen upon this new book of mine said he breaking suddenly off from the custom-house blanks is different from any book i ever wrote before i revised the manuscript as i went along and knew pretty well at the end of each week how much of the week's work i should use and how much i should throw away but this one has been written pretty much all in a lump and i hardly know how much of it i will use or how much will have to be torn up when i start at it i tear it up pretty fast but i think the first half will stand pretty much as it is i am not quite sure that there is enough yet prepared but i am still at work at it the group of reporters and five or six listening cabin passengers stood by waiting for something stupendous in the way of a joke to follow all this serious talk several times mr twain's lips moved as if about to speak but he was silent the upper end of staten island was passed and the joke was still unborn governor's island came alongside the battery drew astern the cunard pier was reached and yet the joker by profession and reputation kept his audience in suspense the landing was made but the joke still lay locked up with the manuscript in the bottom of the trunk end of interview number 12 and end of section 12 read by john greenman This is section 13 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 13. Mark Twain's Return. New York Herald, September 3, 1879, page 3. Read by John Greenman. Mr. Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, arrived in this city yesterday on the Cunard steamer Gallia, after a tour of eighteen months through the principal countries of europe mr clemens who was accompanied by his wife and family appeared in excellent health i enjoyed the trip greatly he said to a herald reporter and i learned a great deal that will serve me in after life i am glad to find said the reporter that after so many years of mental labor you at last enjoyed a long respite from your literary avocations respite he exclaimed with astonishment and then with a merry twinkle in his eye he said in confidential whisper you don't mean that why not if you are in earnest in your remark i can tell you just as earnestly i never spent a busier time in my life i only wish i could show you the piles of manuscript that are lying in my trunks and then you would have some idea of the work in which i have been engaged as he spoke the custom-house officers were rushing here and there along the wharf examining the baggage and seeing them approach the place where his trunks lay he asked to be excused for a few minutes when the inspection of what he termed his cargo was concluded he returned and resumed his conversation i feel a deep sense of relief he said in returning to this the dearest land to me in the world many a time here the conversation was interrupted by a visitor who abruptly remarked mr clemens one moment with another apology mr clemens departed but soon returned and taking his seat beside the reporter said you desire to know how i was occupied during my travels well i will tell you i spent three months in heidelberg it is a delightful place i spent three more in paris these were six months taken out of my trip to tell you briefly i traveled for the comfort of my family and wherever i found they could enjoy the attractions and the scenes there i settled down i was not traveling in the ordinary sense of running from place to place do you intend to give a history of your travels through the public journals oh no nothing will appear concerning my travels till my book is published i have spent much time and labor on it and i do not propose to anticipate its publication 
it would not be fair to expect that after see there goes the earl of dunraven he said suddenly snapping the thread of his topic we have had aristocracy in abundance in company with us on our return trip the earl is fast becoming americanized how well you see he has been so often in this country before that he has got a great deal of that aristocratic idea rubbed off him and the last three words were delivered with an emphasis and a knowing wink that showed how the humorist was engaged in studying character during the voyage we had two other lords among the passengers lord caledon and rodney but as i had not previously formed their acquaintance i cannot offer any opinion concerning them as representatives of the english aristocracy what will be the title of your new book asked the reporter i cannot tell that now was the reply it will take me some time for consideration on that point after i have arranged my manuscript i have written more and torn up more manuscript after it was written than you can imagine but it will not take me long to prepare the work for publication mr clemens concluded by saying that after remaining a few days in this city he would return to his home in hartford and there settle down for a few months to the completion of his book end of interview number thirteen and end of section thirteen read by john greenman this is section fourteen of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview number fourteen mr twain again with us new york world september third eighteen seventy nine page one on the eleventh day of april eighteen seventy eight mr mark twain of nowhere in particular sometimes though seldom known as mr samuel l clemens of hartford connecticut set out for europe on the steamer holsatia the following day he did the same thing over again the steamship for reasons which were explained at the time having been obliged to come back and take a fresh start yesterday mr twain returned he was one of the passengers on the gallia there said he as the ship left quarantine and began her journey up the bay the danger is finally past to what danger do you refer mr twain asked a reporter for the world who had been trying for ten minutes without success to lift the great humorist from a deep and silent melancholy why you see replied the returning wanderer whose voice has lost none of its querulous plaintiveness by dealing with foreign tongues i haven't been at all certain but what we've had to go back and begin this voyage all over again i said to my friend mrs clemens the other day if they had to try twice to get us started what reason have we to hope that they won't find it necessary to try several times before they are able to get back it's one of the peculiarities of sea life that um, given the same circumstances you always look for the same results when the ship begins to roll sideways and kick up behind at the same time i always know that i am expected to perform a certain duty i learned it years ago on the quaker city you might suppose that i would have forgotten my part after so long a residence on shore but there it is again it's habit everything connected with the sea comes down to a matter of habit you might confine me for forty years in a rhode island corn patch and at the end of that time i'd know just as well what to do when a ship begins to kick up as i do at the moment the darkest night never confuses me in the least it's a little singular when you look at it ain't it but i presume it's attributable to the solemn steadfastness of the great deep by the way how is pinafore I beg pardon uh, how is what pinafore i understand you've had pinafore in america i told sullivan and gilbert pinafore was sure to be a great success indeed why did you think so i didn't that was the reason it was sure to succeed it was pleasant to hear mr twain run on in this easy way 
but the reporter realizing that there was much that the public was burning to know felt compelled to conduct the rest of the interview in a systematic business-like manner you sailed in the same ship with bayard taylor and mr murat halstead of cincinnati did you not mr twain the same craft all honor to her mr twain lifted his hat reverently carried all three of us it was said at the time that you invade mr halstead into making the voyage by promising him free use of your linen well mr twain spoke leisurely i did tell murat that i'd lend him a clean shirt you see he didn't expect to go his wife was going and he'd sort of come down to see her safely launched you remember the ship ran away with a party of excursionists who had got aboard to bid poor mr taylor good-bye and was obliged to anchor off the hook all night during the evening murat sort of got his sea legs on and says he clemens he always calls me clemens says he clemens if you'll lend me a shirt i believe i'll go across all right says i i'll do it so murat he fixed things with the captain and stayed aboard we got along pretty well with winds a middling about nor nor west by sow till we came to latitude thirty six longitude forty nine and a half and then murat wanted his clean shirt that is he wanted mine it was about three bells from noon when i took that garment to the door of murat's stateroom here says i clothe yourself like a prince of the realm at eight bells mr halstead came out of his apartment with his coat buttoned up to his chin and his face as red as a red red rose he wore his coat buttoned up to his chin all the rest of the voyage and i never so much as got a glimpse of my shirt there was a kind of rumor on the ship that murat never wore that shirt or any other shirt i don't know how true it was but when i came to study the thing it did look to me as if i'd put a rather tough problem to the editor of the cincinnati commercial for his neck measures eighteen inches while mine never footed up more than fifteen even when i had the mumps did you see anything of mr taylor after you landed no i'm very sorry now but i was prevented by one thing and another from calling upon him you have written a book since you left america i believe yes i've sort of put some words together what do you call it well i don't know what i shall call it i've turned over a good many names in my mind but none of them seem to hit her exactly you see she ain't a novel if she was i'd call her lucy or the crescent cross or if he shouldn't come what then or some suggestive title but the trouble is she ain't a novel what is the nature of the book it is the history of the travels of a single family it also resembles webster's dictionary and johnson's encyclopedia you can read any part or all the parts independent of the other parts and be vicariously instructed open the book where you will in short she is to be a corker when she is bound how soon do you expect to have the work before the public can't say i am going right straight to elmira to finish her up revise her etc she'll be published by the same fortunate beings who have published my other works in conclusion mr twain said that he had enjoyed his seventeen months abroad immensely having tarried principally in london paris dresden munich vienna and heidelberg end of interview fourteen and end of section fourteen read by john greenman this is section fifteen of mark twain the complete interviews this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 15. An Innocent Abroad. Mark Twain in Montreal. Montreal Gazette, November 28, 1881, page 3. Read by John Greenman. To the casual observer, the name of Samuel L. Clemens, which was inscribed on the register of the Windsor Hotel yesterday, or rather Saturday, might probably pass unnoticed a moment's reflection however 
would recall to the minds of most persons recollections of pleasant hours spent in the perusal of certain humorous works and of oft-times uncontrollable laughter indulged in over the inimitable drolleries contained in those works whose author is known far and wide as mark twain the nom de plume of what he himself would call plain and simple samuel l clemens who arrived in this city on saturday evening and whom yesterday afternoon a representative of the gazette had the pleasure of meeting many of our readers are doubtless familiar with the face of the humorist from the cuts which adorn the front page of many of his works suffice it to say that the portrait in question is a fair though not a flattering likeness in manner mr clemens is rather the reverse of what might be expected cool quiet in demeanor acting and speaking always with great deliberation there is little indication of the clever witty mind which all know him to possess nor in discoursing with him is there anything to indicate beyond a stray flash of wit here and there uttered in a dry way which would lead one to imagine that one of the most original humorous writers of the day was speaking in the course of conversation carried on intermittently between the puff of a corn-cob pipe on his part with our representative mr clemens explained that this was his first visit to canada he had skirted round the edge of upper canada he said in the neighborhood of detroit and windsor but had never been in the dominion after a brief allusion to his business here which is in connection with his forthcoming prince and pauper something as he explained out of his usual line mr clemens spoke of some of his experiences with lecture audiences the subject being brought up by the inquiry as to whether he intended or could be induced to lecture here his reply to that query was that in order to be in a position to say he had no lectures he had some years ago burned all his manuscripts at any rate he did not care to lecture before a strange audience doors open at seven thirty the trouble will begin at eight is a familiar line in one of his writings suggested the reporter that said mr clemens expressed his idea on the subject and the trouble wasn't over till a quarter past meaning the work of gaining the sympathies of an audience it was always a hard ordeal breaking the ice and a shivering task until the hearer was enticed from his frosty reserve in this connection mr clemens alluded to mr archibald forbes lecture on the inner life of a war correspondent which that gentleman delivered in hartford a few weeks ago he had sympathized with mr forbes he said on that occasion great as was the interest of that lecture it took fully thirty minutes to thaw the heart for people out of their frozen attitude en passant the humorist observed that he had formed one of the party of journalists which included the great war correspondent at the arrival of that gaudiest of gaudy frauds the shah of persia naturally one feels inclined to ask a stranger what his impression of montreal may be but the question in nine cases out of ten is an absurd one though as a rule every interviewer feels it incumbent on him to put it but in the present case it was obviously useless mr clemens volunteered the statement that his experience of the city so far was confined within the four walls of his room and his view from the window he had formed one impression however and that was that we were a very religious community people here he said judging from what he could see went to church about five times a day and then in response to an observation he expressed the opinion that montreal more perhaps than brooklyn deserved the title of city of churches these remarks naturally led up to a talk on montreal its institutions and characteristics and speaking of the diversified language and the mode of conducting public business in both french and english mr clemens alluded to his experience of the legislature in honolulu sandwich islands 
where it is also so conducted. There, in the Parliament, the great majority of which is composed of Hawaiians, are three or four American officials and others. The former know nothing of English. The latter are ignorant of Hawaiian. Nevertheless, this fact is no bar to speech-making. The Americans address their little audience of kindred spirits in their own tongue, and the natives do the same. Here, however, they employ an interpreter, Mr. William Ragsdale, Bill Ragsdale, as he is familiarly termed, and to him falls the unenviable lot of translating sentence by sentence the eloquence of each speaker, native or American, in turn. Bill, said Mr. Clemens, may be said really to have made every speech in that Parliament for years back. Naturally, again, the reporter suggested a visit to a sitting of our own council, where, though no interpreter is employed, a somewhat similar scene might be witnessed, and some amusement. But little edification, it must be confessed, might be gained. Possibly the humorist may take the hint and give to the world a chapter on the Montreal Beer Garden, city council we mean. At this point the announcement of dinner brought the interview to a close, and thanking Mr. Clemens for his courtesy, our reporter withdrew. End of interview number 15. Read by John Greenman. This is section 16 of Mark Twain The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 16. An Innocent Interviewed. Mark Twain Pays a Visit to St. Louis. St. Louis Post Dispatch, May 12, 1882, page 2. Read by John Greenman. Samuel L. Clemens, Hartford, Connecticut, registered at the Southern this morning. He did not want a room, and the clerk tossed him off in the usual nonchalant way and paid no attention to him. By and by, a New Yorker dropped in, cast his eye over the register, and said, "'Hello. You've got Mark Twain here, I see.' "'Where?' said both clerks, rushing to the register pell-mell. "'Why, here. Sam Clemens,' said the wise informer, pointing to the name. "'Him?' said Clerk Harvey Willard, with a disdainful smile. "'Is that the funny man? Why, he didn't look half as funny as I do.' It was Mark all the same, and in his usual good humor. He has not been here since 1864, so that most of the people do not know how he looks." Imagine a middle-sized, stout-built man in a common suit of gray, with coat-cut sack-style. A careless, wide-brimmed hat is thrown recklessly over his hair, which is full and long and rather gray. A countenance which shows good living, a pair of gray eyes, and a face entirely smooth, save a rakish gray mustache that gives a slight devil-may-care appearance to the man. He certainly does not look at all funny, as the clerks put it, and, and would be mistaken for a serious, matter-of-fact gentleman who would not waste his time on anecdotes, and would look down upon a joke with lofty contempt. The most curious thing about him is a reckless rolling gait which he probably caught when, as a cub pilot, he swaggered on the upper deck of the Mary Amandaline on the lower Mississippi. The aforesaid gait has stuck to him so persistently that it would make a sensitive man seasick to sit and look at Mark meander across the corridor of even so solid a hotel as the Southern. He also has a remarkable drawling way of speaking, which he most dislikes to see mimicked in print, and which adds quite a charm to his conversation. A post dispatch reporter met him in the rotunda of the hotel and was received very cordially it was only when the possibility of an interview was broached that mr clemens grew slightly restive i guess i haven't got time he said the fact is you can say anything you like if you put it in your own words but don't quote me saying anything no man can get me right unless he takes it down in shorthand very particularly too you don't love the interview i see mr clemens no i don't 
I have never yet met a man who attempted to interview me whose report of the process did not try very hard to make me out an idiot, and did not amply succeed in my mind in making him a thorough one. They try to imitate my manner of speech, and not being artists, they never succeed, you see. No, I want to fight shy of that class of people. The reader can imagine the position of a reporter whose fate was fixed that he should write himself down as an idiot, but Twain was assured that no attempt would be made to exhibit his style of conversation, that the present interviewer's weekly rate of compensation did not warrant him to make such flights, and that he was a plain, cheap man used for doing easy police work meetings of the board of public improvements and elections among the school directors mr clemens melted a little and said i have not been out here since eighteen sixty four i think and i had intended on remaining some time in the city but i waited too long at new orleans to catch the baton rouge the commander of which was my old master and in consequence will have to leave to-night. You ought not to be in such a hurry. The newspapers represent you as being fabulously wealthy and in living in great splendor at Hartford. Oh, there is quite an amount of fiction in that statement. Of course I am living at Hartford, and I had a house when I left there, but I have not gone into competition with Vanderbilt yet, and I don't think that I'll do so. What about the statement that humorous writing is not paying now as it did formerly? That is fictional, too, I think. Is the writing that does not pay really humorous? I'm not talking about myself, but in my opinion, good writing of any kind pays always. How is it in your case? Well, I don't think that any of my books will ever yield quite as well as the Bible and indecent works. I might say other indecent works, but that might get the church people down on me. Don't put that in now. No, but really, is there not a rich harvest in your line? Now, I don't want to make an assignment, and why should I prepare a statement of my assets? I am preparing to try the public again, and my shorthand secretary accompanies me on this trip. What is the nature of the new work? I have been writing a series of articles in the Atlantic Monthly on subjects connected with the Mississippi, and I found that I had got my distances a little mixed. I took this trip for the purpose of making observations on this subject. I was getting a little rusty about it. The new book will treat of your early life on the river? Yes, altogether of that subject. When will it be finished? In about nine months. And what will you call it? Oh, that is the last thing to be thought about. I never write a title until I finish a book, and then I frequently don't know what to call it. I usually write out anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen and a half titles, and the publisher casts his experienced eye over them and guides me largely in the selection. That's what I did in the case of Roughing It, and, in fact, it has always been my practice. "'You have come a little late,' said the reporter, changing the conversation. "'You should have been here in time for the banquet of the Army of the Tennessee. "'I came very near to jumping on the cars at Cairo yesterday and slipping in on that occasion. "'As a general thing, I dislike banquets, if I am down for a speech. "'The sense of responsibility weighs me down, and—' destroys all the enjoyment until I have gotten the confounded speech out of my system. But I really had something that I would like to have said last night, a matter that I am really interested in. "'What was that?' asked the reporter. "'Why can't you say it now? General William Tecumseh Sherman and all the members of the Army of the Tennessee are regular subscribers to the Post-Dispatch. Make your speech to them through its columns.' I wanted to talk to them about Arctic expeditions. I wished to say that, in my humble judgment, we have spent too much money on these trips. 
too many valuable lives have been immolated in this search even if it is finally successful what is the good result of it we could not borrow any money in the north pole and i don't think it would become fashionable as a summer resort now i am full of an expedition of another kind i want the next set of explorers sent in another direction we have got some doubts as to the exact location of hell and i was very desirous to suggest to the assembled warriors last night and through them to the government and the american people that the next expedition go in search of the place i have mentioned if we ever locate that region we can make some practical use of it i had sketched a plan which is shadowy yet but i thought it might grow real and practical under the potent influence of champagne had you any people to suggest as leaders of this trip yes that part could be easily arranged of course i would give my friends all the places of trust for instance i would insist on putting talmage in command of the fleet with full and absolute control over all arrangements he knows as much about the route as anybody i could think of and i assure you i have given the matter some thought the other officers could be easily selected would it be strictly in accordance with the fitness of things if the expedition like those to the arctic regions should get stranded and lost and those who sailed in it should never reach their destination mr clemens smiled broadly and declared that he was not being interviewed and that he really would not answer leading questions then his private secretary and a couple of friends got hold of him he put on his overcoat tucked his umbrella under his arm and started out to do the town he leaves here at four o'clock this afternoon for hannibal the place where he was born where he intends to make a visit from that point he will run up the river to st paul and then back east he says that he never expects to get so far from home again mr j h carter commodore rolling pin an old friend of mr clemens went down the river to meet him last night escorted him to the hotel and looked after his comfort during his stay in the city end of interview number sixteen read by john greenman this is section seventeen of mark twain the complete interviews this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 17. Commodore Rolling Pin. A Day with Mark Twain. May 12, 1882. Rolling Pin's Humorous Illustrated Annual. New York, 1883. Read by John Greenman. The boat that was to convey Mr. S. L. Clemens, Mark Twain, northward, was to leave st louis at four o'clock in the afternoon it was now ten in the morning and he proposed the interval be spent in driving about the city and calling on some old-time acquaintances he had already arranged his toilet and added an extra overcoat to meet the demands of a chilly atmosphere when running his hand over his face he suggested the propriety of visiting a barber shop before entering upon the day's programme during the tonsorial performance we carried on a rambling conversation about this trip south which mark declared had proved a dismal failure resulting in nothing but some social interchanges i expected he went on to travel incognito and return east loaded to the guards with solid information about the late flood and other matters of interest concerning the people of the mississippi river and the valley but i was discovered the first day i arrived here from the east and again when i took passage on the boat for new orleans and undertook to interview the boatmen this confounded speech of mine betrayed me to the enemy and just when the pilot on watch began to scape out in the most beautiful fashion no it's all up i'd have given worlds to have been permitted to pass unrecognized and stand around and 
listen to those matchless lies by the hour but i'm in the hands of providence and i suppose providence does not propose to suffer my morals to be corrupted in that way as we emerged from the barber shop mark became impressed with the idea that he needed a pair of suspenders and we at once sought a furnishing establishment for the purpose of making the necessary purchase when a pair had been selected he divested himself of his three coats and then his own invention and which he said was not yet fully perfected in all the intricate minor details but it soon would be there was an ingredient yet lacking which had been formulated and when supplied would make the suspender come into general use by every sensible man in the civilized and barbarous world that suspender said mark holding it up and viewing it admiringly will yet hand my name down to posterity as a benefactor of my race i'm the first man that ever gave his genius to the creation of a practical article of this kind a garment calculated to fill all the requirements of physical health and aesthetical culture all the rest were idiots i said when i patented my scrapbook which cost me years of hard study and sleepless nights that i would confer another blessing on mankind before i got under my monument and i will those buttonholes you notice have worn out causing the pants to drop down and rest upon the hips this objection is to be overcome by introducing a rubber band which will yield to the pressure resulting from the various motions of the body when the suspender will be ready to go before the country on its merits the shopkeeper suggested that the design was very simple and reminded him of a primitive garment worn by small children and called in nursery parlance a waist the design differs radically said mark warming don't you see here that the shoulder straps are only three inches wide whereas they reach from the shoulder to the base of the neck in the child's dress this is one of the points on which i rest my claim for a patent here mark turned a patronizing look upon the vendor folded the garment placed it in a pocket of one of his layers of overcoats when we left the store by and by we called a carriage and giving the driver his directions settled into our seats during the drive the conversation ran on books authors and literary topics generally i suggested that his last book the prince and the pauper was his best and would outlive any of the others that he had written notwithstanding some of the critics had been rather severe on it as a work of art any minor errors of anachronisms that might have unconsciously slipped into the first edition i urged could readily be eliminated or corrected in a second not a word will i ever change was the prompt response i never undertake a piece of work until i have thoroughly prepared myself for the task and when it issues from the press it is done as well as i can do it and that's the end of the matter we then talked of the innocence abroad and a tramp abroad i maintaining that the latter was equally as good a book as the former though coming after it could never hope to be so popular a much better book said mr clemens twelve years ago i could not have written such a book from the same material the conversation next turned upon humor generally and the fatal mistake men of real ability have often made by permitting themselves to express their thoughts in this vein oliver wendell holmes i urged came near swamping a brilliant career by unconsciously falling into this error and it required years of toil before he could emerge from the unpleasant predicament in which his youthful folly and enthusiasm had placed him and it was not until the appearance of that matchless work the autocrat of the breakfast-table that his true place in literature was acknowledged lowell's biglow papers stamped him as a man of genius and the most original of american humorists 
but fun and satire though wielded by a master hand would never have brought him sufficient standing to have sent him as our minister to the courts of spain or great britain a quarter of a century had to elapse and the interim filled in with solid work and solemn repentance before honors such as these could be aspired to tom corwin one of the most erudite of lawyers whose wit was as brilliant as his scholarship was profound and his patriotism undoubted fell into a similar error and placed forever a barrier against his advancement to the highest position in the gift of the american people when he condescended to instruct and amuse by the employment of the lighter vein and so we might run over the long list of brilliant men who have suffered from a like cause and mark twain cannot hope to be made an exception to general rule he recognizes the inevitable and bows to it with the resignation of the true philosopher with all his vast store of common sense and practical capability he is expected ever to appear in his cap and bells and do the risible such a fame as that which he enjoys it would seem should be sufficient to gratify the ambition of any reasonable person but twain is too sensible a man not to realize that humor of all things is the most ephemeral and that which will convulse the world to-day will appear flat and insipid enough to-morrow a quarter of a century ago Doustick's fame was world-wide and his writing in everybody's mouth and yet who reads Doustick's now to take up one of his books one wonders why anybody ever did read him in all his writing there is not to be found a single piece of word-painting that cries for recognition and a permanent place in the bookstalls. But Mark Twain is a man of real parts, and much that he has done will live. He is endowed with strong common sense, steadiness of purpose, judgment, and an insight into human nature which, if cast in other fields than that which he adopted, would have fitted him for the broader and higher walks of life no one can read him for an hour without being convinced that while he is a humorist of the first order that he is something more there is a breadth and depth of philosophy about his most mirth-provoking pictures which might be profitably employed in directing the practical everyday affairs of life in personal appearance s l clemens is of medium stature standing rather wide on his legs and moving about with a careless swaggering gait his head is large and well formed and may be termed of the massive order of architecture being well poised and having a firm set chin which indicates steadiness of purpose and plenty of staying power the nose is slightly aquiline thin and pointed at the extreme the face is smoothly shaven with the exception of a sandy moustache hair slightly gray he speaks with a drawl and in measured accents his ideas at times seeming to run into confusion when all at once his eyes flash with light when his mind rallies and he carries his point with vigor as an illustration of the peculiar drift which twain's mind takes when dealing with ordinary subjects i may cite an incident that occurred on the morning we first met i had just remarked that the weather was very disagreeable in fact it was wretched to which he replied yes the weather is bad and if i were dealing in weather it is not the brand that i'd put up in cans for future use no it is the kind of weather i'd throw on the market and let it go for what it would fetch and if it wouldn't sell for anything i would hunt up some lifelong enemy and present it to him failing in this as a last resort i should probably take it out on the big bridge dump it into the mississippi and start it to europe via the jetties I'd unload it some way, and that quickly, too. On the trip south, on the steamer Gold Dust, 
Mark went up into the pilot house and entered into conversation with the pilot, for the purpose, as he himself expressed it, of enjoying some good old-fashioned unadulterated Mississippi River lying. The pilot answered all interrogatories with an ease which proved his fertility of resources, while Mark's private stenographer proceeded to take down every word for future use. Questions about the late floods, the changes of the river, and all such matters were put and satisfactorily answered. At length the conversation turned to piloting, when Mark ventured to inquire of the man at the wheel if he knew Sam Clemens, who at one time was reported to be a pilot. "'What? Mark Twain?' said the other. "'Yes, that's what they call him,' was the rejoinder. "'Well, I should say I did. Sam left here about twenty years ago, and has been writing books ever since. He's better at that than he was steering, for he wasn't much of a pilot.' he just as like as not go to sleep on watch and run the boat into the bank head on if you didn't keep a watch on him if thar was a snap in the river he'd go miles out of his way to get a whack at it and was never happy unless he was bouncing something why you'd think he was getting the biggest kind of money from the government to clear the river of snags if you'd seen how he hustled em out of the way do you remember his personal appearance who sam clemens yes i should say so what was it well sir to tell you the truth to look at sam clemens he wasn't worth sweeping up end of interview seventeen read by john greenman this is section eighteen of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain Interview 18. Mark Twain's Travels. St. Louis Globe Democrat, May 13, 1882, page 8. Read by John Greenman. Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, Hartford, Connecticut, accompanied by James R. Osgood, the Boston book publisher, and R. H. Phelps of Hartford, the humorist stenographer, are at the Southern, having arrived in the city yesterday morning from New Orleans on the anchor-line boat Baton Rouge. It was the intention of the party to leave in the afternoon for Hannibal, Missouri, on the steamer Bald Eagle, but not making the arrangements expected, they deferred their departure until this afternoon, when they will take the Green City. From Hannibal they will go to St. Paul, then to Chicago, and by way of the lakes make their way east i go by water said mr clemens to a reporter last evening because i don't like the railroads i wouldn't go to heaven by rail if the chance was offered me the reporter then reminded mr clemens of a chance meeting two years ago at the time of the reception in chicago for general ulysses s grant when that distinguished personage was returning from his trip around the world one of the special features of the elaborate program prepared was a speech by Mark Twain at McVicker's Theatre on the subject, announced beforehand, of babies. The humorist was stopping at the Palmer House, and, in the course of newspaper events, it became necessary to anticipate some portion of what he was to say. A call at the hotel found him still in bed, although late in the morning, with the room properly littered with manuscript. "'I am preparing my address now,' said Mark, cheerily, when the caller's errand was made known, "'and if you'll wait a while, you can take a copy. This is the way, you know, we prepare impromptu speeches.' Mr. Clemens remembered it well and expressed pleasure at the judicious way in which the applause was worked in. I was here three weeks ago, he went on, and passed twenty-four hours in the city without anyone knowing it outside of one or two friends. Stopped a night right here at the Southern, registering as C. L. Samuels, New York. The three of us were prowling under fictitious names, and we remained here just as long as we dared. 
i am writing a new book and a tour of observation down the mississippi was necessary in connection with it to make such a tour incognito seemed best and so we have been dodging people making our way by stealth and keeping up a sort of swindle day by day when will your new book be out probably about new year's i have had a very pleasant trip and have been much interested in examining the spread of the flood and hearing the stories told in connection with it i think it would be a capital thing to send a good man down the river and pick up all the yarns told about it it seemed to me that every time they told some incident they added something to it then there are men with theories that we have listened to for hours and known less when we got through than when we began what do you think of calling your new book it hasn't been thought of yet i was in hopes to get away this afternoon but cannot before tomorrow i've a clean nightshirt at your disposal if all your baggage is at the boat and you want it broke in clerk keith who happened to approach i shall want a nightshirt replied mr clemens and i'll take it end of interview number eighteen read by john greenman this is section nineteen of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview nineteen mr mark twain excited on seeing the name of captain c c duncan in print new york times june tenth eighteen eighty three page one read by john greenman hartford connecticut june ninth with his strawberries and cream before him and his new york times in his hand mark twain sat upon the portico of his handsome home this morning and made merry he had chanced upon an item concerning an old acquaintance captain c c duncan new york's shipping commissioner and the father of the three illustrious young men whose powers of absorbing the funds of the united states government are as far as is now known illuminable well 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 so the old man's in hot water says the author of roughing it and tom sawyer with a mock expression of pity on his face as he pushed aside his strawberries poor devil i should think that after a while he'd conclude to put a little genius into his rascality and try to hoodwink the public as his little game of robbery goes on it don't become a scoundrel to be an ass the combination always makes a mix of things and if duncan will persist in his wicked ways somebody ought to have a guardian appointed for him a guardian with sense enough to throw a little gauze over the work of the gouge he is still shipping commissioner is he and his dear noble boys surround him in his old age supporting his steps lightening his cares and helping him to bankrupt the government let us see what does this item say a bad man named root presuming on his position as a united states district attorney is making war on the magnificent patriot and root don't like the way in which the funds of the shipping commission are dispersed he thinks it isn't just the thing for the gallant duncan after gobbling five thousand dollars for personal salary to give a half dollar or so to an errand boy and then cut the surplus into three equal parts and to each of the scions of the house of duncan give an equal and exact third a hard man to please is this district attorney root he may bless his stars and fervently congratulate the government that captain c c duncan has not created a deficit just to give his sons even money say 
three thousand and fifty dollars instead of three thousand six hundred and forty eight dollars and thirty cents as is the case i see the times says that just about two thousand dollars has been turned over to the government's treasury by captain c c duncan during the ten years he has been shipping commissioner there must be some mistake here if a single penny in any year or by any means has fallen into the treasury a doleful error has occurred old duncan never intended it and i'll wager this new white duck suit i put on this morning that when the old man read the times this morning and saw that a little cash had glided out of his grip he hurried downtown to cook up some job by which he could make the hoggish government hand that cash back again so he and his three sons appropriated to themselves fifteen thousand nine hundred and forty four dollars and ninety cents of the government's funds for the work they profess to have done last year that's monstrous there's no joke in that it's scoundrelly it's nauseating bald barefaced robbery but it's duncan through and through why my boy if i wanted to get rich rapidly the one contract i'd most delight in making would be to hire a hundred and fifty duncan families by the year and get just half of this fifteen thousand nine hundred and forty four dollars and ninety cents which captain c c and his noble offspring take and as i calculate it my profits would be precisely the whole amount the government gave me if i hired them at their true value for a duncan of the c c stripe is worthless absolutely multiply him by a hundred and fifty or a hundred and fifty times a hundred and fifty it will make no difference enough brains could not be found in a c c duncan family to run the kitchen of a sixth ward restaurant respectably brains never were there brains could not be induced to enter there it is the old story of water declining to climb up hill as to the matter of honesty that always was an absent quality with the old man where the honesty ought to have been in his make-up an inscrutable providence provided a vacuum walled in by hypocrisy and the meanest of meanness it has been my honor to know the old man for a number of years longer much longer than has been to my profit perhaps the honor fell to me away back in eighteen sixty seven when i got my text for innocence abroad in his gorgeous scheme of an excursion to the holy land egypt the crimea greece and intermediate points of interest people who have read my tract will remember that i was one of the victims of that excursion and they may remember too how i endeavored to immortalize the fair name of duncan though through reverence to truth i was obliged faithfully to note some things which a narrow-minded world chose to set not down to the glory and honor of the man who left new york harbor a captain and developed within twenty-four hours into the ship's head waiter queer things happened on that excursion i performed but my duty to the world and coming generations when i narrated those happenings in words of soberness and truth but captain c c duncan felt aggrieved for years he kept his galled feelings pent up but finally the time came when somebody advised him to enter the lecture field he was going to explain all about the holy land as he saw it he departed a little from his program and explained all about me as he did not see me i smiled and said nothing for a time and finally only wasted a little ink for a new york newspaper after long and urgent solicitation 
I don't think Captain C. C. Duncan was any happier when I got through with him than he was before I began. I put on parade one or two of his little frauds that had not been seen hitherto. I called attention to his advertisements that on his big excursion Henry Ward Beecher, General Sherman, Maggie Mitchell, and other celebrities were to be among the passengers. How none of them appeared, how none of them, I guess, ever had any thought of making the trip. I showed up a few other of his thinly disguised frauds and exposed him pretty thoroughly as an old piece of animated flatulence. To excoriate the old rascal began to give me fun. I didn't lack for ammunition. What I did not have in stock came to hand readily. I discovered that the world was fairly jammed with folks who had dealt with C.C. and sadly regretted it. A reputable New York law firm supplied me with a big batch of indictments against the humbug mariner. The papers and documents they gave to support their charges were absolutely convincing. There was a long list of offenses. For instance, it was shown that on December 18, 1867, Duncan filed a petition in bankruptcy, submitting his schedule of liabilities amounting to $166,000, and that among these debts, as sworn by himself, was one of $5,265.28 to J. G. Richardson of Liverpool, England. This was the proceeds of a consignment of canvas sold by him on account of Richardson and retained by him. He was also obliged to show an item of $634.42 for money collected by Duncan for Hall, Cornish & Company, and not paid over to them. Of course, this was rank dishonesty. There were other equally questionable items in the schedule, but this was not all. But, bah, it disgusts me to recite this fellow's manifold offenses. A half dozen years ago I read a paragraph in the New York Times chronicling some of Duncan's wickedness, and what I wrote in response for publication then I reiterate now. I have known and observed Duncan for years and I think I have reason for believing him wholly without principle, without moral sense, without honor of any kind. I think I am justified in believing that he is cruel enough and heartless enough to rob any sailor or sailor's widow or orphan he can get his clutches upon, and I know him to be coward enough. I know him to be a canting hypocrite, filled to the chin with sham godliness and forever oozing and dripping false piety and veracical prayers. I know his word to be worthless. It is a shame and a disgrace to the civil service that such a man was permitted to work himself into an office of trust and responsibility. And I repeat today what I said then that the act creating the shipping commission, concocted by himself for his own profit, was simply and purely an act to create a pirate, a pirate that has flourished and still flourishes. I tell you, my boy, Judas Iscariot rises into respectability, and the star-root rogues are paragons compared with this same canting c c duncan shipping commissioner and mark twain resumed his strawberries end of interview nineteen read by john greenman this is section twenty of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview twenty Mark Twain and the Police. Boston Herald, November 16, 1884, page 16. Read by John Greenman. Now that Mark Twain is fairly out of the city, 
it may be safe to tell about his experience with the captain of one of the police stations contrary to the usual rule his experience as narrated with the poor demented would-be suicide a few days ago was an actual occurrence and resulted in his gaining an acquaintance with the workings of the boston police force which may be of use to him in the future after he had followed the somewhat eccentric movements of the poor crazy woman the whole length of the water side of beacon street up to charles street his associate in the deed of humanity which saved the life of the woman met him accompanied by a police officer both brave gentlemen supposed that their duty ended with turning the woman over to the care of the public guardian and were surprised to be informed that they must accompany the woman and the officer to the police station and give their evidence as to the attempted suicide etc having given so much time and taken so much trouble in the cause of humanity they naturally demurred at this additional demand but finally acceded to the officer's request their reception at the station house and their experience there are best told in mark twain's own words when we arrived we found the captain entirely at his ease his feet were on his desk and our appearance really seemed a sort of intrusion upon his comfortable leisure the statement made by the officer that the woman had tried to commit suicide appeared to be a matter of hardly passing interest to him he seemed absorbed in reading a book and interrupted himself only to ask the stereotyped questions as to her age birthplace condition married or single etc seeming to pay no attention to the fact that she was evidently insane and incapable of giving any intelligent replies as for my friend and myself he appeared oblivious of our existence and we began to feel that we had really committed some criminal act in our efforts to save the woman she was utterly exhausted but when the door opened and a man was brought in charged with theft or some such crime the captain waved the woman aside as if at last he had found something of interest i finally suggested that we might be more comfortable sitting down inside the rail and the idea seemed to meet with his approval having taken our testimony in the matter a consultation was had between the officer and the captain as to the disposition of the woman which ended in the former being instructed to take her to the tombs this frightened me i couldn't see that our efforts had been so very commendable after all if the woman was to be buried anyway dead or alive i began to think how we could best save the woman again when the official kindly explained that the tombs was a sort of central office where physicians were in attendance who would decide upon the disposition of the case i don't want to save any more women from drowning in boston end of interview twenty read by john greenman this is section twenty one of mark twain the complete interviews this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 21. Mark Twain as Lecturer. New York World. November 20, 1884. Page 5. Read by John Greenman. New York, November 20th. Mark Twain, in dress suit, received the correspondent of the world yesterday in a waiting room at Chickering Hall. Mr. George W. Cable was giving his recital of Creole life ah you are cruel he said with an air of utter sadness to attempt to interview a man just at the moment when he needs to feel good you've got to feel good you know in order to make the audience feel the same way but 
to try to be funny after you've been interviewed the thought seemed to overpower him i did not know it was such a physical strain to deliver a humorous lecture ah you have never attempted it you don't know on a day like this when we give two performances i feel like i'm all burnt out after the first performance as soon as i get back to the hotel i go to bed i must get some sleep somehow if i don't i will not be able to go through with the evening performance the way i want to it's the same thing when you're traveling the audiences intelligent newspaper reading audiences are responsive enough they quickly catch the point you are trying to make oftentimes they anticipate it then you are put on your mettle to give a sudden turn to the story so as to bring out a new and unexpected point if these things don't happen don't blame the audience it is yourself who is at fault the traveling has exhausted you and as i said before you're not feeling good all this you can judge of by the effect you produce on the audience oh yes if you hear a rustle here or there or see a particularly stolid face you can tell that there is something wrong with yourself the effect of course is not general heaven forbid you would then have to stop right off audiences have their peculiarities you know it is a great inspiration to find a particular individual fairly respond to you as if you were in telegraphic communication with him you are tempted to address yourself solely to him i've tried that experiment sometimes it is dangerous laughter is very infectious and when you see a man give one great big guffaw you begin to laugh with him in spite of yourself now it would not do for the lecturer to laugh his is a grave and serious business however it might strike the audience his demeanor should be grave and serious he should not ever smile you have had ample opportunity to average your audiences on their respective faculties for fun audiences are much the same everywhere i have been delighted with all before whom i have had the honor of appearing in boston where mr cable and i appeared before coming here the audiences were delighted with our efforts to please them you should have witnessed the enthusiasm last evening oh i have nothing to complain of my audiences perhaps they cannot say the same of me our entertainment lasts one hour and three quarters the fact that mr cable and i alternate makes us able to extend it to that length were i lecturing alone one hour and five minutes is as much as i would dare impose on the audience the strain on them in the humorous direction would be too much but now mr cable gently soothes them then i excite them to laughter or try to at least then mr cable has his turn and so the change is very healthful and beneficial your tour will be an extended one our agent has booked us to the end of january i should like to go to california if i can manage it you know this is my farewell performance i so intimated to the audience last evening i told them that i had not practically appeared on the platform for nine years and that when this term was over i would not appear again at least not for nine years it will do me good it will do my hearers good yet i've known people to give farewell performances for fifty years in succession a burst of applause at this juncture announced the conclusion of mr cable's recital and that the time had come for mark twain to appear on the stage as the reporter passed out he heard an outburst of laughter the humorist had made a point end of interview twenty one read by john greenman
This is section 22 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain and the President, Philadelphia Press, November 27, 1884, page 3, read by John Greenman. I have just been to Washington, said Mark Twain last evening in Association Hall, previous to his going on the stage, to a press reporter. I read before the President, the first President I ever read before. Were you much impressed by him? asked the visitor. I? Him? drawled the humorist, rumpling up his shaggy hair. Why, he must have been impressed with me. He ought to have been. It was the first time he ever heard me read. The readings of Mr. Clemens and George W. Cable were very successful in the afternoon and evening yesterday. Association Hall was filled in the evening, and the awkward, hesitating humor of Mark Twain received equal honor with the pathetic, realistic, and linguistic rendition of selections from Dr. Sevier and the Grandissime. The best thing done by Mr. Cable was Mary's Night Ride from Dr. Sevier into which considerable dramatic power was thrown. But the audience seemed most pleased with the Creole songs, which were very sweetly rendered. After his last number, Mr. Cable was called back and sang a song that he had never given before, as he waited to see a lady in Philadelphia, a sister of Gottschalk, by whom he could verify the words. It represented a mother calling upon her child, Salangadon, and being answered by the wind. The effect of the wind music was perfect, and the song itself was very sweet. Mark Twain, round-shouldered and stooping, slouched onto the stage, and, trying to balance himself on one foot, convulsed the audience with an account of a desperate encounter that he once had with an interviewer, which ended with the reporter going away threatened with mental collapse because of the utter stupidity with which he found Twain afflicted. Twain said he had never had one before, and did not know what to do with him, for he understood he had a faculty of making a man say just what he did not want to have it divulged, and, as he had committed some crime, he had forgotten just what, he wanted to have nothing to do with him. After the lecture, a reporter, remembering this recitation, advanced into the dressing-room with considerable trepidation, and admitted to Mr. Clemens that he felt some nervousness. "'Oh, now, you are making fun of me,' said Twain. "'But that was true. That is just the way it is. I never told the plain, unadorned truth in my life, but that all my friends knew I was lying.' I have backed it up with affidavits, but they believed it still less, and then I never told the most bare-faced lie, but what everybody swallowed it whole for gospel truth. I am always misunderstood. End of interview number 22, read by John Greenman. This is section 23 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 23. Mark Twain's Ideas. A Talk with the Humorist. Baltimore American, November 29, 1884, page 4. Read by John Greenman. Yes, we have stood the test very well, said Mark Twain last night as he sat behind the scenes in the Academy of Music concert hall, waiting for the great crowd that had come to hear him read get seated. To be sure, whenever we would arrive in a town, there would be processions and torchlight parades, whether on our account or not I can't say, but they would be there. Yet the political excitement has not hurt us in regard to audiences, we were in places, too, where there was much excitement, and even after the thing was settled, 
the people did not seem to know what to do with their old campaign trumpery and would get up parades for picnics and socials just to use it but the crowd would come to us nevertheless mr twain speaks in a slow deliberate manner almost with a drawl he never seems hurried or excited but quietly talks as if he was finding the word to be used in his mental dictionary continuing he said it has been seventeen years since i last appeared on the platform in this city it was in a long hall i can fully remember it for i see the people sitting far down in front of me i have been here since once i felt tired and like i wanted to rest i came here i got it i stopped at a hotel i have forgotten the name but i stayed in my room all the time and in bed there tucked under the covers i had terrapin oysters canvas back ducks and lived no one saw me no one knew i was here except george alfred townsend he was roaming about here and i fell upon him no uh, he stumbled upon me for he found me in bed resting yes resting i don't like traveling i would mind if i could take my family with me but there are those blessed darlings the children and what a trouble children are when they travel and the average american child when he travels generally makes himself known therefore this is my last appearance on the platform the american representative smiled as he thought of the numerous stars now making their farewell tours and the smile faded away to almost tears as he thought mark twain was to be added to this list mr clemens noticed the look and quickly well as quickly as mr twain ever allows his voice to be accelerated said yes i mean it i was forty-nine years of age yesterday and if i remain off the platform seventeen years put that to forty-nine and by that time nobody will want to hear me i love the platform and i would like to live on it but i cannot be traveling about all the time there is my family at home doing the lonesome if i could settle down in new york they could come in and stay there while i talked why look how long a play runs in new york i don't want such a big hall i could talk in a small one and i am sure there would be one man in it to hear me why have i got mr cable with me well i don't feel like taking the responsibility of giving the entire show i want someone to help me it is a great burden this awful thought that you alone have to carry everything then i want company mr cable is company good company we need not talk all the time you can be company with each other and not say a word sweethearts sometimes sit together a long time and don't say a word yet they are company for each other yes the platform has a great fascination in regard to the way the audiences take the jokes they say english people are slow to perceive a joke but you get a large audience before you why they catch on to the joke before you have half told it yet you talk to four or five englishmen and tell them a funny story when you get through they'll never smile but next day they'll laugh fact what is the difference between the crowd and the select party oh i think it is a sort of sympathy with the crowd one laughs the others laugh with him not with the fear they have to digest the fun 
i was sitting one night in the savage club in london with tom hood editor of fun and one or two others i told them a funny story and not one laughed next day i met hood in the club and he came up to me and said twain tell that funny story you told last night to my friends here i told it hood laughed loud and long the other men near smiled will you believe it i told hood that story five times and each time he laughed heartier than the preceding time and the last time i thought he would die yet those who heard it for the first time never smiled they wanted it to soak in how will f c bernard the editor of punch do here on his lecture tour if i put on a bright flaming red scarf and went out on the platform everybody would look at that scarf they would have their thoughts distracted by it they would forget to look at it mr bernard speaks very broad english how they can call it good solid english i can't understand i once heard him give a reading when he described a yachting party giving imitation of the ladies and their efforts to eat off the swinging table it was very funny and i enjoyed it but his pronunciation was so pronounced to me that i noticed it all the time when tool came over here he asked me about it i told him plainly that i did not think his broad english pronunciation would suit the american people if he would do the red scarf act and come before the people i do not think he would succeed we shall see in regard to mr bernard one day i was talking to george augustus sala in london in fact he was having a heated discussion in regard to americans with a friend i spoke up and defended my countrymen he quoted as examples the words cow and now as spoken in one part of the united states with a broad sound i told him that that pronunciation was only common in one part of our country and that because it was originally settled by englishmen what they are pleased to call americanisms originally came from england and it is unjust to us to lay all the vulgar coarse things at our door to prove to mr sala that i was right i said now i'll call your attention in a few minutes to yourself for you will use the very pronunciation of the words cow and now exactly as he had said the americans used the word mr cable who reads with mr twain had been exploring the wings and when it was time for mr twain to go on mr cable remarked look out for the wall as you go in and don't brush against it or you'll get whitewash all over you they will have to look out for their whitewash replied mr twain in his droll manner i will take care of myself while mark twain and cable were entertaining the american representative behind the scenes the concert hall was rapidly filling up and when mr cable appeared to read his first selection one from dr sevier narcisse and john and mary richling the house was crowded every seat being occupied messrs twain and cable read alternately the latter starting off he was warmly received and throughout the evening his selections were received with close attention and applause he read largely from dr sevier the best selection being mary's night ride which showed his descriptive powers to the best advantage he also sang a number of creole songs excellently mr twain however seemed to be the star his appearance was the signal for loud applause and the people laughed at everything he said mr twain was funny last night his adventures of huckleberry finn from his latest work was his first reading it was a happy selection and made him at home at once with the audience to those who had read his 
tramp abroad the tragic tale of the fishwife and a trying situation taken from it hardly recognized them for mr twain told them in his inimitable manner and gave almost a new reading to them he was in the midst of a trying situation when there was a rustle in the gallery it grew louder and louder until the sounds of hustling feet and women's dresses were heard coming down the stairway mr twain stopped and taking out his watch said time to catch a train i expect just then the form of the principal of a female college near the city appeared at the south doorway and led the troop of thirty or forty girls across the hall right in front of the stage the aisle divides the audience equally and the people applauded terrifically mr twain looked bored he was bored and as the form of the female assistant disappeared mr twain resumed you can't always tell the customs of the country in boston once it was customary for the people to catch the train at nine o five o'clock one night i was reading there and at that hour everybody in the hall got up and left i did not know of this to-night how can one tell of these things he finished the story he was very successful with his short story which closed the program and its rendition so wrought up a lady in the audience that when the denouement came she shouted oh mr twain and mr cable read at the matinee to-day and to-night they give their farewell and retire for good so mr twain says there will be a change of bill end of interview twenty three read by john greenman this is section twenty four of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview twenty four mark twain encountered rochester herald december eighth eighteen eighty four page eight read by john greenman armed for desperate encounter a herald reporter knocked boldly at room two twenty two powers hotel yesterday afternoon come in was the response given in a drawling half-asleep sort of a way and the reporter knew he had found mark twain naturally enough the visitor entering unannounced felt somewhat abashed to find that the humorist had not yet arisen it was four o'clock in the afternoon mr clemens however didn't seem to mind the intrusion much and put the reporter at his ease by a cordial greeting explaining at the same time that on sunday very often he didn't get up until monday the room was in an alarming state of disorder articles of clothing books letters and various other things were scattered about in the most promiscuous fashion the humorist's capacious valise which lay open upon a center table looked as though it had been struck by a cyclone mr clemens in an embroidered robe de nuit lay on the bed his head propped up with two pillows and a bolster he was vigorously pulling smoke from a well-burnt cob pipe and had been writing his knees serving for a desk thanks to the existence of two or three mutual acquaintances in another city the reporter was able to worry along very comfortably without saying a word about newspapers or interviews how did it happen mr clemens inquired the reporter that mr cable and yourself combined forces for the season well it makes a pleasant combination so far as we are concerned was the reply each of us needed company also somebody to do half the work i don't mind work much myself indeed i'd just as soon stand on a platform two hours as anywhere else but i prefer to have somebody to share the responsibility of entertaining an audience one of us counteracts the other you know a counter irritant often produces good results a knock was heard at the door and the chambermaid called out how soon will you have your room put in order sir oh never mind 
replied Mr. Clemens. That's all right. Tomorrow morning will be soon enough. I don't feel energetic enough, addressing the reporter, to get up and move about. The remains of a villainous cold are hanging about me. Every night for the last two weeks I've had to torture my throat with cayenne pepper tea and all sorts of villainous mixtures to be able to use my voice at all. If I can get over this cold entirely, I think this campaign will improve my health wonderfully. In fact, in the month we have been out, I have gained an appetite, a thing I hadn't known anything about for ten years. Now I eat three meals a day with a fair degree of success. Heretofore I have taken but two meals a day, breakfast at nine, dinner at six, and nothing between times. Even at that rate I was rarely able to attack dinner with any show of enthusiasm. Thus reminded of the wants of the inner man, Mr. Clemens called a bellboy and sent down an order for a dinner, delegating to the waiter authority to select the dishes. Mr. Clemens took occasion to express himself as highly pleased with what he had seen of Rochester, and then branched off into an interesting disquisition upon the prevailing styles of architecture in residences. "'By the way,' inquired the reporter, who recalled the appearance of Mr. Clemens' odd but beautiful home in Hartford, "'what is the style of your house? What would you call it if you had to name it?' "'Well, I don't know.' answered the humorist, have never invented a name. There are nineteen different styles in it, and folks can take their pick. It wouldn't do to call it mongrel, for that would be offensive to some. I guess we'll call it eclectic. The word describes everything that can't be otherwise described. At this point the waiter entered with a heavily laden tray and the reporter started to make his escape. "'Oh, by the way, hold on a minute,' exclaimed Mr. Clemens, rising in his bed. "'Speaking of architecture reminds me, by contrast, of a thing across the street here. Cable and I have been studying it with a good deal of curiosity, but neither of us can get at any satisfactory conclusion. What is it?' Here the humorist got out of bed and ambled across the room to a window which was raised slightly from the bottom. A gentle breeze was blowing in at the time, and his long nightshirt flapped about his bare legs. "'There it is!' he exclaimed. "'Look there! Am I suffering from some nightmare, or is it a reality?' "'That, sir,' replied the reporter, looking in the direction indicated, is the Cogswell Fountain, a gift to the city of Rochester from the famous San Francisco philanthropist, uh, Dr. Cogswell? Oh, yes. Is it possible? It's all clear now. That's a Cogswell Fountain. The same philanthropist tried to work one off on Hartford, but we wouldn't have it, and the city of Rochester allowed him to leave one here. That's the best joke I ever heard. What's it made of? It looks like putty. The material, I believe, is monumental bronze. It isn't half so monumental, said Mr. Clemens dryly, as the brass of the donor. I don't feel like interfering in a matter of this kind, purely local, you know, but I would like to advise the citizens to turn out and mob the statue to get even. The man looks as if he'd been nine days drowned. It has a putrid, decomposed sort of a look that is offensive for a delicate organism. The only redeeming feature about the doctor, if that is true to life, is his legs. Very fair legs, those. I would cut that statue off just below the coat skirts and throw the top part into the canal where the water is deepest and the mud in the bottom softest. But you must remember, Mr. Clemens, interrupted the reporter, that 
man and the faithful dog may here find refreshing and get ice water at that yes and you must remember that dr cogswell furnishes neither the water nor the ice at this point in the very interesting conversation the waiter who stood by ventured to suggest that the dinner was getting cold and the reporter withdrew end of interview number twenty four read by john greenman this is section twenty five of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview twenty five the genial mark an interview toronto globe december ninth eighteen eighty four page two read by john greenman after the performance the globe reporter through the courtesy of mr pond the manager of the party had an opportunity of speaking with the entertainers of the evening samuel l clemens is a quiet pleasant spoken man but not funny in the ordinary sense of the word he said it was quite true that he had been elected a member of the montreal snowshoe club and that he had been specifically invited to attend the carnival but feared that his lecture engagements would prevent his accepting the invitation how do you reconcile this tour with your vow of which you have written that you would never go on the lecture platform unless driven there by want of bread was asked well i'd kept that vow so long fifteen years or so that i thought it time to break it and make a better one end of interview twenty five read by john greenman this is section twenty six of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview twenty six the funny man in bed detroit post december seventeenth eighteen eighty four page four read by john greenman is the american taste for humor still growing in your opinion yes i think so humor is always popular and especially so with americans it is born in every american and he can't help liking it is it true that the american style of humor is becoming very popular in england yes the liking for american humor over there has become immense it awakens the people to a new life and is supplanting the dry wit which formerly passed for humor american humor wins its own way and does not need to be cultivated the english come to like it naturally end of interview twenty six read by john greenman this is section twenty seven of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview twenty seven mark twain gets shaved pittsburgh penny press december twenty ninth eighteen eighty four page four read by john greenman mark twain's appearance as he underwent the operation of shaving in his private apartment at the monongahela house this morning when a press reporter was ushered in was strongly suggestive of dickens famous character cousin phoenix in doombay and son and also reminded the scribe of a badly executed figure on a political transparency without enough light behind it time seems to have dealt pretty heavily with mark of late years for his hair and moustache are gray everybody who has seen him on the platform is familiar with the intense air of being completely hopelessly and inexpressibly bored which pervades the whole man and has doubtless thought that it was assumed but it is only necessary to meet him in private life to know that the man is really and truly tired of everything his manner of drawling his words is even more pronounced and noticeable in private than in public his walk his look his way of sitting 
or rather lying in fact his every motion is expressive of one word boredom how long since you were in pittsburgh before mr twain asked the scribe about fifty years was the answer in a deep sepulchre voice that seemed to proceed from the soles of the funny man's boots and how do you like it as well as i did then again came the sepulchre reply at this point a bell-boy entered bearing an autograph album friend what have you there asked mark dis uh, an aristocrat book what massa kelly done sent up to get you to write in do you and he expect me to write without a pen drawled the humorist i done forgot the pen i'll go and tote one up i've got one i only spoke of the pen to see if you were true and loyal now let me see where shall i write in this thing i can't find a blank page and it takes a whole page for me oh here's an outlaw like myself and turning the book towards the scribe the latter read bob ford the slayer of jesse james bob and i are both outlaws and murderers twain continued he killed jesse james and i am constantly murdering the north american english so bob shall be my vis-a-vis -vis. and down went the name of mark twain opposite that of bob ford the conversation turned upon magazine literature the literary productions which fill the pages of the magazines nowadays remarked twain are greatly superior to those of former years we haven't got any autocrat of the breakfast table to be run out we don't want an autocrat oftener than once in one hundred years of course a generation or two ago the magazines had longfellow whittier lowell and some more of those fellows who made literature for one or two generations but take them out and i think the magazine writing of today much better than it was in their time how do you like the idea of reading in a church asked the pressman referring to the fact that twain and cable are to appear in the cumberland presbyterian church tonight i don't mind it but i have always found going to church so conducive to slumber that i am afraid i may go to sleep perhaps by the time i have done so the audience also realizing the fact that they are in church will be asleep also and if cable doesn't disturb us we may spend a very pleasant evening together can you be funny in church i guess so for i shall feel very funny there at this juncture mr george w cable entered the room here is my partner in crime why don't you bore him now and poor twain with the air of a man to whom death would be a boon as a relief from boredom heaved a deep sigh and looked so darkly and intently at the razor with which the barber had been scraping him that the knight of the lead pencil lost no time in transferring his attention to mr cable and asked that gentleman what first led him to turn his attention to literature. End of Interview 27 Read by John Greenman This is Section 28 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 28 Talk with Twain Pittsburgh Chronicle December twenty ninth, eighteen eighty four, page one, read by John Greenman. Mark Twain is in town. He did not come here to inspect our manufactories, nor on a pleasure trip. He is to lecture with Cable, the novelist, tonight at the Cumberland Church on Sixth Avenue. He was sitting in an easy chair in his room, having his hair cut, when the writer called on him today. 
"'Take off your overcoat and sit down,' said he with the air of a man who, in his time, has overcome many impediments to happiness by courtesy and perseverance. "'Thank you. But I have not time. I merely called to have a five minutes' talk about Cosmos.' "'Oh, indeed,' he reported gravely. "'Well, I am sorry I cannot oblige you, but that is a subject I never speak of except at home after a week's preparation. I always treat light subjects in that way. However, sit down and let us talk. You would not care for a discourse on American art, would you, in place of Cosmos?' "'No, not just at this time.' "'Well, I thought you might. I don't know anything about the subject, but, of course, that would enable me to be more graphic and entertaining. I met a drummer on a train a short time ago who asked me for my opinion on that matter. I knew he was a humbug in asking it, but I was also a humbug, for I proceeded to tell him what I did not know, but what I pretended to know. Suppose you tell me something of what you think about recent American magazine literature. I have not an opinion which would be worth having on that subject. It seems to me, however, that there has been a wonderful advance of late years in the general tone of the magazines. There has been no new autocrat of the breakfast table, to be sure, but what do you expect? You do not want more than one autocrat in a century. You cannot hope for more than one. Such men as Holmes, Hawthorne, Longfellow, Fields, and others of that school upheld the literary reputation of two generations and made the Atlantic so brilliant. Most of these men have gone, but the general work in magazines is far superior to that of ten years ago. The trouble is that the two or three magazines which are a good market for a writer, and which can aid him in his work for fame, are overcrowded. The century has perhaps one hundred thousand dollars worth of accepted articles in its vault, which may not appear for years. They are pushed aside by articles on timely topics which cannot be delayed. There are other magazines, it is true, but when you send them an article, you send a burial permit with it, for you know that it will be entombed, even if it is printed. These combinations of newspapers which print stories and sketches once a week will, it seems to me, give rising and capable writers the field they desire, as well as the market. Charles Dudley Warner told me one of these syndicates, which is in charge of Thorndike Rice of the North American Review. He has fifteen of the leading papers of the country, which pay liberally for a page of matter, either for their Sunday issues or for another day they may select. The idea is, I believe, to give at least one sketch or story by some very well-known writer in each issue, and give other articles on the same page by clever people not so well known. This will bring into Mr. Rice's hands about $10,000 a month to pay his corps of writers. He can pay them just as good, if not better prices, than any of the magazines, and besides, he can handle matters of passing interest before the magazines get at them. Mr. Rice has written to me and has offered me handsome terms for articles. He seems to think I am a magazine writer, but I really am not. He has asked Mr. Henry Irving to write for him also. Has he? Well, the idea is to have at his command the men who are eminent in all the branches of art, literature, drama, the sciences, and 
professions. There are good writers of short stories now, and there have never been very many. Such men as Edgar Allan Poe and Aldrich stand out so that you can at once recall them. I do not believe in the decrying of the books of the day, which is so common. I admit I am not a careful reader of novels. I read portions of them, but do not read them through with the care some of them deserve. Much of my opinion is based upon what I hear from men and women of sound judgment, whom I know intimately, and whom I can rely upon. Take Hawthorne as an example of my peculiar literary bent of thought. It has become quite the custom to speak of him as the greatest of all American romanticists. I read him now and then for his style, the exquisite manner in which he writes, but I do not care for his stories, for I do not think that they are as great as many others by American writers. Howell's newspaper man, who is brought before the public a second time in Silence Lapham, he is a wonderful creation, a photograph of many such men who do exist, not a cheerful, nice sort of man to sit at a communion table, perhaps, but still a strong living man. I was in Europe when Henry James Daisy Miller reached there. I chanced to be where there were a great many American ladies, and I must confess I never heard a literary production so roundly denounced as was Daisy Miller. It was called an absurd exaggeration, a gross libel on the American girl, and all sorts of things. Nothing was too bad to say of it, and yet, within a few hours, I heard these same ladies allude to young American girls who just fitted into the description of that irrepressible young lady. The work has been caviled at and found fault with, but it is true and just and close to the truth in spite of all that. The blemishes complained of in recent American books are to be found just as readily in English works or those of other countries. The trouble with many authors of books, as well as of plays, is that they let their work run too long. The interest dies before the story ends. That is the only fault to be found, for instance, with such an admirable book as Lorna Doon. I read two-thirds of it with keen relish and interest, and then stopped. I felt that there was a disposition to, using a New England phrase, run emptyings at the close. I have reread the first of the book many times, but never have gone through it, yet I suppose this book now has as many people who read it over again annually as Jane Eyre, which in many households finds a place between a Bible and the prayer book. The fault perhaps lies in my own taste, which has a strong bent to history and biography. Mr. Cable made his appearance there for the third or fourth time, and Mr. Clemens, who by this time had come from the barber's hands, a very proper man indeed, wished his visitor a good morning. End of Interview 28 Read by John Greenman This is section 29 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 29. Mark Twain, Pittsburgh Post, December 29, 1884, page 4. Samuel L. Clemens, better known to the sphere of humorous literature as Mark Twain, arrived in this city last evening. He had come from Philadelphia and was immediately driven to the Monongahela house, where the other half of the combination, 
George W. Cable, was already ensconced. A representative of the Post was shown to Mr. Clemens' apartment, and found the noted humorist preparing to retire. Mr. Clemens can hardly be described with his head of roughened, curling hair, just tinged with gray, his vigorous nose, his sardonic mustache and cleft chin, but the humor peeps out of his features, nevertheless. When the reporter introduced himself, Mr. Clemens started the conversation by saying, "'Ever since I knew anything, I have had a horror of interviewers. The principal reason of that is that reporters have a way of getting at facts that a man does not want to be known. Now, one of these men came to me twice after I had, well, committed a crime. What the crime was has entirely escaped my memory. I have been guilty of so many that I can't keep track of any particular one. I made no note of it, but all the same I did not want to see this interviewer. I wrestled with the problem a long time, and finally offset him with a series of falsehoods that would have knocked any man off his pins. Have you met with success this season? We have. You see, there are so many people anxious to hear Mr. Cable's readings that I failed to scare them all away. The result is we have had large audiences. How long has it been since you left the platform? inquired the reporter. His left hand sought the old familiar pantaloons pocket and stayed there, while he leaned with his other arm on the mantel, and proceeded in his slow, nasal drawl. It is eight or nine years since I bade good-bye to the lecture platform forever, he said. But they say lecturers and burglars never reform. I don't know how it is with burglars. It is so long since I had intimate relations with those people. But it is quite true of lecturers. They never reform. Lecturers and readers say they are going to leave the lecture platform never to return. They mean it. They mean it. But there comes, in time, an overpowering temptation to come out on the platform and give truth and morality one more lift. You can't resist it. As he closed this remark, he looked longingly toward a gorgeous nightshirt that was hanging over the footboard of the bedstead, at the same time saying he had had a very tiresome ride. It would have been cruel not to have noticed these evident signs of distress, and the reporter retired. End of Interview 29 Read by John Greenman This is Section 30 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 30 The Humorists Interviewed Cincinnati Enquirer, January 3, 1885, page 4 Read by John Greenman The lecturers, Mark Twain and George W. Cable, with their managers, Messrs. J. H. and Ozias W. Pond, were seated at a table in the St. Nicholas dining-room at eleven o'clock last evening, when an inquirer reporter was ushered in. Mr. Cable was getting away with some chocolate ice-cream, and Mr. Clemens had before him a half-emptied bottle of Bass Pale Ale. "'Glad to see you, inquirer,' he said, as he extended a hand and introduced the caller to his associates. "'Thought you might be able to say something interesting. "'You have been both interviewed probably on every conceivable subject, "'so if you will just rattle away and talk about anything, it will answer. "'You know how it is yourself. "'You should not expect a fellow to be very interesting "'after two hours on the platform,' said Mr. Clemens. "'You are not expected to say much. "'Do you give a fellow a fair show?' always. What I mean by that is, when a man talks to you, do you, in publishing it, 
eliminate all that he has said that is stupid and retain all that is bright well that is a question of judgment generally the guying reporter of the paper thought it would be better to interview you without seeing you how did you used to work it well it's a pretty good scheme if you know your man pretty well you can size him up about right now i think if you had sat down at the inquirer office you could have written a nicer talk than you can have with me you in writing have time to collect your thoughts and take your choice of words this especially applies to interviews with statesmen a reporter cognizant with public affairs and the records of men ought to be able to interview without seeing him nearly any day and report his ideas correctly using better language than the man himself would have chosen and making a more entertaining article than if he had really seen him i used to make reports of speeches in longhand that i could not begin to get the bulk of i would take the merest skeleton jot down a word here and there and then fill it out at the office using the speaker's ideas and my own language it made me feel good when they complimented me and said it was better than the original you were what we call a common reporter at one time then oh yes in eighteen sixty two and sixty three i was on the virginia city enterprise and in eighteen sixty four and sixty five on the san francisco call besides many other minor journals in my earlier days were you ever associated with bret hart not in business we were neighbors once in san francisco hart was secretary of the mint his office was in the same building with the call i often met him there and we became well acquainted he was editing the weekly californian a literary paper at the same time what is hart's best work or at least has brought him the most fame the luck of roaring camp and the heathen chinee the heathen chinee nearly ruined him in his own estimation he was ambitious to shine as a prose writer and when he found that the heathen chinee had caught on and was in everybody's mouth he was disgusted he did not relish being known as a writer of funny doggerel it did not do him any real harm though some like tennessee's partner but i don't hart could not write dialect i differ from you said mr cable i thought the speech of tennessee was a grand thing it was all there the sentiment is superb there you go again on an argument returned mark twain but i tell you when hart tried to write frontier dialect it was idiocy do you mean to tell me there was any literary merit in an effort that contained five or six kinds of dialect why he could have taken it to any minor and had it remedied but he did not mr cable responded by grasping an empty ale bottle and threatening to break it over his companion's head what do you consider your best work continued the reporter addressing mr clemens i play no favorites i am like the woman with her offspring i think a sirloin steak is his best work you would have thought so had you seen him this morning said j b pond no puns cried clemens as he also grabbed his bottle and made a gesture toward his manager turning to his inquisitor again he remarked innocence abroad paid in the greatest royalty what about the report that you was for uh, grover cleveland young man i am lecturing who got up that story about yourself and bret hart removing a newspaper outfit from one town to another long ago being attacked by indians and firing your articles at them that was a clever story it originated in the carson appeal it said we ran out of ammunition and began to throw in 
matter already in type. A half-column leader of mine scattered the Indians, and one of Hart's poems knocked them silly. Don't you know those anecdotes of yours about running an agricultural paper in the South and getting mixed up are still talked of a great deal? Yes, and I would sometime like to read them, but the trouble is they have in some places regular agricultural quotations, and would not do on that account. Mr. Twain looked at his bottle. It was empty. He then gazed sorrowfully upon it for a moment, held out his hand, and said, "'Excuse me. I must go to bed.' And he ambled away toward the stairway, in a slipshod, bent-up sort of manner. End of Interview 30 Read by John Greenman This is section 31 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 31. A Great Humorist. Louisville Post, January 5, 1885, page 1. Mrs. Mark Twain and George W. Cable arrived in the city at 12.30 and registered at the Galt House, Mr. Twain leaving strict orders with the clerk for no one to be shown to their rooms. A post reporter sent up a prayer to be allowed a five-minute talk, and Mr. Twain relented. He sent back a message that he supposed he could spare five minutes. Mr. Twain was found seated at a table, writing, and through the open folding doors Mr. Cable could be seen in the next apartment, engaged at the same task. Mark Twain, in appearance, is the typical man of the Southwest of medium height, his body surmounted by a big head, covered with a thatch of stiff, curly hair, deeply tinged with gray. "'This is Mr. Twain, I presume,' said the reporter. "'I guess it is,' replied Twain. "'I haven't any reason to the contrary. Y you may call me Twain. Have you and Mr. Cable been successful with your readings?' "'Well, now, we haven't any reason to complain. We have been drawing the people, anyhow. I don't know whether we deserve it, but that doesn't make very much difference. Have you appeared in southern cities yet, and have you been well appreciated there? We have only visited one or two places south of the Ohio yet, replied Mr. Twain, with his peculiar drawl and we have gotten along all right. They take to us kindly. People of the South can laugh just as loud and as long as anybody, and that's what I'm here to do. I don't want to make them cry. But your partner, Mr. Cable, does. Oh, well, that is his affair. If he can't do it, he is left, not I. But after all, our tour has been all that I could wish, and we have had good houses wherever we have gone. The reporter alluded to the fact that Mr. Twain had brought suit against the house of Estes and Laureate for advertising his new book, Huckleberry Finn, at less than the price. I only protect myself, said the author. That firm doesn't publish my book. It isn't even out yet. Therefore they have no copies, and they can't sell them at what they advertise. It is interfering with my legitimate business, and is a piece of impudence sure to damage me. Therefore I intend to stop it. You are a member of the International Copyright Association, are you not? I am. I have just received a letter from Mr. G. P. Lathrop, the secretary. We are hard at work, and we intend to carry this thing through. We are gathering our forces, our men, and our money, and we are bound to succeed. As for myself, I am always protected in the matter of copyright on my books. I always take the trouble to step over in Canada and stand on English soil, thus 
secure myself and receive money for my books sold in england mr twain i see statements that you are a native of this state is it true i used to see that myself but not lately no i was not born in kentucky i am a missourian that is i was but i live in hartford now when i am at home mr twain i see another statement that you and your wife are worth one million dollars how about that the author of tom sawyer opened wide his eyes gazed at the reporter for a few minutes and with a perceptible lengthening of his drawl said mr cable did you hear the question the young man asked i did replied the latter i am awaiting your answer with anxiety i suppose said the missourian i must acknowledge that i am not a millionaire it is worse than pulling a tooth young man but it must come no i and mrs twain don't possess a million dollars that i ever heard of but i wish we did i am very busy just now said mr cable as the reporter turned the conversation upon him i wish you would excuse me twain can uh, uh, tell you everything as the newspaper representative arose to go mr twain followed him into the hall come here he said with a beckoning of his hand and speaking in a confidential whisper young man don't you blackguard me in your paper why not asked the reporter it isn't right have i ever done any wrong to you or your relations that you should abuse me no then don't do it we might meet again has any reporter ever abused you perhaps i got mixed up with other articles in the papers and thought they did but it is all right i forgive you good-bye end of interview thirty one read by john greenman this is section thirty two of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview thirty two cable and twain the author and the humorist arrive in the city today st louis post dispatch january ninth eighteen eighty five page seven while mr j b pond was this morning standing in the rotunda of the southern hotel with samuel l clemens mark twain standing on one side of him and george w cable on the other the post dispatch reporter present was struck by the touching likeness which the group bore to that beautiful legend which provides a human being with two attendant spirits one of them of diabolical mien always urging him on to commit felonies and misdemeanors the other of angelic aspect constantly coaxing him to give up his criminal ways mark twain's features familiarized to the public by several brands of chewing tobacco cigars and cigarettes are so well known that it only becomes necessary to describe the appearance of his less mephistophelian companion mr cable is or rather if he were a woman would be what the society editors describe as a petite brunette he is short and slender and dark of complexion and dressing in black presents very much the appearance of a clerical gentleman of absolutely orthodox views his most remarkable features are his eyes and his forehead the former being very large and dark and intelligent while the latter is high and broad and gifted with an intellectual bulge which makes him a much more imposing person when he takes his hat off than he previously appears a long black beard and a still longer moustache which would be of phenomenal beauty were the beard not allowed to take the wind out of its sails complete a very interesting though not particularly strong face after the tableau vivant had signed their names in the hotel register they were accompanied by the post-dispatch reporter to mr clemens's room 
where the conversation at once turned upon an accident which had happened to the train they were on just as it entered upon the first of the arches coming from the illinois shore mr clemens undertook to supply the descriptive work and at once began as follows in his particular drone which being a difficult matter to reproduce with the ordinary copper-faced type as commonly in use among the high class of american newspapers must be left for the imagination of the reader to supply we had he said just reached that portion of the bridge which overhangs the crystal waters of the mississippi river when a misunderstanding arose between the forward and rear portions of the train the engine conceived the intention of leaving the track upon which the rest of the train was and moving upon another one while the remainder of the train decided to remain where it was the result was that one of the forward passenger cars was switched diagonally across the track if we had not been going very slowly at the time the whole train would have left the track personally i suppose you had no fears being familiar with the river currents not in the slightest it would not have discommoded me in the least to have been tossed into the mississippi i know the river thoroughly it was the other people i was thinking of i noticed that you seemed very anxious about the other people mr cable remarked with a quiet smile it's no wonder mr clemens resumed there was a continuous kind of jolting which became more and more ominous and suggestive as the train advanced a sense of crumbling something crumbling beneath us where stability was of the highest importance to us all personally became very prominent i fully expected the bridge to break down i have always done so when i crossed it and my anxiety for the safety of the other passengers led me to leap quite hastily from my seat and make a rush for the nearest exit i wanted to get out and see what was the matter so i could intelligently supply the required relief and you got there the reporter asked yes but unfortunately too late to be of any service the train had stopped of its own accord there were not many people hurt in the accident how were they injured they happened to be in the front when i was going out i went out in a great deal of a hurry and they were in the way i'm sorry that i cannot furnish you with a list of the wounded and a statement of where they came from and the nature of the injuries i did think of getting up such a list and giving the name of prominent men but it don't do after all to play a practical joke on a newspaper there are so many people who don't understand a joke however plain it may be that the possibility of serious results stands in the way of their perpetration turning the subject the reporter offered to sympathize with mr clemens upon the atrocious character of the cuts woodcut illustrations which were being published of himself and mr cable they're bad yes they're very bad he said but i am glad of it i would rather have that kind of a picture in the newspapers because when people look at us after seeing the picture we make a favorable impression by contrast this is a new idea of pictorial advertising and it works admirably take the average theatrical chromo it flatters the subject and when the latter comes under the gaze of an audience the result is a certain amount of disappointment if the people we go to see on the stage were as handsome as their portraits they could charge double prices i think cable's picture flatters him but mine does not begin to do me justice so much time had already been wasted upon commonplaces that the reporter informed mr twain that he had been entrusted to secure an interview and that if he had no objections not in the least mr clemens remarked as he groped nervously through his pockets and 
finally looked at his visitor with a glance of blank amazement. Then he called out to his partner in the next room, "'Cable, have we entirely run out of our Friday interviews?' "'Completely,' Cable answered. "'Too bad,' Mr. Clemens remarked. "'Give me a Wednesday or a Saturday one,' the reporter suggested. "'Twouldn't do,' Mr. Clemens said, with a decisive shake of the head. "'We can interchange the other day's interviews among themselves, but none of them are with the Friday one. They are too lively. Our Friday one is staid, sober, calm. Cable wrote it, and we've had a run on them. They are all gone. Never mind. I'll hunt through my trunk, and if I find one I'll bring it around to the office.' The reporter left, but up to the time of going to press neither the humorist nor the interview had arrived at the office. End of Interview 32 Read by John Greenman This is Section 33 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 33 Two of a Kind, Samuel L. Clemens and George W. Cable, St. Louis Chronicle, January 9, 1885, page 1. Mark Twain, S. L. Clemens, and George W. Cable, the humorists, arrived at the Southern this forenoon, and, tonight, make their first of three appearances here at Mercantile Hall. A Chronicle reporter was suavely received by the gentlemen in their apartments, Mr. Clemens remarking in a droll way that it was nothing more than he expected. He was in his shirt-sleeves and slippers. His gray-sprinkled, bushy hair left just as he had combed it with his fingers. He is aged forty-nine years, is five feet eight and a half inches high, and weighs one hundred and forty-three pounds. "'My health is excellent,' said he, as he threw a leg up over the arm of a chair. "'Never was better. We have been two and a half months on the road, and will continue until the first of March.' "'Where have you had the largest audiences?' "'Naturally, in the largest cities.' "'With one notable exception.' broke in Mr. Cable, who had opened a door from an adjoining room, and stood in the midst of it, his Prince Albert, a long frock coat, buttoned tightly around him. "'Yes,' said Mr. Clemens, "'at Ann Arbor, Michigan, our audience was phenomenal.' "'Where have you found the most responsive audiences?' "'Well, take Chickering Hall, New York.' One night they will fairly open their arms to you, ready to applaud every utterance all the way through, and the same audience, the next night, will be severely critical. Then take Boston with, say, an audience of 2,500, and when you first come on the stage they receive you heartily. They must have five minutes to examine you in, and wonder whether they are going to be pleased with you, and after that they are right with you all the way through, and everything is satisfactory. Then go north to Toronto, Canada, and south to the southern cities, and you have two extremes, geographically, but they are exactly alike. They don't stop to criticize you, but, becoming enthusiastic, remain so all the way through. Before the usual northern state audience, you must go cautiously and keep yourself well in hand, because they begin criticizing you in the start. Before a southern, Canadian, or London audience, you can be thoroughly careless, and it's all right. You can go right along and watch nothing. The idea is widespread that an English audience is slow and hard to please, but it is not. They are quick as lightning and see a joke before you get to it. Is it not true that an Englishman always laughs after others have gotten over the spasm? 
yes if it is only one englishman or five englishmen now then take the same five englishmen and multiply them by one hundred and they respond before you want them to the only theory of this is i think that when you are cracking a joke to one englishman he is more interested in setting his reasoning powers to work to weigh and analyze the thought concealed in the joke than he is to laugh at it i am sure that is it for the reason they laugh at the same joke so suddenly when in a large audience your program is tonight i begin with a short passage from huckleberry finn a book not yet published next two selections from a tramp abroad and close with something appropriate which the hour of the evening determines tomorrow matinee i repeat this program and tomorrow night i read a desperate encounter with an interviewer and then a fantastic chapter from huckleberry finn and close with the only duel i was ever concerned in matinee or female audiences are cold because naturally women are timid and afraid to laugh right out of his books mr clemens says he realizes the most money from a tramp abroad on account of the large royalty but the innocence abroad has the largest sale although not seriously better than roughing it of all the books some eight in number the sales amount to about twenty five thousand copies a year the lecturer has a wife and three little girls the eldest of whom is thirteen years old and has a good competency when the reporter asked mr cable who only recently came into prominence as a humorist something of himself he said in a droll way that would give a cat a spasm now don't ask me to tell the story of my life because i have told it so often that i am just sick when the reporter said he was familiar with his life and could write it down from memory he said well for goodness sake don't say i told you say i told you said mark twain and then they know it'll be authentic yes said cable say clemens told you i am real tired i will give them as much as they want of me when i get them cornered in the theater end of interview thirty three read by john greenman this is section thirty four of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview thirty four fort madison iowa democrat january twenty first eighteen eighty five it was thursday evening the small eighteen by twenty waiting room of the c b and o road at keokuk was filled to overflowing with people of all kinds sizes and descriptions there were ministers advanced agents for dramatic combinations commercial men stable men the few dim lights that made an effort to shine out through chimneys made black by constant use and inattention were only made the more so by the mighty cloud of tobacco smoke that filled the room the train that should have arrived at five fifty to bear the subject of this sketch to burlington where his other half george w cable was patiently awaiting him and ourselves to our destination madison was reported half an hour late caused by the snow which was rapidly falling and constantly drifting upon the track a half hour passed and signs there were none of the train we heard a grunt our attention was attracted to a form evidently that of a man perched upon a high stool near a lunch counter upon which doughnuts and other decrepit edibles found slow sale or more properly an eternal abiding place we looked at the form it attracted our attention perched as it was upon the elevated settee with its heels recklessly clinched on the top rung which caused the knees to come in almost immediate contact with the chin closer examination convinced us that it was a man and the occasional grunts that he was alive though worried perplexed 
and disappointed. We spotted the personage as Mark Twain. Eleven pair of heavy arctics covered his feet, while a slouch hat, pulled carelessly out of shape, protected his head. From under the brim peered out a few curly locks. Between this and a high-collared overcoat was a face. The expression compared favorably with the growling emissions, so we knew that they came from none other than Mark Twain. An hour later our discovery found the form dismounted and tussling with a huge valise and a smaller parcel. The long-expected train had come. The sight of it seemed to lift a wrinkle from the face of Mr. Twain, who made at once for the door of the dingy room, thence to the rear car, the sleeper. We followed him. He walked down the long platform, and, with his eyes down-bent, or half-closed, caused by the blowing snow, he failed to recognize the fact that platforms, as well as everything else, have an end, and fell headlong into the snowbank, his grips going in opposite directions. We were not far behind, and came near meeting with the same fate. At last we ventured to speak. "'Did you lose anything, Mr. Twain?' "'No, I guess I'm all here,' he replied. The car was finally reached, and Mr. Twain was assigned a section directly opposite the one we made convenient to occupy. The humorist commenced taking off his outside wraps, and when the task was done he had undergone a complete metamorphosis. He wore a full evening suit of black. The open-fronted vest exhibited a newly laundered shirt-front, from the collar of which article fell a soft black tie. The clear yellow light of the porcelain-shaded lamps of the car presented to us a different-appearing man than the form before mentioned. Mr. Twain is a man of medium height, light weight, well-formed shoulders, heavy curly gray hair, a prominent mustache, slightly silvered, and a face that is a study. Perhaps the expression he wore was his best, for twas a compound of expectancy, eagerness, disappointment, and regret, certainly one interesting to behold. Mr. Twain was not in a pleasant position. He knew it. He felt it. He knew that nine o'clock was but a few minutes distant, and he was only fairly started with forty-three miles to go. Had we better brave the lion in his wrath, thought we? Was it wise to interrupt the lethargy into which he had fallen? An interview, which to us would be so pleasant, so satisfactory, would to him be dull, uninteresting, and stupid. And yet that love for self quite overcame us. We made the break. Mr. Twain, allow us to introduce ourselves. We can readily tell that we are addressing the proper person, and believe that we can guess your frame of mind. We handed him our business card. Sit down, he said pointing to a seat in his section and extending his hand. We sat. He spied the name of Potawatomi on our card. It was one of some that we had left. And upon inquiry as to its meaning, we told him all that we knew about it, and considerable that we guessed. And the conversation drifted upon the Indian race. He remarked about the scarcity of the red man within the last few years, or at least of his becoming so rapidly civilized, and of so few who kept their blankets, feathers, etc., in constant use. He conversed on other topics as well, survived a well-meant compliment on his famous volumes, etc., etc. We inquired as to his success in his present pursuit, and he replied that his reception had been favorable since his commencement last fall. Reaching Veli Station, he said, I must have a porter go ashore and send a telegram. Uh, excuse me, please. We said certainly, and suggested that the message might be called a cablegram. Whether or not he appreciated the pun, we were not able to decide, as we changed our section to the farther end of the car, and had only the courage to nod a farewell when the train pulled into the station. End of Interview 34 Read by John Greenman
This is section 35 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 35. Clemens and Cable. Minneapolis Tribune, January 25, 1885. Page 3. Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, of Hartford, Connecticut, and George W. Cable, of New Orleans, arrived at the West Hotel yesterday at eleven o'clock, and a few minutes later, in response to the card of a Tribune reporter which went up on the elevator with them, came down to the parlors and gracefully submitted, as a brace of Wylam reporters ought to, to the process of being interviewed. The two gentlemen in appearance present a marked contrast. Mr. Clemens is so like the woodcut representations in his works that even the absence of the plaid pantaloons and a certain general flavor of caricature does not destroy the similitude. His rather long hair and mustache are quite gray, but that doesn't seem to account for the stoop in the sloping shoulders and the comical shuffling side-gait of the humorist. Mr. Clemens has a fashion of throwing his head back on one side, folding his hands behind him, and putting an intensely solemn expression into his eyes. One would sooner expect a man who looks that way to deliver a weighty opinion as to the existence of the prehistoric man than to perpetrate a witticism of any sort. Cable and I started on this raid the day after the presidential election, and have been on the road ever since," replied Mr. Clemens, in his peculiar drawl, in answer to a question of the reporter. Two years ago I got some such plan as this in my head. I wanted to get a larger menagerie together. Howells, T. B. Aldrich, Uncle Remus, Cable, and myself so that we could all go on the stage together and each read two minutes or so and pose as the happy family between times. But Howells had to go to Italy on a commission from the century, which will take him a year to fulfill, and the others couldn't join us for one reason or another, and so Cable and I started out alone. I suppose I might have gone out on some such expedition all by myself, but I'm afraid it wouldn't be pleasant. I want somebody to keep me in countenance on the stage and to help me impose on the audience. But more than that, I want good company on the road and at the hotels. A man can start out alone and rob the public, but it's dreary work and it's a cold-blooded thing to do. "'That is a fact,' asserted Mr. Cable. "'Last year I traveled and read alone, but it was lonesome.' "'Have you uh, another story now in progress?' was asked of Mr. Cable. "'I am not writing anything now, but whenever I am in New Orleans, the materials for a new story keep growing up from day to day.' There seems to me to be an inexhaustible fund in the Creole life of that region. How did you happen upon what so many had missed before you? It was a few years ago that I was assigned by a New Orleans paper as a freelance to write up the religious and educational history of the city. Now, the development of New Orleans is inseparably bound up with the history of the old colonists and their descendants. In this way I stumbled right upon the wealth of material that I have utilized in Dr. Severe. Mr. Cable pronounced it severe with the accent on the last syllable, and my other novels. You have doubtless noticed that the Creoles of New Orleans have taken serious exception to your Creole dialect and your delineation of Creole characteristics as well. Yes, I have noticed and I have noticed that all the criticisms have come from the Creoles themselves. Now they are, of course, insensible of their own errors in the use of English, and hence are hardly to be taken as competent critics of my books in that respect. Again, as to their characteristics, the very violence of their attack upon my works only serves to confirm the truth of the characters as I have drawn them. 
Mr. Clemens was asked if he was working on a new book, and replied in the negative. I haven't gotten Huckleberry Finn fairly off my hands yet. Is Huckleberry Finn a creature of flesh and blood? Well, I could not point you out, the youngster all in a lump, but still his story is what I call a true story. The incidents are, in the main, facts, and I tried to make a faithful painting of certain phases of life on the southern Mississippi. Do you remain in the city over Sunday? Yes. This is the first chance we have had to arrange a new program, and we are going to utilize tomorrow for that purpose. We return to Chicago the 2nd of February, and as we have read both our programs there, we have got to have a fresh one for this occasion. It's easy enough to make out a program, but to commit the parts to memory, there's the rough. If I don't know my part perfectly, I get all befuddled when I get on the stage, and can't do anything. If I am master of it, why, I often improvise to a considerable extent as the spirit moves. But when I need to improvise to help out my limping memory, I can't do anything at it. I wonder if our breakfast is ready yet suddenly broke out mr clemens ah don't you mean dinner suggested the reporter i mean breakfast we haven't had a bite this day yet and i begin to feel a goneness here don't you cable queried the great american humorist laying his hand with a pathetic gesture on the region of his stomach just then the waiter appeared and announced breakfast and messrs clemens and cable after a pleasant adieu walked off arm in arm for the dining room to discuss the long deferred meal end of interview 35 read by john greenman this is section 36 of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview 36 talk with mark twain Milwaukee Evening, Wisconsin, January ninth, 1885, page 2. This forenoon, a Wisconsin reporter, who called at the Plankinton House, had a very pleasant chat with Samuel Langhorne Clemens, the great American humorist, who, under the nom de plume of Mark Twain, has achieved a worldwide fame. Mr. Clemens is in town in company with George W. Cable, the Southern novelist, with whom he is giving a series of readings throughout the country. The personal appearance of Mr. Clemens is very deceptive. Nobody would ever take him for one of the most humorous writers that ever lived. He is fifty years old, but does not look more than forty. He is of medium size, and is an almost perfect specimen of physical manhood, although from habit he stoops considerably his features are strong and clear-cut this statement is particularly true of his chin his eyes are deep-set under a manly-looking forehead with the exception of a heavy moustache his face is smooth-shaven a fine crop of clustering curly gray hair covers his head and adds greatly to the peculiar attractiveness of his appearance mr clemens's manners are brusque but genial and are the result of the varied life he has led. When the reporter found him this afternoon, he was clad in an unpretentious gray suit, and was hugging the fireplace in his room in an earnest manner that showed he felt the cold. "'How do you like your present business?' asked the reporter, after he had shaken hands with Mr. Clemens, and had accepted an invitation to a seat. The question referred to the reading tour of the Twain-Cable combination. "'Very well, indeed,' answered the humorist, rubbing his chin. "'When we first started out,' he continued, "'I didn't think I should like the business. I had been off the platform for about fifteen years. But I've got into it now, and enjoy it, although the present weather is not calculated to promote one's comfort.' I understand that you have been doing a very good business. 
Oh, yes. We started out the day after the presidential election and have appeared before the public six times a week ever since. Our houses have, as a rule, been very good. In fact, we have seldom been greeted with any other kind of house. The only fault I find is that the trip blocked out for us is too long. It will take a month yet to complete it. Mr. Clemens rubbed his chin while he was speaking. Mr. Clemens, what was the true cause of the public not getting your latest book, I mean Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, sooner? Well, you see, the delay was caused by a man employed in the stereotyping department of the New York printing house where the book is being published. This man, with one slight gouge of a graver, made an indelicate addition to a cut of one of my characters. The fact that the picture had been ruined was not discovered until several thousand copies of the work had been printed. When discovery was made, the edition was suppressed, and a new one is being printed and will be ready shortly. How are your older books selling now? The sale, I believe, ranges from 15,000 to 25,000 every year, in the aggregate. On a rough guess, I should say that 170,000 copies of The Innocents Abroad have been sold since it was first published. Roughing it is not far behind, with a sale of, say, 150,000 copies. The sale of A Tramp Abroad, a comparatively new book, reached between 80,000 and 90,000. Is there any truth in the story that you attempted to establish a residence in Canada in order to get a copyright there? None whatever. An application for a copyright was given me to sign, but I had to swear that I was a resident of Canada, and although told it was only a matter of form, I refused. In some way or other, but how I have never been able to understand, the difficulty was at least surmounted, and I now have Canadian copyrights on Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Life on the Mississippi. My Montreal publisher managed the affair. How have you managed in regard to England? I have never had any trouble there, but have sold my rights without difficulty. Do you think that an international copyright law should be passed by Congress? I do. It would be a great step in advance. Our present system is morally wrong. We have now an established literature of our own, and should not attempt to rob foreign authors of the fruits of their labor. It is unjust, to say the least. Mr. Clemens related to the reporter the manner in which he came to adopt his nom de plume. He was formerly a pilot on the Mississippi River, where a lead man always says Mark Twain instead of Mark II when he wishes to state that the water is two fathoms deep. Mark II, Mr. Clemens said, cannot be heard in stormy weather, but Mark Twain has a different sound and catches the ear at once. The pseudonym was first used by a Mississippi River boatman who wrote occasionally for a New Orleans journal. When he died, Mr. Clemens adopted it. Mr. Clemens lives in Hartford, Connecticut, where, he stated to his visitor, I have led a hermit's life for the past fifteen years. He intends to write another book shortly. The present visit is his first one to Milwaukee. In former years he has been a boatman, a miner, a traveler, and, in a word, has had a rough experience generally. Facts collected on his present trip will form part of his new book. End of Interview 36 Read by John Greenman This is Section 37 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 37 Mark Twain Interviewed Lafayette, Indiana, Courier, February 6, 1885, page 1, read by John Greenman. 
a courier representative corralled mark twain in the rotunda of the lar house shortly after the noon hour to-day and put the screws to him would you believe it young man cable and i never fail to make a hit if the audience fail to materialize to any alarming extent cable kicks and i strike the treasurer for all he has in his box it's a hit every time if it's not one kind it's another you have a very fine city here i particularly admire the grand canal i was attracted to it by some invisible influence the moment i arrived in fact before i had left the train i knew there was one here it reminds me forcibly of venice anyhow there is something familiar like about it uh, perhaps it's the odor i thought i saw a gondola fast in the lee but it proved to be only some misguided animal that had found its way into the water as hood remarked oh it was pitiful in a whole city full with the cholera so nigh or words to that effect the animal was dead uh, quite dead at least i fancied so there was something peculiar about it that said as plain as words could tell this place is haunted i think the canal is even more attractive than the artesian well though that is powerful too there is a something however indescribable about the canal that the artesian well don't have but you know all that both speak for themselves the canal a trifle the loudest perhaps as a steady intoxicant i should prefer the well but in case of sickness where a powerful emetic is wanted i should recommend the canal to the other fellow between them you have a very striking courthouse very striking indeed i should judge that it must have struck the taxpayers a very hard blow by the way what is that remarkable object away up on top at first i fancied the building was not completed and that it might be a, a derrick sticking out of the tower but cable says he has examined it with his spy-glass and that it's a part of the building he thinks it is a statue of mcginley as he appears in the police court cable has been there and knows how it is he has a grievance against mac however he says thirteen dollars is entirely too much to tax a man for a police department and so george is disposed to say mean things about mac what do you think of my lecture well that is cool they must keep you on ice young man now if you want my private opinion of cable i'll tell you when the bloom is on the rye do you tumble no well then when the froth is on the beer see the reporter caught on twain got his beer and continued well cable is just splendid but you must ask him about it he is even more enthusiastic on that subject than i am i only know he is a powerful card would you believe it when i even fail to exert that soothing influence on the audience necessary to the real comfortable enjoyment of a lecture or a sermon cable can actually close every eye in the hall in exactly five minutes by the watch i have timed him frequently and always with the same result but you must come and hear him we charge members of the press two prices to make them feel independent we like to encourage free speech on the part of the press we hope to catch one of them some day for libel and that would be five thousand dollars apiece at least in our pockets good scheme eh ta ta end of interview thirty seven read by john greenman
This is section 38 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 38. Luke Sharp. The Remarkable Twain. Detroit Free Press, February 15, 1885, page 15. The city editor said to me Thursday, as he handed me his theater pass, most of the boys have to be at the governor's ball tonight, and I wish you would take in the Twain Cable entertainment. I thought the Russell House had taken them in and entertained them. At least they'll think they were taken in when they see the bill. If you see Major Pond, continued the city editor, just apologize to him and say that I'd have sent up somebody that knew something if it were not for the governor's snap. Tell him everybody that amounts to anything is on duty there. Try and get it into some sort of shape now. Begin at Whitney's, if there's a good crowd. It's a large and enthusiastic audience. If there's only a few, it's a small but appreciative audience. Well, I guess I can write up a one-night show, I said. He sighed and said he hoped so. He's an encouraging man. I found Major Pond by the door at Whitney's. He should have been called Lake. He is the largest pond I ever saw. That how he gets his title as differing from the minor ponds. I would like to go behind the scenes, I said. I want to write this up from a spectacular point of view. I think that their style of makeup and their general conduct would be most interesting. Oh, said the Major, you're mistaken. The Caralfi show is next week. This is a reading, a series of recitations. Well, I know that, I explained. I want to study the— That's nonsense, said the Major irritably. There's no make-up. Do you mean to say that the stories are not made up? Why, Twain himself don't claim they're anything else. The Major refused to talk any more, and went round to the stage door to make such arrangements as would prevent my getting in but the Major doesn't know Whitney's as well as I do. He set a guard at the outside door and the one that comes in from the auditorium. This put me to the trouble of diving down by the fiddler's entrance into the cellar and then up the back stairs to the stage. I sat down beside the fellow who guarded the outside door. Across the stage at the other side my old friend the Dutchman was working at the gas fixtures. The view from the wings is rather restricted. You get a section of the opposite box, a full view of the Dutchman, and a complete exposure of how abruptly the shoddy grandeur of the stage setting fades away into ragged squalor when it passes the point that limits the view of the audience. Several cards on the wall said that the insurance policies of the house would become void if anybody smoked, and that the smoking party would be held responsible would have the house on his hands, as it were. I put out my cigarette, and that is why Whitney owns the house this morning, instead of me. As I said, I drew a chair beside the guard. Major Pond told me to tell you to keep a sharp look. That's all fixed, said the guard. That's what I'm here for. Bet you four dollars he'll walk right past you. Bet you four dollars he won't. No passes at this door. May step over my body but he don't pass me. Here he comes, said I. Now you'll see him try to cheat right in. The guard stood up. Twain and Cable came in by the front door and walked round the outside of the parquet circle to the curtained entrance by the right-hand box. Twain came first. The guard put his hand up against him and said, No, you don't. Not here you don't. Why? Why, what's the matter? drawled Mark looking in surprise from under his bushy eyebrows. "'Isn't the rent of the house paid? It's Major Pond's orders. You can't come in here. You can go to the Russell House and see them after the performance is over.' Just then Major Pond came up and passed the readers in. Twain took off a fur muffler that was round his neck and stamped up and down the room a bit to see if he still had the use of himself after the cold walk. Cable also shed his wraps and adjusted his white necktie before the glass. Southerner as he was, he didn't seem to feel the cold as much as the northern author. Then Mark took a look at the audience. Coming back, he said, "'The governor's got him, Cable.' 
Again? He's got the audience, I mean. We'll have to talk to empty benches, I'm afraid. It's not eight o'clock yet, said Cable, and it wasn't. Before the hour struck, the house was well filled. Just then Twain cast his eyes on the program that lay on the dressing case. I knew it, he said, wrapping the little sheet of paper with a downward flip of fingers. I knew it. They've got the program wrong. I marked out myself what it was to be, so of course they got it mixed. This bothered the readers for a few moments, but they finally adjusted themselves to the changed state of affairs, and Mr. Cable walked to the table on the stage, and the sound of applause came into the room while Mark was slipping off his rubbers. He looked up in surprise as I stood in the door. "'I came to interview you,' I said. "'Then you'll have to take me in sections,' said Twain. "'You didn't know I had something to do, some little things to say, to the audience tonight. Oh, you did know it. Well, I thought maybe you didn't. Some people don't read the papers, you know. That would naturally break up our interview, have a tendency to make it disconnected. I hate anything disjointed, like uh, looks as if a person didn't know just what he was talking about. By the way, here there was a loud burst of applause, and Cable came in. Excuse me, said Twain, and he went hesitatingly, as if afraid he might step too hard on something, and the next moment was before the loudly audible audience. Mr. Cable was rather taken back to find me there, but he is a gentleman. He made no attempt to eject me. He is under medium height, very straight and very slender. He has a fine intellectual face. His beard is silky black, and his long mustache is twisted, with its end hanging down below his chin, making a bow over his mouth. His nose is straight and small, his eyes bright, black, and piercing, and his forehead high. His hair is the color of jet, and as glossy as oiled ebony. I suppose you have no objection to being interviewed? Well, you see, hesitated Cable with a smile, I could hardly tell you anything in the intervals. Oh, that's all right, I said. How do you like this terrific cold? It is rather cool, he answered, looking meaningly at me with his black eyes. Perhaps dark eyes would sound less John L. Sullivanish. Don't you feel the cold more on account of living in the South so long? No, I rather like it. The bracing air. Yes, it's bracing. I said, bracing. I agree with you. It braced a couple of my ears pretty badly yesterday. I just said to Cable, coming in on the cars today, it's astonishing what big contracts the frost is taking this year. This was put in by Mark, who had got back. Cable escaped. Now, to begin where I left off. In the matter of cold weather, it is wonderful what a southerner will stand. You talked to him, I suppose, all the while I was gone. Yet he is able to go before that audience again. Now, he doesn't feel the cold as much as I do. He likes a cold day, twenty or thirty below or so. You take a good all-round southerner, and if he lives through the first winter north— why, he'll stand all the cold after that that you can give him. It's like the way they tested that Swiss bridge. Put all the people on it that could get there. Then, as it didn't break, it was pronounced safe. We tried Cable North one winter, and as he didn't die, we felt safe after that. Ah, they're after me. He went on, but Cable didn't come back. He walked around at the rear of the stage. There must have been something interesting back there, for Twain went to see it too, and walked back and forth, slashing his arms around himself to keep up his circulation. Then Pond came in and said the city editor wanted to see me. I couldn't find him, so I started for the office and wrote this up. End of Interview 38 Read by John Greenman This is section 39 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 39. Mark Twain's Wicked Moments. Brockville, Canada. Evening Recorder. February 18, 1885. Page 1. Upon the arrival here on Monday evening of Mark Twain and George W. Cable, they were behind time nearly three hours, owing to the snow blockade, and, as might be expected, both travelers were in just the proper mood to appreciate the revere cuisine. They were met at the door of the hotel by Major Pond, their manager, and Mr. Daniel Derbyshire, chairman of the property committee, and in a few moments the whole quartet were discussing beefsteak, pork chops, snow blockades, and fast trains. A reference to fast trains generally leads to a discussion of monumental liars, and it would seem that the occasion alluded to was no exception to the rule. Speaking of the lies being told of fast trains, however, remarked the stalwart representative from the West Ward, reminds me that Canada can boast of a fast train, and not encroach upon the liar's domain either. We have a train down on the Canada Atlantic Road between Coteux Landing and Ottawa, whose schedule time calls for sixty miles an hour, and she makes it right along. Mark, who was doing his best to demolish a huge slice of beef steak just at the time, choked for an instant, then recovered himself, and without so much as a smile or even stopping the motion of his jaws, drawled out in his peculiar tone, "'Well, I'm not just exactly what you'd call an orthodox Christian, but in my travels around the world I don't think I ever feel so wicked as when I'm going around a curve at sixty miles an hour.' End of Interview 39 Read by John Greenman This is Section 40 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 40 Table Talk Boston Literary World, May 15, 1886, page 172 if common report is correct, Mark Twain is much better satisfied by his career as a publisher than by his literary successes. When asked recently if he would contribute to any magazines this year, he said, No, no, no sum of money, however flattering, could induce me to swerve from a resolution I have made to enjoy a solid old-fashioned loaf this summer, after which I will visit my country home at Elmira for the balance of the season. Besides, there is more money in being a publisher. At any rate, that is my experience, and if I perform any more literary work in future, it will be only to keep my hand in. End of Interview 40 Read by John Greenman. This is section forty one of Mark Twain The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview forty one Mark Twain Abroad, St. Paul and Minneapolis Daily Pioneer Press, June thirtieth, eighteen eighty six, page seven. White plug hat gray bushy hair, gray mustache, gray suit of clothes, and an Arkansas corn-cob pipe in his mouth, from which came wreathing curls of smoke. That was Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, as he stood in the Ryan Hotel office last evening, asking to have a cot placed in one of the suite of rooms that he and his family occupied, said Mr. Clemens to a Pioneer Press reporter, Glad to meet you, Puff. I and my family are on their way to Keokuk, Puff, Iowa, to visit my mother, and we have chose the lake route as the most pleasant by which to reach there, Puff. The benefit of coming by the lakes was that I got no news. I was, Puff, 
five days in the heart of the United States and did not see a newspaper. It was refreshing. That's what people take sea puff voyages for, to get away from the news. And when the New York Herald puff proposed to establish ocean life and news bureaus, a thrill puff of horror went through the minds of many people, because the puff news would then go with them on their voyage. Commenting on modern journalism and its rapid progress, he said, The metropolitan journalism of my day is the village journalism of today. End of Interview 41 Read by John Greenman This is section 42 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 42 Amusing the Children Chicago Tribune, July 9, 1886, page 1 Read by John Greenman Mark Twain, traveling incognito under the name of S. L. Clemens, one wife, three children, one maid, was at the Richelieu Hotel yesterday. He leaned on the stone steps in front of the hotel, smoking a putative cigar. Mark Twain's literary fame is so great that it has somewhat cast into the shade his abilities as a smoker. He smokes like an artist. He holds the cigar between his finger and thumb and contemplates it in a dreamy fashion. Then he raises it slowly to his lips, draws gently, and closes his eyes. After a judicious interval he removes the cigar, and the smoke rolls out under his long mustache with all the grace of a first dancer drifting on the stage. Then he opens his eyes. Mark Twain looks as little like himself as it is possible for a man to look. He wore a gray suit, a tall white hat, and a wide white tie such as New York brokers affect. His long, drooping mustache, his well-curled hair, and somewhat profuse jewelry made one think of a successful horseman or the manager of a popular burlesque. But no one ever had such a satisfactory drawl. It established the fact that he was Mark Twain beyond all possibility of quibbling. A woman could do up her hair twice while he is pronouncing the word Mississippi. He lingers over it, plays with it, handles it as a young mother does her first baby. "'We came in last night,' he said, pulling at the left side of his mustache. "'Mrs. Clemens is not very well. Neither am I. I have been amusing the children.' I have taken them to a panorama. I understand there are three others near here. I will take them there, too. I want to satiate them with battles. It may amuse them. Three little girls, composed of three red gowns, three red parasols, and six blue stockings, stood on the steps and grinned. Run up and tell Mamma what a jolly time you've had, and I'll think of something else to amuse you. When the three little girls had disappeared, Mr. Clemens sighed. Did you ever try to amuse three little girls at the same time? he asked after a pause. It requires genius. I wonder whether they would like to bathe in the lake he continued with sudden animation, hardly pausing five minutes between each word. It might amuse them. Are you on your vacation trip, Mr. Clemens? No. I have just returned from a visit to my mother in Keokuk, Iowa. She is eighty-three years old, and I had not been home for over a year. We came from Buffalo to Duluth, by lake, steamer, and then from St. Paul down the river to Keokuk. 
neither in this country nor in any other have i seen such interesting scenery as that along the upper mississippi one finds all that the hudson affords bluffs and wooded highlands and a great deal in addition between st paul and the mouth of the illinois river there are over four hundred islands strung out in every possible shape a river without islands is like a woman without hair she may be good and pure but one doesn't fall in love with her very often did you ever fall in love with a bald-headed woman the reporter admitted that he had drawn the line there i never did either continued mr clemens meditatively at least i think i never did there is no place for loafing more satisfactory than the pilot-house of a mississippi steamboat it amuses the children to see the pilot monkey with the wheel traveling by boat is the best way to travel unless one can stay at home on a lake or river boat one is as thoroughly cut off from letters and papers and the tax collector as though he were amid sea moreover one doesn't have the discomforts of seafaring it is very unpleasant to look at seasick people at least so my friends said the last time i crossed it might amuse the children though suggested the reporter i hadn't thought of that replied mr clemens but perhaps it might the lake seems rather rough to-day i wonder whether one could get a boat a little boat that would bob considerable yes it might amuse the children but at such a sacrifice you are not a parent replied mr clemens the reporter admitted his guilt it is strange continued mr clemens in momentary forgetfulness of the children how little has been written about the upper mississippi the river below st louis has been described time and again and it is the least interesting part one can sit in the pilot-house for a few hours and watch the low shores the ungainly trees and the democratic buzzards and then one might as well go to bed one has seen everything there is to see along the upper mississippi every hour brings something new there are crowds of odd islands bluffs prairies hills woods and villages everything one could desire to amuse the children few people ever think of going there however dickens corbett mother trollope and the other discriminating english people who rode up the country before eighteen forty two had hardly an idea that such a stretch of river scenery existed their successors have followed in their footsteps and as we form our opinions of our country from what other people say of us of course we ignore the finest part of the mississippi it might be incidentally remarked that it were worth going fifty miles on foot if one couldn't get a pass to hear mr clemens unravel the word mississippi i suppose we will go east to-morrow he added but i don't know mrs clemens makes all the plans women enjoy that you know of course we never carry any of them out but that doesn't alter the fact that the plans are thoroughly enjoyable ones we will pass the summer at elmira will you do any work this summer yes i shall probably 
amuse the children but right oh yes i see well i am a private citizen now and have no immediate intention of turning author i shall probably set to work on something or other however most of my work is done in the summer at this moment the three little girls in the three red gowns and six blue stockings appeared and mr clemens resumed the shape of an amusement bureau end of interview forty two read by john greenman this is section forty three of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview forty three twain in court philadelphia daily news august third eighteen eighty six read by john greenman while talking to a daily news reporter afterward mr clemens with his white high hat on the back of his head and his hands in the pockets of his light sack coat twisted himself into all manner of shapes and in his familiar drawl and twang gave his opinion of the case it has been settled he said that publishers have a right to sell books as they please and in this case it is not a question only of whether mr wanamaker shall be allowed to sell a few dozen books or not we want to know just how binding the contracts with our agents are if the present contract is not strong enough we'll have one casted don't you see it will be worth the powder to us and other publishers will know just where they stand after we get through with it mr clemens took his hands from his coat pockets long enough to light a cigar and run his fingers through his bushy mixed gray hair and said philadelphia is a nice quiet city but i must get out of it i'll go back to gowan and ask him to tell me how i can get a through train to elmira End of Interview 43, read by John Greenman. This is Section 44 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 44, Edwin J. Park, A Day with Mark Twain, Chicago Tribune, September 19, 1886, page 12 read by john greenman elmira new york september seventeenth among the great hills surrounding the historical shimong valley wherein the city of elmira is situated are many romantic spots admirably fitted by nature for the site of retired country homes probably the most romantic and undoubtedly the place of greatest general interest among the number of these secluded spots is the one known as Quarry Farm, the summer home of Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, the most refined humorist that America, and probably the world, has ever known. At the eastern boundary of the city rises a great hill, more properly a mountain, which is called the Great East Hill. Up its steep side, along a rough country road, the visitor to Mark Twain's summer home is obliged to climb for something over a mile. Then, when the summit is reached, the road runs westward for another mile before the home of the humorist is found. The plateau on which the house stands has been reclaimed from the wilderness of refuse limestone which surrounds it, and a broad, well-kept park surrounds the pretty cottage. For many years the knoll at the west of the house furnished building stone for the city, and the place, having been laid out and built practically in the abandoned quarry, gives it the romantic title of Quarry Farm. The place is owned jointly by Mr. Clemens and his brother-in-law, Theodore Crane of Elmira, who makes the place his permanent home. 
Mr. Crane married an adopted sister of Mrs. Clemens, and is associated in business with General Charles J. Langdon, Mrs. Clemens' brother, who is a very wealthy man, being the head of the great Clearfield Coal Company. The Langdons live in a palatial residence in the city, and are frequent callers at Quarry Farm, where yesterday Mr. Clemens bade me a hearty welcome. Dressed in a negligee suit of gray, with a soft hat placed carelessly on his bushy head, Mr. Clemens was a perfect picture of complacent self-satisfaction. Coming forward to greet me, Mr. Clemens moved with the slow deliberation which indicated an intention never to close his brilliant earthly career by overexertion, if he could help it. His vocal salutation was of the same complacent nature as his physical exertion, but the greeting was cordial and sincere. On the large, vine-covered veranda, where the cool mountain breeze was a delightful contrast to the heat of the city below us in the valley, Mr. Clemens told my photographer to go ahead and take all of the place you can get. A grotesque Chinese-colored cat and three kittens, two of them of the same general appearance and the third, the color of slate, were playing about our feet. "'That old cat!' reflectively mused the humorist with his eyes half closed is an animal in which i take considerable interest she was very wild when i found her running about here but kind treatment and milk have had a wonderfully civilizing effect upon her and she is quite easily approached now a pause which assumed the importance of a comma grew to the strength of a semicolon reached the full stop of a period and extended to a paragraph ensued while the speaker contemplated the feline group finally he managed to break the silence by remarking i really don't know what to make of that slate-colored animal the other two kittens are colored all right there appears to be some little irregularity about the other one and he continued to gaze earnestly at the interesting group his mind apparently full of the strange kitten's paternity while in this reflective mood with his hand under his chin and his eyes half closed the photographer took a snapshot at him and the result is the picture at the head of this column it is probably the most unique and original thing in existence at the suggestion of Mr. Clemens, we walked to his study, an octagonal structure of dark brown color situated right on top of a high pile of refuse stone. It is reached from the residence by a winding walk, and rough, uneven stone steps without lead to its doors, from which a magnificent view of the city and valley may be obtained. The floor was covered with papers and letters, while on the table and mantel reposed a half-dozen pipes, some tobacco and cigars, of which the owner is an inveterate user. He says that his constitution is such that tobacco does not injure him, and as he enjoys it, he keeps a choice stock on hand. On the very top of the quarry is a summer-house fitted with rustic chairs, hammocks, etc., where, if a breeze is not to be found at the house, the entire family retire to sleep and enjoy the invigorating atmosphere. We climbed up to this delightful spot, and while the stiff breeze blew the humorous bushy hair into tangled confusion, we talked on subjects of mutual interest. He told me of how he had learned to set type in a western printing office, how he had become a wanderer in the west, and we compared notes on the great strides being made in the art preservative a matter with which both he and myself were entirely familiar. Our rough surroundings recalled to me the striking similarity to those of Virginia City, which place is so well described in Mr. Clemens' book, Roughing It. "'The comparison,' said he, "'is very timely and apt. At the time I was on the staff of the Virginia City paper, the place was similar to this, although on a much larger scale. Continuing the conversation, I asked Mr. Clemens if he was doing any work this summer. 
with a tired expression in his large eyes he gazed down into the valley for a few moments and then as though he had arrived at a very difficult conclusion and felt relieved said no i am not at work not doing a single thing just loafing that's all i made up my mind that i would loaf all summer and i intend to do it i left all the books i have started on at my home in hartford so that i couldn't get at them and i'm just lying around and resting and trying to get tired at that i have started some new books but i am in no hurry to finish them i am not anxious about them as it is now i am at home to any of my friends although before this summer i have had to refuse them during office hours which were from nine until four in the afternoon but then in the summer while i am here you know that there is a good deal of daylight between four and eight o'clock and i could get around some then the three summer months which i spend here are usually my working months i am free here and can work uninterruptedly but in hartford i don't try to do any literary work yes as you say he continued in answer to my interruption this may be called the home of huckleberry finn and other books of mine for they were written here now said mr clemens after a rest you will see right below us a little building where my children are amusing themselves my three little daughters have had that stony place fenced off and they live there about all the time in that building they call it ellerslie and at present they are living retired lives which they spend in reading scottish chiefs at my host's suggestion we visited ellerslie and were assured by the three little maids who were clustered around a hammock as shown in the picture that we were welcome to their temporary home we passed inside the house which consisted of one room tastefully decorated by the children on shelves fastened to the side of the room were small dishes of every kind required by the infantile housekeepers while a little cook-stove which had for a foundation an empty soap-box was used for cooking by the little girls mr clemens found a tin pail containing a half dozen eggs and after he had examined them carefully for a time inquired of the eldest child if she considered the eggs entirely trustworthy she said she had some doubts about them and he sagely advised her to take them back to the house and get some of more recent issue the two youngest children were induced to sit on the porch of the house and they are prominent in the accompanying picture of ellerslie cottage it has become a matter of historical interest that whenever there is an addition to the clemens family the happy father straightway has erected at the side of the road near his home a stone watering trough for horses on the trough is carved the name of the child and the year of its birth so far three have been put up i asked mr clemens for the names and dates on each of them and after considerable thought he said he believed they were as follows susie clemens eighteen seventy two clara l clemens eighteen seventy four and jean clemens eighteen eighty when the photographer took the picture of the troughs i examined the others and found that mr clemens was right regarding the names and dates he may feel gratified to find that he was correct mr clemens doesn't come downtown very often although he occasionally visits the langdons and stops in at the century club rooms for a game of billiards one of his nearest neighbors is the rev thomas k beecher and the two men are very good friends it is worthy of remark that one of mr clemens closest friends and neighbors in hartford is mrs harriet beecher stowe a sister of the elmira divine when i left quarry farm mr clemens was earnestly contemplating the misfit kitten while the three little maids in three bright mother hubbard wrappers waved an adieu from the porch of ellerslie cottage 
End of Interview 44 Read by John Greenman This is section 45 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 45, The Insolence of Office, New York World, March 23, 1888, page 4. Washington, D.C., March 2nd. Mark Twain, having survived participation in the author's readings, is now playing Rip Van Winkle in revisiting the places in Washington of which he was a habitué twenty years ago. In fact, more than twenty years have passed since Mark, then with little reputation and less money, was eking out a living as the special correspondent of some Pacific Coast papers, while writing his book Innocence Abroad, which was to make him famous and start him on the road to riches. After several passages with the doorkeepers of the house, Mark is of opinion that the insolence of office is as rife now as it was in his time, to say nothing of Shakespeare's. Presenting his card to one of these officials, the height of whose ambition is to be mistaken for congressmen, Mark asked that it be sent to Sunset Cox. The doorkeeper disdained to look at the card which he had, as if afraid of contamination, but viewed the humble humorist from head to foot and sized him up for the country jay that mark's drawl and dialect suggested you can't see mr cox why because he is busy how do you know is he making a speech nah but he can't see you well how can i get in the press gallery are you a reporter no but i used to be a mighty good one when i lived in virginia city well if you ain't one now you can't get in and he pushed Mark aside to be polite to a gentle female lobbyist whose card went in to her member fast enough. Finally the humorist passed the pickets of the press gallery. After he had asked in vain for the dead and gone correspondents who had been his chums, Colonel Mann recognized him and gave him the world man's seat in the front row, whence he had a fine view of the statesmen of the present generation wrangling over the labor bills. Mark says he will soon publish a compilation of other people's humorous writings, and is also engaged upon an original work which he hopes to finish some time next summer. Having swapped lies, for a while, with the correspondence, Mark tried the floor again. This time he was recognized, and Mr. Cox not only went out to see him, but took him on the floor and made him acquainted with all of the congressional celebrities from reed of maine to martin of texas he kept the crowd of members around him laughing until the gavel of the speaker came to the rescue of order he says the levy that he had reminds him very much of those he used to see on the mississippi in the days when he was piloting end of interview forty five read by john greenman This is section 46 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 46. Mark Twain, Chatty. He tells of his former life as a reporter. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, May 19, 1889, page 20. Washington, D.C., May 17th. I met Mark Twain the other day, wandering around the Capitol and looking at pictures fifty years old, as if they were new, and inspecting with the interest of a rustic stranger the vivid bronze doors whose Columbian glories had bleared his eyeballs more than two decades ago. He strayed into the press gallery, threw back his gray overcoat, adjusted his gold spectacles on his nose, and looked around. A good deal changed, he said, glancing at the life-size photographs of Whitlaw Reed and younger editors which now decorate the walls, and it seems a hundred years ago. I asked when he was here. I had a seat in the press gallery, he meditated, let's see, in uh, 1867, and 
now i suppose all the veterans are gone all the newspaper fellows who were here when i was reed and horace white and ramsdell and adams and townsend the ones you name happen to all be gone i admitted some to the control of newspapers and some to where dr potter says there are no newspapers but some of the real veterans are still here on those pegs in the corner some of the ancients still hang up their coats general boynton and byington and uriah painter and judge noah the king of the jews and dean of the corps most of the old fellows are dead whiteley of the herald crowns of the times adams of the world henry of the tribune go bright of the associated press jim young is executive clerk of the senate john russell young is a journalist at large ed stedman has grown to be a banker poet and henry villard well you know all about him and his fortunes yes some of these men i never knew in washington a few of them were here before my time in fact i was rather new and shy and i did not mingle in the festivities of newspaper row probably most of the men you mention were perfectly unconscious to my existence the morning call and the enterprise did not make much of a commotion in the united states i roomed in a house which also sheltered george alfred townsend ramsdell george adams and riley of the san francisco alta i represented the virginia nevada enterprise also i was private secretary to senator stewart but a capable man did the work a little later that winter william swinton and i housed together swinton invented the idea at least it was new to me of manifolding correspondence i mean of sending duplicates of a letter to various widely separated newspapers we projected an extensive business but for some reason or other we took it out in dreaming never really tried it here mark walked into the gallery and looked down at the vacant senatorial seats i was here last he went on in eighteen sixty eight i had been on that lark to the mediterranean and had written a few letters to the san francisco alta that had been copied past all calculation and to my utter astonishment a publisher wanted a book i came back here to write it why i was offered an office in that ancient time by the california senators minister to china think of that it wasn't a time when they hunted around for competent people no only one qualification was required you must please andy johnson and the senate nearly anybody could please one of them but to please both well it took an angel to do that however i declined to try for the prize i hadn't anything against the chinese and besides we couldn't spare any angels then a pretty good place to write i remarked as we took seats some things he said but an awfully bad place for a newspaper man to write a book as the publisher demanded i tried it hard but my chum was a story-teller and both he and the stove smoked incessantly and as we were located handy for the boys to run in the room was always full of the boys who leaned back in my chairs put their feet complacent on my manuscript and smoked till i could not breathe is that the way you wrote innocence abroad i asked no that is the way i didn't write it my publisher prodded me for copy which i couldn't produce till at last i arose and kicked washington behind me and ran off to san francisco 
There I got elbow room and quiet. It was apparently a wise move, I concurred. But you could write here now, and this is exactly the place for a man like you. More intellectual society is attainable here than in any other city in the world. The only big mistake of your successful life, Clemens, for only his intimate friends address him as Mark, is not coming to Washington to live. Why, all over the United States people of leisure and culture are— Yes, I know, I know, broke in Clemens. But don't tantalize me. Do you take a fiendish enjoyment in making me suffer? I know perfectly well what I am about, and I appreciate what I am losing. Washington is no doubt the boss town in the country for a man to live in who wants to get all the pleasure he can in a given number of months, but I wasn't built that way. <sighs> I don't want the earth at one gulp. All of us are always losing some pleasure that we might have if we could be everywhere at once. I lose Washington, for instance, for the privilege of saving my life. My doctor told me that if I wanted my three score and ten, I must go to bed early, keep out of social excitements, and behave myself. You can't do that in Washington. Nobody does. A look at John Hay, just fading away, I have no doubt, amid these scenes of mad revelry. My wife, you know, is practically an invalid, too, so that neither of us could keep up with the procession. No, the best place for us is quiet and beautiful Hartford, though there is a good deal of the society of Washington that I should delight in. I suppose you have been pirated a good deal, I said to Mr. Clemens. I do not mean by illegal publication of your works, but by private individuals claiming to write your writings. Oh, yes, he said. Considerably. Some scores of cases, I suppose. One ambitious individual in the West still claims to have written the jumping frog of Calaveras County, and another is sure that he produced that classic work known as Jim Wolf and the Cats. I suppose either would face me down with it, and their conduct has led me to conjecture that a man may possibly claim a piece of property so long and persistently that he at last comes honestly to believe it is his own. You know that poor fellow in New Jersey, so weak-minded as to declare that he wrote Beautiful Snow, and going to his coffin with tearful protests? And you know about Colonel Joyce and Ella Wheeler, and laugh and the world laughs with you? But I haven't been bothered that way so much as I have been by personators. In a good many places, men have appeared, represented that they were Mark Twain, and have corroborated the claim by borrowing money and immediately disappearing. Such personators do not always borrow money. Sometimes they seem to be actuated by a sort of idiotic vanity. Why, a fellow stopped at a hotel in an English city, registered as Mark Twain, struck up an acquaintance with the landlord and guests, recited for them, and was about to accept a public dinner of welcome to the city when some mere accident exposed him. Yet I myself had stopped for weeks at that same inn and was well known to the landlord and citizens. His effrontery was amazing. Did he resemble you? I do not know. I hope and believe that he did not. Parties whom I have since been inclined to regard as my enemies had the indecency to say that he did. The same thing happened in Boston and several other cities. 
It was not pleasant to have bills coming in for money lent me in Albany, Charleston, Mexico, Honolulu, and other places, and my calm explanation that I was not there bringing sarcastic letters in reply with, Oh, of course not, I didn't see you with my own eyes, did I? etc., and I resolved that I would follow up the next swindle I heard of. I had not long to wait. A dispatch came from Des Moines, Iowa. Is Mark Twain at home? Yes, I am here and have not been away, I answered. Man personated you, got two hundred and fifty dollars from audience. Shall I catch him? came back, bearing the signature of a lawyer. Yes, I telegraphed in reply. Have sent you check for expenses. He was a good while catching him, some weeks, perhaps months, and then he made me an elaborate report, giving the root of his labyrinthine and serpentine chase of the swindler, the money he had expended, and the information that he did not entirely and completely catch him, though he got near him several times. I was out some hundreds of dollars. I was disgusted, and when I got another dispatch from New Orleans, I think it was, man swindled audience with pretended lecture here last night claiming to be you. What shall I do? I telegraphed back uh, unanimously, let him go, let him go. I'd give one hundred dollars, though, to see one of these doppelgangers who personate me before an audience just to see what they look like. Mark Twain comes down every winter to work for the passage of an international copyright law in conjunction with Edward Eggleston, Gilder, and other authors. Senator Regan of Texas, a friend of Mark's, but an opponent of his pet measure, greeted him cordially last winter with, "'How are you, Mark? How are you? Right glad to see you. Glad to see you. Hope to see you here every session as long as you live.'" One of Mark Twain's favorite amusements here, they say, is turning himself into an amateur guide and explaining to his friends the various objects of interest in the capital. He is particularly facetious over the pictures in the rotunda and the stone people in Statuary Hall. Arriving opposite the marble statue of Fulton, seated and intently examining the model of a steamboat in his hands, he indulges in a wide-sweeping gesture and exclaims, "'This, ladies and gentlemen, is Pennsylvania's favorite son, Robert Fulton. Observe his easy and unconventional attitude. Notice his serene and contented expression, caught by the artist, at the moment when he made up his mind to steal John Fitch's steamboat. The humorist dresses a great deal more carefully than formerly. This is made necessary by his increasing amplitude, by his vast shock of gray hair, by his boisterous and ungovernable mustache, and by his turbulent eyebrows that cover his gray eyes like a dissolute thatch and when he talks, he talks slowly and extracts each of his vowels with a corkscrew twist that would make even the announcement of a funeral sound like a joke. End of Interview 46 Read by John Greenman This is Section 47 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 47. Robert Donald. Mark Twain and His Book. Pall Mall Gazette, London. December 23, 1889, pages 1 and 2. Read by John Greenman. Hartford, Connecticut, December 3rd. Where is Farmington Avenue? I inquired on arriving in Hartford. Do you know Mark Twain's? was the interrogative response, from which it seems that Mark is a more conspicuous object in the topography of Hartford than the magnificent avenue in which he lives. Farmington Avenue is a fine, broad street, 
lined with the american counterpart of the english villa and stretching away into the country but for the presence of the cars and the electric lights and other signs of advanced civilization you might imagine yourself in the aristocratic wing of some quiet english town the world's greatest humorist lives at number three hundred and fifty one the house stands on a knoll and is a charming situation in summer but just now the trees are bare the creepers on the veranda are withered and no evergreen shrubs brighten the lawn harriet beecher stowe lives in the next house to mr clemens but the venerable lady's mind is now unhinged and in her conversation she is no longer the author of uncle tom's cabin mr clemens has also charles dudley warner for a near neighbor so that the atmosphere of this corner of hartford is literary two black and tan collies were guarding mr clemens door when i approached and a pull at the bell brought forth a negro while waiting for mr clemens i noticed that he has got an eye for artistic house decoration and that a handsome edition of browning lay on a table mr clemens soon appeared dressed in a light gray suit his hair is gradually silvering though it is in as great profusion as ever it is well tinged with gray in front but the long tresses which touch his coat collar still lag behind his mustache clings to its reddish hue and his heavy eyebrows maintain a harmonious equilibrium mr clemens was not slow to speak and commenced the conversation very slowly and quietly he was to start for canada in the course of the week to register at a hotel and to obtain copyright for his new book there and in england he had a good deal to say about that book and the modifications which he had to make to suit the english market but as we reached it after going through the copyright question it will be as well to take the same route mr clemens was one of the first to agitate the question of international copyright and started on it as a knight errant many years ago but the heroic crusade collapsed for want of support he took a keen interest in the chase bill which was before congress last year but has not much confidence in a republican majority they are more likely he said to clap on some more protection where it isn't needed rather than give us a little protection which will do good what i asked do you think of mr stedman's opinion that american literature doesn't now require protection that it has survived and overcome pirated editions and is now on its legs that said mr clemens is true so far as it goes but it doesn't go far enough publishers are constructed of the same material as other men and they are not likely to pay a royalty on the work of an unknown author when they can get works of established writers for nothing but the protection of american authors is not the main thing the great question is the preservation in this country of a national literature the spread of national sentiments national thought and national morals what becomes of a few chuckle-headed authors who can go and saw wood or live or die just as they like is a mere trifle compared with the colossal national question involved which is whether our people are going to continue to imbibe foreign ideas and to take their opinions of american institutions from foreign writers if i were going to england and delivering myself conscientiously on your royalties pour out my contempt for your pitiful lords and dukes no one would publish my book but an englishman comes along here and after looking around for a few minutes goes home and writes a book in which he abuses our president jeers and ridicules our institutions and that book is gobbled up by our american publishers and scattered throughout the country at twenty cents a copy after that we are told that the americans are thin-skinned we are also told that our newspapers are 
irreverent, coarse, vulgar, and ribald. I hope that this irreverence will last forever, that we shall always show irreverence for royalties and titled creatures born into privilege, and all that class which take their title from anything but merit. Merit alone should be the only thing that should give a man a title to eminence. I am sorry that some of our newspapers are losing that irreverence which I wish to see preserved. They talk too much about that miserable puppet, the German Emperor, and the spread of foreign ideas is having its effect on our people. There are American women, well brought up and perfectly respectable, who are ready to sell themselves to anything with the name of a duke attached. There is one railroad thief, whom I could name, married his daughter to some decayed prince, but you can't expect much from a railroad robber anyway. Mr. Clemens was quite led away by this onslaught on royalty and titles. He usually speaks very slowly and quietly, but he warmed up and emphasized his words with expressive gestures. He has a habit, when talking with one, to stare fixedly at some imaginary object in space, as if he had got hold of an idea and was determined to keep in sight of it. His normal conversation is very slow, and he lingers sometimes over a word, and then accelerates the speed of the next few, so as to make up for the delay. After this he told me something about his new book, and how he had changed it to suit the English market. "'I want to get at the Englishman,' he said. "'But to do that I must go through the English publisher. And your publishers and your newspapers are cowards. I have modified and modified my book until I really couldn't cut it any more. And now Mr. Chatto, who is the most courageous of them, will have to cut it more. I am anxious to see my fate. I have got the preface, and as only the first part remains, I presume he has cut it. Yes, cut off more than half my preface, said Mr. Clemens in sorrowful tones, and all because of a little playful reference of mine to the divine right of kings. It may be that Messrs. Chatto and Windus will think better of the preface and reverse their decision, but here is the part which the author thinks is doomed. The question as to whether there is such a thing as divine right of kings is not settled in this book. It was found too difficult that the executive head of a nation should be a person of lofty character and extraordinary ability was manifest and indisputable that none but the deity could select that head unerringly was also manifest and indisputable consequently that he does make it as claimed was an unavoidable deduction i mean until the author of this book encountered the pompadour and lady castlemaine and some other executive heads of that kind these were found so difficult to work into the scheme that it was judged better to take the other tack in this book which must be issued this fall and then go into training and settle the question in another book it is of course a thing which ought to be settled and i am not going to have anything particular to do next winter anyway Mr. Clemens also fears that some of the illustrations tell their tale too plainly for the English people. He is delighted with the way the artist has entered into the spirit of the book in executing the illustrations, and pointed to what he considers a very fine portrait of Jay Gould in the capacity of the slave-driver. "'It is four years,' he said, in answer to another question, 
since I projected this book, and three years since I wrote it. When I write a book, I put the manuscript in pigeonholes for a year or two. I take it out and look at it now and then to see how it is getting on. I began to think some months ago that the time was about ripe for this one, and sure enough it is, for there is Brazil getting rid of its emperor in twenty-four hours, there is talk of a republic in Portugal, and federation in Australia, and, curiously enough, the short proclamation in which my hero abolishes the monarchy is similar, I don't mean the language, but the ideas, to the proclamation establishing the Brazilian Republic. Mr. Clemens next conducted me upstairs to what appears to be his workshop and a billiard-room combined. He had been standing writing on the billiard-table when I called, though he usually writes at a small table in front of the window. He writes a young man's hand, and clearer and better than most young men. Compositors delight in his copy, but then Mr. Clemens has been at the typesetter's case himself. He walked up and down the room and smoked a wooden pipe, which he had to refill every few minutes. Mr. Clemens is rarely in New York. He is the head partner in the flourishing and rising publishing business of Webster and Company of New York, but the details of the business he leaves to his partner, Mr. Hall, who sends him weekly reports. Not that Mr. Clemens is devoid of business capacity. He is a keen and capable businessman when he likes, only he cannot be bothered with it when other things occupy his attention. He always sends autographs to the friends who write for them, or rather, his secretary does it. Mr. Clemens puts his name on several hundred cards every few months, and his secretary mails them to applicants. When he sent them himself, he discriminated between two kinds of applicants. No matter, he said, whether they sent a thousand cards or a thousand stamps, I never sent it unless they sent an addressed envelope but I wouldn't write the address. I gobbled the stamps and kept my autograph. The sale of Mark Twain's books is much about the same on both sides of the Atlantic. When a new book is published, about a third of the income comes from England and two-thirds from America. But when the work falls into the list of old books, this order is reversed, probably because the English second editions are much cheaper than the American. On leaving, I asked Mr. Clemens when we might expect another book. I don't know, he said. I don't write the book. It writes itself. If there is another book in me, it will come out. I shall wait until it is ready. Thus the evolution of the great humorist's masterpieces is a slow process. They first go through a period of mental incubation, and after they are transferred to paper they lie in pigeonholes in a chrysalis condition until they are ripe. End of Interview 47 Read by John Greenman This is Section 48 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 48 Mark Twain's At Home New York World, January 12, 1890, page 14 "'I wonder what Mark Twain at home looks like,' said a young man in the World Office one day last week. "'How does he live? Does he enjoy life, or does he groan his way through it, as most humorists are believed to do? How does he work? How much stuff does he grind out every day?' The young man didn't mean any disrespect by calling Twain's happy thoughts stuff. He was simply expressing a wholesome curiosity as to how rapidly the great funny man produced copy, and unconsciously he used the word familiar to most workers in newspapers' offices who are not journalists with a capital J. Every American who reads has frightened off the blues with the aid of the Yankee in King Arthur's Court, 
or grown young and happy again in the company of huckleberry finn and most of us have reveled in twain as he fired his solemn and explosive jokes from the platform or better still have laughed with him to the point of tears after dinner small wonder then that the young man and thousands of other world readers wanted to know what mark twain the man is like and how he originates the germs of his jokes and how he hatches them and brings them to a robust and laughter-compelling maturity and above all how he feels while he is doing it and between times a world reporter was sent up to hartford therefore to find out all that mr clemens knows about himself and a great deal more besides it is no small thing to beard an author not one of mr meeson's tame kind in his den and it is a still more serious matter to grab a successful publisher after the fashion of the white knight in wonderland and tackling the aged aged man and cry come tell me how you live nevertheless the young man armed with a letter of introduction from an old friend took horse and made for mark twain's home by the express train the city directory of hartford an annual full of the fruits of deep research contains this interesting paragraph clemens s l mark twain three five one far at first sight this seems to show that the city is so proud of him that it keeps twain etherealized at a temperature of three hundred and fifty one degrees fahrenheit this is misleading the far is a local synonym for farmington avenue a fine broad airy boulevard that leads to west hartford and number three fifty one of it is the home of the humorist a series of two green and deliberate horse cars roll to and fro on this avenue several times each week the shy habits of these cars have made a fine pedestrian of mr clemens for although he keeps a few horses he'd rather walk than wait for the cars near the top of a green breezy hill stands the long rambling red brick house of mark twain it has more gables more quaint and unexpected corners than the most enthusiastic queen anne house builder could count if every one of its windows were filled with stained glass in honor of some saint they would find standing room for all the calendar and a few new saints added there isn't a vestige of a wall or fence of any kind about the lawns which surround the house on every side trees and shrubs and beds of flowers are plentiful whichever way you look it is strange at first to find a broad porch on the east side of a house but when you have stood on the western and southern porches equally broad and spacious you are reminded that here is the home of a man who has all of the mississippi's love of air and sunlight and who wants to be able to sit outdoors under his own roof at any time of day a trim young black man in black takes your card and goes on a still hunt for the illustrious ancestor of the yankee at the round table the door of the reception room looks out on a roomy hall that occupies the greater part of this floor in one corner sits a white marble mercury his slender muscular right leg resting carelessly across his left knee his energies all relaxed the whole figure a captivating picture of strength and grace at ease what is that queer helmet cocked rakishly over his right ear an old straw hat and without a ribbon into the bargain what need is there to ask the statue where did he get that hat nobody but mark twain would dare to jam such a shocking old hat on the head of hermes but there is no doubt that it adds to the expression of serene rest on the god's marble features the visitor is reminded of the story about twain's decoration of a marble bust of john calvin a few years ago that great and good man appeared in marble his stern features severely smoothed mark improved him by penciling on a curly mustache and the cutest of cute goatees after the fashion of the honorable bardwell sloat mrs clemens was horrified when she saw it 
but no amount of scrubbing was able to restore Calvin's solemnity. Presently there comes a soft footfall and the brisk steps of a man of medium height. Somehow S. L. Clemens at home doesn't seem so tall as Mark Twain on the platform. He has just finished breakfast and there isn't a wrinkle in his face. His hand is small, but it takes his visitors with a firm, nervous grip. I'm glad to see you, says he, and somewhat ashamed to be so late. But we had a little theater here last night, and I find I'm growing old. I don't get up so early as I used to after a night's fun. So saying, Mr. Clemens led the way up to his workshop with as springy a gait as a youngster of twenty-five. This room is a treat. A big billiard table with black and gold legs stands in the middle of it. Its windows look to the westward over a festive and noisy brook in a setting of rich green turf, past clumps of elm and birch and oak and maple. A long line of high blue hills marks the western horizon. On the other side of them is the Farmington Valley. Close at hand, the robin's nests on a tall beach seem likely to fall in at the window. It is a delightful spot altogether, just the place for hard work. Mark Twain's desk stands in the southern corner, piled with business papers. Shelves of books line the walls of this angle parleyings with certain people, rubs covers with the United States Newspapers Directory, and a commentary on the Old Testament is neighborly, and shows no ill-feeling towards Ruskin, who stands near at hand in a red binding. The ground glass of the nearest window is decorated with a beer-stein, gulls, two long-stemmed pipes rampant, and other devices of festivity. Pipes and boxes and jars of tobacco are tucked in here and there, wherever there is room. The pipes are of corn-cob, and burned to a jet black by much usage. Portraits of Gutenberg and studies in black-and-white originals of some famous engravings hang about the wall. At the chimney-side hangs the portrait of an aged woman. In 1833 she taught school near here says Mr. Clemens, and admitted two Negro girls. This was one of the earliest acts that started the abolitionist controversy. The parents of her pupils made a great row about her action, but the black girls kept on in her school. There is a hint of the sailor in the active man who marches up and down the room with the least bit of a roll and a sharp eye to windward as he turns to walk back. He is what a sailor would call a handy-sized man, close-knit and a trifle above medium height, small-footed, small-handed, and full of vim. His head is of generous size, the forehead high and full and broad with shaggy brows of reddish brown. Mark Twain's hair is plentiful and well touched with gray. It is fine and silky, but every fiber in the thatch stands up aggressively as if in perpetual defiance to the brush. The eyes are neither blue nor gray nor brown, but a combination of all three. They stand far apart and have the power of looking clear through things. Twain's mustache is still brownish-red, with hardly a touch of gray. Possibly he is nearly fifty years old, as he pretends, but no observer would write him down for more than forty. "'I'd rather play you a game of billiards,' said he, picking up a cue, "'than try to instruct the world's readers about myself. I know mighty little about the game, but less about the things you want to know. So many people have spoken about Mark Twain's sleepy drawl that it isn't worth while to say much about it here. He talks rapidly enough, after all, but his solemn enunciation slyly inserts ideas in his hearer's mind, and then bang goes an unexpected joke when you have been lulled by that drawl into a state of profound calm. 
when do you write asked the visitor with visions of the humorist grappling at midnight with a large idea and slamming around on paper in the old conventional way from eleven o'clock in the morning until three in the afternoon said mr clemens i work only three months in the year when we all go up to elmira in new york where my wife's folks live i have a little octagonal house made chiefly of glass it stands on the top of a high hill about three miles from the city i think it is one of the quietest spots on the face of this globe still i have had tribulations in it shortly after it was finished and i had begun work on a drowsy summer day with nothing to break the stillness but the peaceful burr of humble insects quieter than solitude i was aroused by a tremendous snorting and squealing and grunting i looked down the hill and found that our nearest neighbor a farmer had established a hog orchard where i could get all the benefit of it the sounds those hogs made when they quarreled and the smells that floated from them on the soft southern breeze drove me wild work was impossible i went over to the farmer's house and bought all those hogs and his right to keep hogs forever a few weeks after that another chorus aroused me and there were six guinea hens squawking to one another in the place where the hogs had been well the farmer said he had paid a quarter apiece for ten hens i offered him a dollar a head for the lot and reserved the privilege of never seeing or hearing them again he agreed three days later i was disturbed by the same cackling and clarity but much more of it and on looking down the hill i found that the farmer had invested my money in four times as many hens in the haste of my bargain i had overlooked specification as to all future hens time for a new trade said i and i made it the farmer a well-meaning man next indulged in a flock of sheep that skipped as near my workshop as possible and ate grass and bleated loudly at regular intervals i bought mutton the quiet has been preserved around that hill now for some time but one by one nearly all of that farmer's rights have been extinguished i don't know how much copy i write each day in those three summer months the amount varies do a little every day is my rule stick to it and you find the pile of manuscript growing rapidly if on reading it over i find things i don't like i simply tear up twenty or thirty pages and there is no harm done don't be in a hurry to do too much but work regularly then you don't wait for inspiration i don't think the prose writer needs to if he were to depend upon that support he'd have an inspiration say once in three months it would last forty-eight hours and what would he have accomplished the poet is a man who works by what is called inspiration but if he had to sit around and wait for it month after month he wouldn't be much of a poet well i work four hours a day five days a week for three months every year that is half as much a day as i worked ten years ago i wrote innocence abroad in sixty days working from noon until midnight every day i wouldn't dare do it now i'm an old man it would break me down didn't it hurt you even then no i had just left a newspaper desk and i was used to that sort of thing 
but now i go slower there is a book pointing to a bundle of manuscript in a pigeonhole that i began in eighteen sixty seven i'm not sure about the exact date but i think that was it i could have been finished any time in the last twenty years by the addition of a chapter i suppose it could be published as it is but i'm not satisfied with it yet once in a while i take the manuscript out and look at it there's no hurry for its publication the time isn't ripe for it i expect to finish the book if i live long enough it's a different matter when a date is announced for the appearance of a book then the author has a contract with the public and he must keep it on one day the book must appear in england on another in canada and on another in the united states that was the case with this book a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court besides the time is ripe for its appearance all europe beneath its scum of hereditary kings and royal personages and aristocratic notions generally is pretty thoroughly americanized and america with its floating scum of fools who are fond of aping aristocratic ideas and actions is pretty well europeanized besides i wanted to say some spiteful things in this book and when a man has that to do it is apt to make him hurry the visitor happened to speak of the publication in the newspapers three years ago of the extracts from the yankee in king arthur's court that mr clemens read at the military services institute at governor's island you enjoyed it repeated mark twain with a reminiscent smile well i didn't it frightened me badly i think i was about the worst scared man in the united states the officer who invited me was an old friend and the invitation came in the summer i didn't know of that club's custom of having reporters at some of its meeting and i carelessly went down there in november without asking about it as i should have done well you can imagine how it electrified me to read the papers next morning there was the chapter i had read printed almost verbatim but that wasn't all there was printed in full a rather carefully written synopsis of the whole scheme of the book as i had plotted it out i thought there was no use of my going on with the work for the moment i imagined that the book pirate mr clemens frown was black would seize my synopsis and specimen chapter write the book for me kindly forge my name on the title page and help himself to big profits from the spurious edition i had put myself in a horrible position there was no help for me the publication in the newspapers was enough to outlaw any claim i might make for copyright i guess the old pirate was asleep for the only thing i had omitted to do was to wake him up and invite him to help himself how else he could have failed to rob me i cannot conceive next day next week he had something else to think of and i was safe speaking of pirates recalls the telegram from philadelphia i read in the newspapers not long before the yankee was published it was set forth that i had stolen not only the specimen chapter published in the century from max adler but that i had pirated all the incidents as well mr adler had for some years placed himself in such a position that the imputation of being concerned with humor could be cast at him but he had reformed now and had become a respectable member of society devoting his energies to a reputable business 
he edits a periodical devoted to the interests of cloth and other solid things humor was no more for him nevertheless he indulged on this occasion in a convulsion an upheaval yes it might be called a geyser of humor with the grand air of a man who owns acres of bonds and stocks he waved his arm magnanimously before the reporter and said twain has stolen the scheme and incidents of that book from one i published years ago but no matter i am through with that sort of thing now he is welcome to all he has taken this aroused a great curiosity in me why said i if i have done all adler claims i am the old original boss plagiarist and hereafter i shall claim pay accordingly how the chapter might have lingered in my mind i could faintly conceive but how he knew that i had stolen from him hundreds of incidents which he couldn't possibly have read because my book was not yet published was too much for my weak imagination and where do incidents come from from the observer himself here i had taken a yankee of today to a remote place and a remote time where everything he saw or heard was startlingly new i had gone with him step by step and saw things and heard them as he did the englishman of today doesn't know that his cab and carriage and cart wheels are wonderfully thick and heavy and clumsy he comes here and discovers that ours are wonderfully thin just as we go to his country and see that his are thick well thought i if i can have stolen unconsciously all of these thousands of ideas from max adler i must have become a worker of miracles howells was with me we went into lee and shepherd's and i asked for the book and the grave and white-haired and aged clerk who waited upon us made the altogether unnecessary remark that this was the first copy of the work he had heard called for in all the years he had been there we carried it over to the parker house and examined it it was a book of humor light airy humorous sketches not a big book but good in the middle of it were a few pages telling of an aged boston man who fell asleep and dreamed of his boyhood seventy years before when he tried to strike a match flint and steel were at hand he tried to light the gas and found he was burning a tallow dip he rode once more in a stage coach it was very funny and brief and i confess i not only enjoyed reading it but was much relieved in mind when i had finished do you suppose this great old world can keep on revolving thousands and thousands of times without turning out the same old thoughts again and again they will be modified each time by the individual who thinks them but the germ itself is never new i laugh every time i hear the idiots jackassing in a charge of plagiarism against somebody or other why to repeat another man's thoughts is to pay him the highest compliment you can it shows what a grip his mind has taken on yours i never charge anyone with plagiarism for to do so would prove me incapable of gratitude for the highest compliment a man can pay me i remember when the innocents abroad was published a man asked me 
he was an old friend and had the privilege of asking such a question why did you steal the dedication of your book from dr holmes we stopped at the first bookstore we came to in broadway and got a copy of one of the earliest editions of dr holmes poems a little blue book there was my dedication not changed so much as one word well i didn't like to make a charge of plagiarism against dr holmes for he was a much older man than i and i respected him greatly and besides his book had been published about twenty years before mine i carried myself back to the time when i had written that dedication and further at last i remembered that in eighteen sixty seven i had been sick for two weeks in a hotel in honolulu a copy of dr holmes little blue book was the only volume in that hotel you can imagine how i had read it i knew every poem i knew the title page the dedication the imprint the first page the last the covers even the dedication had remained i had absorbed it more thoroughly than anything else i wrote a letter to dr holmes explaining things and there was no bloodshed between us there may be pleasanter things in this world than an hour's chat with mark twain but if there are the present writer has never discovered any of them the humor in the man is contagious no one can hear him five minutes without being surprised into a hearty laugh and amid all the hubbub it kicks up twain's solemn conversation drawls serenely along no he said in answer to a question about his daily life i have not yet begun to cultivate the art of keeping or restoring health i suppose i'll have to some day i don't care for riding or driving but i manage to take a long walk every day i suppose i ought to have more exercise the picture of mark twain's library in this story shows mrs harriet beecher stowe in the foreground the inscription above the hearth is the ornament of a house is the friends who frequent it mrs stowe's house is next door to mr clemens and charles dudley warren's is close at hand it is odd to hear the people of hartford call mr clemens mark twain every car driver cabman policeman and messenger boy knows him as mark twain and refuses to speak of him by any other style than his nom de plume in full mr clemens rarely visits new york although he is the head of the publishing firm of charles l webster and company his partner mr hall sends him frequent reports of how things are going and twain's keen business instincts enable him to attend to nearly all his affairs in the billiard smoking workshop in his home on its northern wall hang in a frame the checks two hundred thousand dollars and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars which show mrs julia d grant's profits from mark twain's publication of general grant's book end of interview forty eight read by john greenman This is section 49 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 49. Mark Twain's Lawsuit. Hartford Current. January 18, 1890, page 1. Mr. Edward H. Howes, the author and journalist, has brought suit against Mr. Samuel L. Clemens alleging breach of contract in relation to the dramatization of the prince and the pauper an acting version of the play in question by mrs abby sage richardson is announced for next monday evening at the broadway theater new york with elsie leslie in the parts of edward the sixth and tom canty mr howes's side of the story appeared in the new york tribune of yesterday 
It sets forth that in 1881 Mr. House, at Mr. Clement's request, edited the manuscript of the story and suggested dramatizing the work. Nothing came of the suggestion, and he went to Japan and remained four years. Soon after his return, Mr. Clemens wrote him proposing that he dramatize the book, and offering one-half or two-thirds of the profits that he accepted, and suggested having the two parts played by one actress, that Mr. Clemens approved the idea, and that in June 1887 he, House, read to Mr. Clemens the first act, that he finished the piece in August of the same year, and in the following February wrote to Mr. Clemens as to newspaper paragraphs that Mrs. Richardson was to dramatize the book. He received no reply, but in answer to a second letter Mr. Clemens wrote, repudiating the whole transaction, but later offered him five thousand dollars as compensation, which he declined to receive. A current reporter called on Mr. Clemens yesterday afternoon. He was found in his cozy billiard-room, and seemed quite willing to talk about the matter. He said, "'Mr. Howes was never invited to edit the book for me. He asked if he might read the manuscript while lying bedridden for several weeks, simply to satisfy his own curiosity.' He made one suggestion, which turned out to be a fallacy. I had used in my book some such expression as this. This person was kindly entreated, etc. Mr. Howes judged it was too late a date to use that form entreated, and advised leaving off the first syllable. I do not remember whether I corrected it or not, but afterward found that it was in use in the time of Henry the Eighth. How about suggesting the advisability of dramatizing the work? was asked. As if that was original, exclaimed Mr. Clemens. It needed no suggestion from Mr. Howes. The story was originally planned for a drama, and not as a book. I doubted my ability to write a drama, but wrote it purposely for somebody capable of doing so to turn it into a drama. He says you offered him one-half or two-thirds of the profits. Mr. Howes did not accept the proposition. In his letter he only entertained it in a non-committal way. He did not discard the proposition, but there was nothing in his letter that can be construed into an acceptance. The proposition and his non-acceptance are of the date of 1886. He next speaks of suggesting the idea of having the two parts played by one actress. How as to that? a suggestion made three years before by Mr. Will Gillette, promptly returned Mr. Clemens. I tried to get Mr. Gillette to dramatize the book for me, giving him full permission to do so. Mr. Gillette entertained this proposition in 1888, and went so far as to draft the plot for the play, making liberal alterations of the text of the book. Mr. Gillette has never retired from the undertaking, and, if an undertaking of that kind can remain in force forever, then it is Mr. Gillette that has a claim upon me, and not Mr. House. If I had no right to give Mrs. Richardson permission in 1882 to dramatize, I, of course, had no right to give Mr. House permission in 1886. Somewhere between 1883 and 1888 I dramatized the book myself, but was assured by competent authorities that neither the living nor the dead could act the play as I had planned it. Mr. House affirms, pursues the reporter, 
that he read you the first act of the play in june 1887 in that part of 1887 continued mr clemens mr house was a guest for a while at my home i aroused his sleeping interest in the matter and thought he was going to dramatize the piece but it was a mistake he merely showed me a skeleton plan for the first act with some trifles of conversation put in to indicate the uh, drift of the act that he wrote a complete act is absolutely untrue mr house says in his affidavit that he wrote you that the piece was finished in august eighteen eighty seven a year ago he wrote me the same statement changing the date of finishing the piece to september eighteen eighty seven with anybody else this slight discrepancy of dates would count for nothing with mr house the case is different if he ever wrote me a letter in which he said he had finished the piece he has a copy of that letter by him and did not need to make that error mr house is a methodical man an excellent business man and never destroys or mislays any scrap of writing that comes to him from any one or fails to keep a copy of every scrap which he writes himself i never received any letter from mr house saying the play was finished i was at home again from the vacation as early as october of that year eighteen eighty seven and he did not mention the play in any way during the many months that followed during his stay in hartford evidently he had dropped the play entirely out of his mind he was busy with other matters and never made any reference to it i was thoroughly well pleased with his skeleton of the first act and said so without reservation but when i recognized that the most i could get from him was a skeleton for me to fill out my interest in the matter at once disappeared he was a near neighbor for many months after that our intercourse was constant and familiar he coming to my house and i going to his to talk and gossip after the manner of friends yet throughout this cordial intercourse he remained silent as to that dramatization i believed then and i believe now that with the skeletonizing of the first act mr house's interest in the project came to an end late in eighteen eighty eight mrs richardson wrote and asked permission to dramatize the book i had always been on the lookout for some person willing to do this work and was not particular as to what the terms might be so i wrote her promptly and accorded the permission i also gave her mr house's new york address and said that he had once taken an interest in this thing i suggested that she call on him and see if she could secure his cooperation as he had practice in dramatic work she declined however preferring to do all the work herself another matter mr clemens mr house asserts that he saw it stated in the papers that you had allowed mrs richardson to dramatize the work wrote you and received no reply is that so mr house knew why he received no reply was the answer i was not in hartford i told him so when i answered him his second letter now as regards my repudiation of the transaction if asking him 
to send me a copy of any contract or agreement existing between him and me so that i might as i said undo any wrong suffered at my hands is repudiating the whole transaction then i certainly repudiated it for that is what i wrote as to the alleged proposition to pay him five thousand dollars as compensation a proposition that he says he declined i would only say that is another effort of mr house's imagination i never offered him a penny nor consented to join anybody else in offering him one again he says that arbitration was tried without success if that was done i had nothing whatever to do with it i would not have consented to arbitrate with a man who had no shadow of a claim against me after about eighteen months of petrified absence of interest in this dramatization mr house's condition instantly unpetrified itself when he found that somebody else was willing to undertake the work he not only imagines that he has an agreement with me for a dramatization but that the term of it is eternal it is only fair then that the settling of our dispute should be accorded the same liberal lack of hurry mr house is never so entertaining as when he has a grievance we shall be able to pass the hereafter very pleasantly some of the statements in mr house's affidavit are true but the court will probably give information to amend them the new york times of yesterday said mark twain has given to howard p taylor the playwright the exclusive right to dramatize his latest work a connecticut yankee at the court of king arthur mr taylor will make a spectacular comedy of it and when completed it will have its first production at one of the broadway theaters the reporter asked mr clemens if the statement was true and he replied it is a surprising thing but it is end of interview forty nine read by john greenman this is section fifty of mark twain the complete interviews this librivox recording is in the public domain interview fifty rudyard kipling on mark twain new york herald august seventeenth eighteen ninety page five you are a contemptible lot out there over yonder some of you are commissioners and some lieutenant governors and some have the v c and a few are privileged to walk about the mall arm in arm with the viceroy but i have seen mark twain this golden morning have shaken his hand and smoked a cigar no two cigars with him and talked with him for more than two hours understand clearly that i do not despise you indeed i don't i am only very sorry for you all from the viceroy downward to soothe your envy and to prove that i still regard you as my equals i will tell you all about it they said in toronto that he was in hartford connecticut and again they said perchance he is gone upon a journey to portland maine and a big fat drummer a traveling salesman vowed that he knew the great man intimately and that mark was spending the summer in europe which information so upset me that i embarked upon the wrong train at niagara and was incontinently turned out by the conductor three-quarters of a mile from the station amid the wilderness of railway tracks have you ever encumbered with great coat and valise tried to dodge diversely minded locomotives when the sun was shining in your eyes but i forgot that you have not seen mark twain you p 
people of no account. Saved from the jaws of the cowcatcher, I, wandering devious, a stranger met. Elmira is the place. Elmira in the state of New York. This state, not two hundred miles away. And he added, perfectly unnecessarily, Slide, Kelly, slide. I slid on the west shore line. I slid till midnight, and they dumped me down at the door of a frowsy hotel in Admira. Yes, they knew all about that man Clemens, but reckoned he was not in town, had gone east somewhere. I had better possess my soul in patience till the morrow, and then dig up the man Clemens' brother-in-law, who was interested in coal. The idea of chasing half a dozen relatives in addition to Mark Twain up and down a city of thirty thousand inhabitants kept me awake. Morning revealed Elmira, whose streets were desolated by railway tracks, and whose suburbs were given up to the manufacture of door-sashes and window-frames. It was surrounded by pleasant, fat little hills, trimmed with timber and topped with cultivation. The Chemung River flowed generally up and down the town, and had just finished flooding a few of the main streets. The hotel man and the telephone man assured me that the much-desired brother-in-law was out of town, and no one seemed to know where the man Clemens abode. Later on I discovered that he had not summered in that place for more than nineteen seasons, and so was, comparatively, a new arrival. A friendly policeman volunteered the news that he had seen Twain or someone very like him driving a buggy on the previous day. This gave me a delightful sense of nearness to the great author. Fancy living in a town where you can see the author of Tom Sawyer or someone very like him, jolting over the pavements in a buggy. "'He lives way out yonder at East Hill,' said the policeman, three miles away from here. Then the chase began. In a hired hack, up an awful hill, where sunflowers blossomed by the roadside and crops waved, and Harper's Magazine cows stood in eligible and commanding attitudes knee-deep in clover, all ready to be transferred to photogravure. The great man must have been persecuted by outsiders aforetime, and fled up the hill for refuge. Presently the driver stopped at a miserable little white wood shanty, and demanded, "'Mr. Clemens! I know he's a big bug and all that,' he explained, "'but you can never tell what sort of notions those sort of men take it into their heads to live in anyways.' There rose up a young lady who was sketching thistle-tops and goldenrod, amid a plentiful supply of both, and set the pilgrimage on the right paths. "'It's a pretty gothic house on the left-hand side a little way further on.' "'Gothic, ha huh? said the driver. "'Very few of the city hacks take this drive, especially if they knew they were coming out here.' And he glared at me savagely. It was a very pretty house, anything but gothic, clothed with ivy, standing in a very big compound, and fronted by a veranda full of all sorts of chairs and hammocks for lying in all sorts of positions. The roof of the veranda was a trellis-work of creepers, and the sun peeped through and moved on the shining boards below. Decidedly, this remote place was an ideal one for working in, if a man could work among these soft airs and the murmur of the long-eared crops just across the stone wall. Appeared suddenly a lady, used to dealing with rampageous outsiders. Mr. Clemens has just walked down town. He is at his brother-in-law's house. Then he was within shouting distance after all, and the chase had not been in vain. With speed I fled, and the driver, skidding the wheels and swearing audibly, arrived at the bottom of that hill without accident. It was in the pause that followed between ringing the brother-in-law's bell and getting an answer that it occurred to me for the first time Mark Twain might possibly have other engagements than the entertainment of escaped lunatics from India be they ever so full of admiration, 
and in another man's house anyhow what had i come to do or say suppose the drawing-room should be full of people a levy of crowned heads suppose a baby were sick anywhere how was i to explain i only wanted to shake hands with him then things happened somewhat in this order a big darkened drawing-room a huge chair a man with eyes a mane of grizzled hair a brown moustache covering a mouth as delicate as a woman's a strong square hand shaking mine and the slowest calmest levelest voice in all the world saying well you think you owe me something and you've come to tell me so that's what i call squaring a debt handsomely piff from a cob pipe i always said a missouri meerschaum was the best smoking in the world and behold mark twain had curled himself up in the big armchair and i was smoking reverently as befits one in the presence of his superior the thing that struck me first was that he was an elderly man yet after a minute's thought i perceived that it was otherwise and in five minutes the eyes looking at me i saw that the gray hair was an accident of the most trivial kind he was quite young i had shaken his hand i was smoking his cigar and i was hearing him talk this man i had learned to love and admire fourteen thousand miles away reading his books i had striven to get an idea of his personality and all my preconceived notions were wrong and beneath the reality blessed is the man who finds no disillusion when he is brought face to face with a revered writer that was a moment to be remembered the land of a twelve-pound salmon was nothing to it i had hooked mark twain and he was treating me as though under certain circumstances i might be an equal about this time i became aware that he was discussing the copyright question here as far as i remember is what he said attend to the words of the oracle through this unworthy medium transmitted you will never be able to imagine the long slow surge of the drawl and the deadly gravity of the countenance any more than the quaint pucker of the body one foot thrown over the arm of the chair the yellow pipe clinched in one corner of the mouth and the right hand casually caressing the square chin copyright some men have morals and some men have uh, other things i presume a publisher is a man he is not born he is created by circumstances some publishers have morals mine have they pay me for the english productions of my books when you hear men talking of bret hart's works and other works and my books being pirated ask them to be sure of their facts i think they'll find the books are paid for it was ever thus i remember an unprincipled and formidable publisher perhaps he's dead now he used to take my short stories i can't call it steal or pirate them it was beyond these things altogether he took my stories one at a time and made a book of it if i wrote an essay on dentistry or theology or any little thing of that kind just an essay that long he indicated half an inch on his finger any sort of essay that publisher would amend and improve my essay he would get another man to write some more to it or cut it about exactly as his needs required then he would publish a book called dentistry by mark twain that little essay and some other things not mine added theology would make another book 
and so on. I do not consider that fair. It's an insult. But he's dead now, I think. I didn't kill him. There is a great deal of nonsense talked about international copyright. Are you interested in it? Well, so am I. I don't think that he meant to be crushingly ironical, but I would cheerfully have wrapped myself up in the carpet and burrowed into the cellar when those eyes turned on me. The proper way to treat a copyright is to make it exactly like real estate in every way. It will settle itself under these conditions. If Congress were to bring in a law that a man's life were not to extend over a hundred and sixty years, somebody w would laugh. It wouldn't concern anybody. The men would be out of the jurisdiction of the court. A term of years in copyright comes to exactly the same thing. No law can make a book live or cause it to die before the appointed time. Tuttletown, California, was a new town with a population of three thousand banks, fire brigades, brick buildings, and all modern improvements. It lived, it flourished, and it disappeared. Today no man can put his foot on any remnant of Tuttletown, California. It's dead. London continues to exist. Bill Smith, author of a book read for the next year or so, is real estate in Tuttletown. William Shakespeare, whose works are extensively read, is real estate in London. Let Bill Smith, equally with Mr. Shakespeare, now deceased, have as complete a control over his copyright as he would over real estate. Let him gamble it away, drink it away, or give it to the church. Let his heirs and assigns treat it in the same manner. Every now and again I go up to Washington, sitting on a board to drive that sort of view into Congress. Congress takes its arguments against international copyright, delivered ready-made, and Congress isn't very strong. I put the real estate view of the case before one of the senators. He said, Suppose a man has written a book that will live forever. I said, Neither you nor I will ever live to see that man, but will assume it. What then? He said, I want to protect the world against that man's heirs and assigns working under your theory. I said, You think all the world are as big fools as that all the world has no commercial sense? The book that will live forever can't be artificially kept up at inflated prices. There will always be very expensive editions of it, and cheap ones issuing side by side. Take the case of Sir Walter Scott's novels, he continued, turning to me. When the copyright notes protected them, I bought editions as expensive as I could afford, because I liked them. At the same time, the same firm were selling editions that a cat might buy. They had their real estate, and, not being fools, recognized that one portion of the plot could be worked as a gold mine, another as a vegetable garden, and another as a marble quarry. Do you see? 
what i saw with the greatest clearness was mark twain's being forced to fight for the simple proposition that a man has as much right in the work of his brains think of the heresy of it as in the labor of his hands when the old lion roars the young whelps growl i growled assentingly and the talk ran on from books in general to his own in particular growing bold and feeling that i had a few hundred thousand folk at my back i demanded whether tom sawyer married judge thatcher's daughter and whether we were ever going to hear of tom sawyer as a man i haven't decided quoth mark twain getting up filling his pipe and walking up and down the room in his slippers i have had a notion of writing the sequel to tom sawyer in two ways in one i would make him rise to great honor and go to congress and in the other i should hang him then the friends and enemies of the book could take their choice here i lost my reverence completely and protested against any theory of the sort because to me at least tom sawyer was real oh he is real said mark twain he's all the boys that i have known or recollect but that would be a good way of ending the book then turning round because when you come to think of it neither religion training nor education avails anything against the force of circumstances that drive a man suppose we took the next four-and-twenty years of tom sawyer's life and gave a little joggle to the circumstances that controlled him he would logically and according to the joggle turn out a rip or an angel do you believe that then i think so isn't it what you call kismet yes but don't give him two joggles and show the result because he isn't your property any more he belongs to us thereat he laughed a large wholesome laugh and this began a dissertation on the rights of a man to do what he liked with his own creations which being a matter of purely professional interest i will mercifully omit returning to the big chair he speaking of truth and the like in literature said that an autobiography was the one work in which a man against his own will and in spite of his utmost striving to the contrary revealed himself in his true light to the world a good deal of your life on the mississippi is autobiographical isn't it i asked as near as it can be when a man is writing a book and about himself but in genuine autobiography i believe it is impossible for a man to tell the truth about himself or to avoid impressing the reader with the truth about himself i made an experiment once i got a friend of mine a man painfully given to speaking the truth on all occasions a man who wouldn't dream of telling a lie and i made him write his autobiography for his own amusement and mine he did it the manuscript would have made an octavo volume but good honest man though he was in every single detail of his life that i knew about he turned out on paper a formidable liar he could not help himself it is not in human nature to write the truth about itself none the less the reader gets a general impression from an autobiography whether the man is a fraud or a good man the reader can't give his reasons any more than a man can explain why a woman struck him as being lovely when he doesn't remember her hair eyes teeth or figure 
and the impression that the reader gets is a correct one do you ever intend writing an autobiography if i do it will be as other men have done with the most earnest desire to make myself out to be the better man in every little business that has been to my discredit and i shall fail like the others to make the readers believe anything except the truth this naturally led to a discussion on conscience then said mark twain and his words are mighty and to be remembered your conscience is a nuisance a conscience is like a child if you pet it and play with it and let it have everything it wants it becomes spoiled and intrudes on all your amusements and most of your griefs treat your conscience as you would treat anything else when it is rebellious spank it be severe with it argue with it prevent it from coming to play with you at all hours and you will secure a good conscience that is to say a properly trained one a spoiled conscience simply destroys all the pleasure in life i think i have reduced mine to order at least i haven't heard from it for some time perhaps i've killed it through over severity it's wrong to kill a child but in spite of all i have said a conscience differs from a child in many ways perhaps it is best when it's dead here he told me a little such things as a man may tell a stranger of his early life and upbringing and in what manner he had been influenced for good by the examples of his parents he spoke always through his eyes a light under the heavy eyebrows anon crossing the room with a step as light as a girl's to show me some book or other then resuming his walk up and down the room puffing at the cob pipe i would have given much for nerve enough to demand the gift of that pipe value five cents when new i understood why certain savage tribes ardently desire the liver of brave men slain in combat that pipe would have given me perhaps a hint of his keen insight into the souls of men but he never laid it aside within stealing reach of my arms once indeed he put his hand on my shoulder it was an investiture of the star of india blue silk trumpets and diamond studded jewel all complete if hereafter among the changes and chances of this mortal life i fall to cureless ruin i will tell the superintendent of the workhouse that mark twain once put his hand on my shoulder and he shall give me a room to myself and double allowance of pauper's tobacco i never read novels myself said he except when the popular persecution forces me to when people plague me to know what i think of the last book that everyone is reading and how did the latest persecution affect you robert said he interrogatively i nodded i read it of course for the workmanship that made me think i had neglected novels too long that there might be a good many books as graceful in style somewhere on the shelves so i began a course of novel reading i have dropped it now it did not amuse me but as regards robert the effect on me was exactly as though a singer of street ballads were to hear excellent music from a church organ i didn't stop to ask whether the music was legitimate or necessary i listened and i liked what i heard i am speaking of the grace and beauty of the style 
how is one to behave when one differs altogether with a great man my business was to be still and to listen yet mark mark twain a man who knew men big injun heap big injun damn mighty heap big injun master of tears and mirth skilled in wisdom of the true inwardness of things was bowing his head to the labored truck of the schools where men act in obedience to the books they read and keep their consciences in spirits of home-made wine he said the style was graceful therefore it must be graceful but perhaps he was making fun of me in either case i would lay my hand upon my mouth you see he went on every man has his private opinion about a book but that is my private opinion if i had lived in the beginning of things i should have looked around the township to see what popular opinion thought of the murder of abel before i openly condemned cain i should have had my private opinion of course but i shouldn't have expressed it until i had felt the way you have my private opinion about that book i don't know what my public ones are exactly they won't upset the earth he recurled himself into the chair and talked of other things i spend nine months of the year at hartford i have long ago satisfied myself that there is no hope of doing much work during those nine months people come in and call they call at all hours about everything in the world one day i thought i would keep a list of interruptions it began this way a man came and would see no one but mr clemens he was an agent for photogravure reproductions of salon pictures i very seldom use salon pictures in my books after that man another man who refused to see any one but mr clemens came to make me write to washington about something i saw him i saw a third man then a fourth by this time it was noon i had grown tired of keeping the list i wished to rest but the fifth man was the only one of the crowd with a card of his own he sent it up this card of his own ben kuntz hannibal missouri i was raised in hannibal ben was an old schoolmate of mine consequently i threw the house wide open and rushed with both hands out at a big fat heavy man who was not the ben i had ever known nor anything of him but is it you ben i said you've altered in the last thousand years the fat man said well i'm not coons exactly but i met him down in missouri and he told me to be sure and call on you and he gave me his card and here he acted the little scene for my benefit if you'll wait a minute till i can get out the circulars i'm not coons exactly but i'm traveling with the fullest line of rods you ever saw and what happened i asked breathlessly i shut the door he was not ben coons exactly not my old schoolfellow but i had shaken him by both hands in love and i had been bearded by a lightning rod man in my own house as i was saying i do very little work in hartford i come here for three months every year and i work four or five hours a day in a study down the garden of that little house on the hill of course i do not object to two or three interruptions when a man is in the full swing of his work these little things 
do not affect him. Eight or ten or twenty interruptions retard composition. I was burning to ask him all manner of impertinent questions as to which of his works he himself preferred, and so forth, but standing in awe of his eyes I dared not. He spoke on, and I listened, and groveling. It was a question of mental equipment that was on the carpet, and I am still wondering whether he meant what he said. Personally, I never care for fiction or story books. What I like to read about are facts and statistics of any kind. If they are only facts about the raising of radishes, they interest me. Just now, for instance, before you came in, he pointed to an encyclopedia on the shelves, I was reading an article about mathematics, perfectly pure mathematics. My own knowledge of mathematics stops at twelve times twelve, but I enjoyed that article immensely. I didn't understand a word of it, but facts, or what a man believes to be facts, are always delightful. That mathematical fellow believed in his facts. So do I. Get your facts first, and— the voice died away to an almost inaudible drone, then you can distort them as much as you please. Bearing this precious advice in my bosom, I left, the great man assuring me with gentle kindness that I had not interrupted him in the least. Once outside the door, I yearned to go back and ask some questions. It was easy enough to think of them now, but his time was his own, though his books belonged to me. I should have ample time to look back to that meeting across the graves of the days, but it was sad to think of the things he had not spoken about. In San Francisco the men of the call told me many legends of Mark's apprenticeship in their paper five and twenty years ago, how he was a reporter delightfully incapable of reporting according to the needs of the day. He preferred, so they said, to coil himself into a heap and meditate till the last minute then he would produce copy bearing no sort of relationship to his legitimate work, copy that made the editor swear horribly, and the readers of the call ask for more. I should like to have heard Mark's version of that, and some stories of his joyous and variegated past. He has been journeyman printer. In those days he wandered from the banks of the Missouri, even to Philadelphia. Pilot cub and full-blown pilot— Soldier of the South, that was for three weeks only, private secretary to a lieutenant governor of Nevada, that displeased him, minor, editor, special correspondent in the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, and the Lord only knows what else. If so experienced a man could by any means be made drunk, it would be a glorious thing to fill him up with composite liquors, and in the language of his own country, let him retrospect. But these eyes will never see that orgy fit for the gods. Later, oh, shame, oh, shock, oh, fie. I have been reading the new book which you also will have read by this time, the book about the Yankee animal in the courtyard. It's... Uh, but I don't believe he ever wrote it. Or, if he did, I am certain that if you held it up to a looking-glass, or picked out every third word, or spelled it backward, you would find that it hid some crystal-clean tale as desirable as Huck Finn. End of Interview 50 Read by John Greenman This is section 51 of Mark Twain, The Complete Interviews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview 51. Mark Twain on Kipling. New York World, August 24, 1890, page 18. Most people know by this time what Rudyard Kipling thinks of Mark Twain. The young story-writer of old England 
has paid his respects in earnest person as well as in luminous prose to the veteran humorist of new england it is natural for them to wonder what mark twain thinks of rudyard kipling and this as well as something new about the way he thinks his thoughts mr clemens has told the writer talking at his best in that easy way in which ideas roll from a brain full mr clemens was asked what he thought of rudyard kipling's story of his quest for him why said he with the artless frankness of a man too busy to read the sunday newspapers i haven't seen it i haven't read a line of it nor even heard as yet about it tell me what it is is it blame or otherwise then the writer outlined kipling's vivid story of his drives about elmira his search up hill and down dale and his final discovery of twain at his mother-in-law's mr clemens laughed silently with his eyebrows and took up the thread of the narrative yes i was at my wife's mother's when he found me and that accounts for a singular almost unaccountable lack of hospitality on my part it was just about the luncheon hour when he arrived and while he and i were sitting talking and smoking the rest of the family were eating now i have a habit of never eating in the middle of the day as i didn't get hungry the idea of luncheon didn't occur to me for we were pleasantly engaged and as i was not in the habit of going to lunch none of the family came to me to announce it i never once thought of mr kipling's views on the luncheon question it didn't occur to me that he could have an appetite after his drive well when he had gone and i was talking to my wife about his visit she at once recurred to this luncheon business and said why do you mean to tell me that after this young man had come all this way to see you and had made such a search to find you you didn't offer him any refreshments and thereupon she berated me for not being natural like other men in my habits of eating here mr clemens eyebrows laughed briskly i thought he continued that was the difference between a natural sense of hospitality and the absence of it the next morning i went down to the hotel to call on mr kipling without taking the precaution to telephone and see if he were still there <laughs> he was gone and i of course haven't seen him since shall i see him in london soon no i don't expect to go to london in the near future but when i do go i shall call upon him i shan't wait to have him hunt me up as you suggest the likelihood of his doing i shall assuredly hunt him up so much for the episode which kipling himself has so vividly described though from a standpoint entirely different to that of mr clemens whose frame of mind on the luncheon subject evidently ensures mr kipling at their next meeting an abundance of creature comforts it was not necessary to ask mr clemens what he thinks of kipling's tales it would be a good thing said he to read mr kipling's writings for their style alone if there were no story back of it but as you say there always is a story there and a powerfully interesting one generally how people have gotten to read and talk about his stories why when a young man not yet twenty-four years of age succeeds in the way kipling has succeeded it simply shows doesn't it that the general public has a strong appreciation of a good thing 
when it gets hold of one his great charm to me is the way he swings nervous english it is wonderful that it seems to me is one great secret of the hold he takes on his readers they can understand what he is at he is simple and direct have you any book of your own in hand at present mr clemens was asked no uh, nothing in particular he replied but i have unfinished books on hand nearly all the time if that is what you mean i have one book begun seventeen uh, let me see seventy three eighty three yes seventeen years ago and it isn't more than half finished yet haven't you abandoned it or do you still take an interest in it and expect to finish it i shall certainly finish it that is with a smile if i live seventeen years longer i reckon i am good for that how old am i now about fifty-four and a half i began the diary of shem in the ark continued mr clemens and at the drollery of the title and the seriousness with which it was announced the auditors burst into laughter just uh, seventeen years ago he went on i wrote the first six chapters in edinburgh when the idea of it occurred to me i was much interested in it then and am now but i have laid it down and taken it up perhaps a half dozen times in those seventeen years you ask if it be more akin to my early or my more recent writings in its conception and style well the plan of the book has changed greatly since i began it in edinburgh i have acquired different ideas about it since then and they have expanded and grown and changed this led naturally to mr clemens declaration of his highly original method of evolving a story out of his brain that is a curious thing about stories he went on you have your ideas your facts your plot and you go to work and write yourself up you use up all the material you have in your brain and then you stop naturally well lay the book aside as i do and think of or go at something else after a while three or four months maybe or perhaps three or four or five years something suggests your story or your book to you and you feel a sudden awakening of interest in it and desire to go to work at it and then lo and behold to your surprise maybe but not to my surprise now for i am used to it by this time you find that your stock of ideas and facts and concepts has been replenished and your mind is full of your subject again and you must write your brain is overflowing your thoughts are beginning to burn to be put down on paper is this unconscious cerebration well, i suppose so a most interesting illustration of it you may well say the form of the concept of the original purpose may have greatly changed but the root of it is there in the mind unchanged and from it without our being conscious of it at all has grown a tree with fresh new foliage and spreading branches or suppose the brain is like a cistern from which you draw off the ideas on the subject in hand as you write until the cistern goes dry and you have to stop you busy yourself about something else and put the other behind you and away by and by from the 
imperceptible seeping in of ideas, thoughts, facts, fancies, as you have worked or slept or thought of something else, lo, the cistern is once more full to overflowing, and with fresh relish and a wonderful appreciation of the new material you have been acquiring in spite of yourself, you draw off the ideas again and add them to your former stock already committed to writing. The field that you reaped and garnered has grown up again, and there is another harvest there to reap. The think-tank of your brain overflows once more. The snowball has been rolling all this time without your knowing it, and gathering more snow. So I take up the diary of Shem in the Ark with new interest now, and expect to do so for years to come. The return is not tedious. The idea of resuming operations on the old lines is conceived with positive relish. The visitor asked Mr. Clemens when the courts would decide the vexed question involved in the dramatization of The Prince and the Pauper. His face grew slightly melancholy. I expect they will decide as between Mr. House and Mrs. Abby Sage Richardson here in New York, probably in October. House never thought of making a play out of my book, in my opinion, until he heard that Mrs. Richardson had done it. He has acted in a sort of a dog-in-the-manger way about it. You ask if I have any doubt about the ultimate decision of the controversy? I can say this. I have no sort of doubt about what the facts are and what the decision ought to be, but I have a good deal of doubt about what the decision of a law court will be, for I believe firmly in the uncertainties of the law. By the way, that was an extraordinary opinion which the judge gave when he decided to grant a temporary injunction. It is one of those curiosities of judicial decision, as you suggest, of which we have been reading from time immemorial. The learned court declared that as Mr. House was a sick man, and had been confined to his bed, and had time to think and to revolve the facts in his mind and freshen up his memory, his recollection of the facts was probably better than mine, because I was such a busy man and was engaged in so many different things. According to that, it would seem that sickness is an admirable way to win a lawsuit. End of interview 51. Read by John Greenman.